The first speaker is Dr. Amit Mahajan from Maharashtra. He's come all the way from Pune for us. Welcome, Dr. Amit. Uh, so, Dr. Amit will talk on arthroscopic lateral anatomy, normal and variants. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is indeed an absolute honor and a great privilege to be here present today speaking to you all. And for this, I would like to thank the organizers and especially Dr. Karthik Selvaraj for inviting me here for this academic feast. It's going to be a very wonderful academic session today. And uh, this is the first talk of the day. So that's why I'm going to take you back to your basics, back to your first year of medical school, back to the anatomy class. And I'm going to talk about the anatomy of the labrum and its variants. Okay. So, uh, as we all know, shoulder instability is a very common diagnosis in our orthopedic practice and it requires more often than not a surgical treatment. Uh, the complete understanding of the biomechanics of the joint uh, is of utmost importance to treat these injuries. And the anatomy of the labrum and identifying the anatomical variants is necessary for successful outcomes. So, there are certain normal anatomical variations in the labrum which you need to know and identify so that you don't confuse them with pathological variants. So, uh, as we all know, the glenoid labrum is a ring-like structure which encompasses the entire glenoid. It has a very early embryological formation. It forms in the eighth week of fetal life. And during the ninth week, the long head of biceps has a sure attachment to the uh, glenoid labrum. So, it is that early a formation of the labrum. In 1992, Cooper et al. Uh, proved to us that depth as well as the surface area of the shallow glenoid surface is increased by the presence of the labrum, deepening the glenoid fossa by 50 percent. And it obviously increases the concavity as well as the congruity. We all know that the anatomical subregions of the uh, glenoid, uh, the glenoid has been divided for uh, the purpose of uh, anatomical uh, subregions into antero superior, antero inferior, posterior superior and posterior inferior quadrants. And if you look at it as a uh, uh, face of a clock, then we have the long end of biceps which get attached at the 12 o'clock position and the labrum from there on. So, if we come to the morphology, um, it has been shown that there are a lot of biological variations in the morphology of the uh, labrum. The superior labrum is more meniscus-like and uh, it has a triangular cross-section and relatively loose attachment to the glenoid rim. On the other hand, the posterior superior labrum is more rounded and relatively firmly attached. Inferior labrum is more consistent with slight lateral extension and firm attachment. And similarly, the long head of biceps attachment makes the superior labrum tallest and thickest and the anterior labrum relatively is very short and thin. Now, coming to the bio biomechanical model of com concavity compression stability, uh, it is a model whereby a deeper concavity, which is due to the labrum, the labrum provides that deeper concavity, leads to a higher resistance of sliding of an object. That's your head of the humerus pressed into the concavity by the cuff muscles. The deeper socket also aids to maintain the negative intraarticular pressure. Habermeyer et al. in 1992 found that the negative intraarticular pressures were maintained when neutral traction force was applied to the arm if the labrum was intact. But this negative intraarticular pressure was lost in patients with labral tears. So that is what happens when you have a labral tear. There is also a role of labrum in centralization of the humeral head. It increases the concavity of the glenoid. The labrum plays an important role in centralizing the humeral head in the glenoid fossa and decreases the contact forces on the chondral plate. Feringer et al. in 2003 uh, had a study which showed that the antero-inferior shift of the humeral head was evident after incising the antero-inferior labrum with decentralization by an average of almost 0.74 millimeter. Now, what are the associated structure which provides stability to the shoulder joint along with the labrum? We have the long head of biceps which is attached to the 12 o'clock position. Then we have these three uh, important ligaments which is the superior, middle and the inferior glenohumeral ligament. So I'm going to talk in short about each one of these. Uh, the long head of biceps has a variability in projections of the bicipital tendon fibers. Uh, type 1 is where there is a preferential posterior orientation. Type 2 is the most common, uh, which has posterior attachment. 
Type 3 is divided equally posteriorly and anteriorly, and type 4, again, has mostly anterior attachment. It has been proven that patients with type 1 and type 4 attachments of long head of biceps have a higher likelihood of labral pathologies. Pignani et al. in 1996 postulated that tensile forces can be transmitted from long head of biceps to labrum, contributing directly to the overall stability of the joint. So long head of biceps does give you a lot of stability. Coming to the glenohumeral ligaments, unlike other joint ligaments which have an isometric articulation, the glenohumeral ligaments are lax in most joint positions and augment the humeral head in joint motion, particularly in extreme motions. The SGHL, that is the superior glenohumeral ligament, has direct attachment to the anterior superior labrum between 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock position. It is taught when the humerus is positioned between 0 to 30 degrees of abduction and with further increase in tension with additional external rotation. Mihata et al. in 2008 postulated that this finding might be responsible for the increased humeral translation during joint movement in these angles in slap lesions. Most interesting uh, ligament here is the middle glenohumeral ligament. It has most variable anatomy and we've all seen this when we do our arthroscopies that the MGHL is absolutely variable in each and every patient. The most common attachment though is the superior and anterior superior labrum between 12.50 to 3.10 o'clock. Various studies show presence in presence of MGHL in 60 to 85 percent. So there is a subset of population where the MGHL is absent as well. It can present as a cord-like structure. It can also present as the Buford complex wherein the cord-like MGHL is continuous with the superior labrum with absence of the anterior superior labrum. MGHL is under tension during abduction and up to 45 degrees with uh, external rotation. Incidence of slap lesions increases in presence of Buford complex. So this has been proven by uh, this famous study and uh, slap lesions are very common whenever you have a Buford complex and this variation directly affects the glenohumeral stability as well. Coming to the inferior glenohumeral ligament, it is called the hammock of the shoulder joint. It extends from the anterior inferior to posterior inferior aspects of the glenoid. It has an anterior band, a posterior band and an axillary pouch which extends between the two. It can extend from the glenoid labrum, the glenoid neck or both. As I said, it's a hammock-like brace supporting the humeral head by uh, cradling it during its movement. And uh, at 90 degrees of abduction, it pre uh, prevents the in inferior translation of the humeral head. And the anterior and the posterior bands provide support during rotations. What are the uh, normal labral variants? So there are uh, these three normal labral variants which you should be aware of and you should be on the lookout for these because these might present as pathological variants and then you might confuse them and try to repair these. But uh, there are three normal labral variants which are a sublabral foramen, a sublabral recess and a Buford complex that I just covered. So coming to the sublabral foramen, it is simply a focal detachment of the anterior superior labrum and it's seen in about 10 to 12 percent of the population. population. Uh, how do you differentiate it from a tear is it will have no ragged edges and will have a s regular smooth labrum. The sublabral foramen does not extend inferior to the equator of the anterior inferior labrum. So this is how a sublabral foramen will look like in your arthroscopy. It would be a smooth labrum with just a small focal detachment at the anterior superior labrum and on the MRI you would pick it up as a small uh, detachment but without any uh, migration of the labrum. What is a sublabral recess? Uh, it is a synovial recess between the superior labrum and the glenoid rim created by the attachment of the long head of biceps on the supraglenoid tubercle. The labrum isn't attached at the 12 o'clock position and could mimic a slap tear. So a sublabral recess, many, uh, uh, most often than not, it would be confused with a slap tear. And a sublabral recess does not extend posterior to the biceps tendon. So this is how it is going to be. A uh, sublabral recess on the left is going to be smooth and one, uh, the slap tear on the right is going to have ragged edges there. So how do you differentiate between these two in, on the MRI? Uh, the sublabral recess has a high signal which extends medially and follows the contour of the glenoid cartilage. It has a smooth margin. It is less than three millimeter and it is located at the biceps anchor. On the other hand, the slap tear, as we all know, it has a high signal extend, extending laterally. It has an irregular margin and can be more than three millimeter. 
and can extend posterior to the biceps tendon as well. Now what is the Buford complex again? It, as I said, is a congenital labral variant present in about 1 to 2 percent of the population. Two features are very distinctive about the Buford complex that it has an absence, absence of labrum from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock position, that is the sublabral foramen, along with a thickened MGHL. So a sublabral foramen with a thickened MGHL is your Buford complex. And this is how it looks on the arthroscopic picture with a cord-like MGHL connecting uh, anterior, present anteriorly. Now I'm going to touch upon a few labral lesions as well. And uh, this is just going to be a rush through these lesions so that we can then go forward in today's sessions and uh, learn in detail about each one of these. So we have the superior labrum anterior to posterior tear. Uh, it is a subset of injuries that occurs in acute and chronic degenerative settings. The superior labral fraying or tear occurs from the glenoid. It is due to the pull of the biceps tendon that the labrum tears off from the glenoid and you can have a superior labral tear. Uh, acute one is generally seen in overhead athletes and it is a traumatic tear and chronic could be due to degeneration. Uh, we all know about Bankart's lesion. It represents an anterior and inferior labral detachment from the glenoid with an associated capsuloligamentous injury below the equator of the glenoid, typically between 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock position. So it is an anterior inferior labral detachment. This results in anterior instability and uh, it needs a surgical repair. It is an essential lesion in shoulder dislocation. So you cannot have a shoulder dislocation without having a actual Bankart's lesion. What is a Perthes lesion? It is again an anterior glenohumeral injury in which the anterior inferior labrum is torn and lifted from the edge of the glenoid but is still attached to the intact periosteum from the edge of the glenoid. So it is, uh, it appears normal on your arthroscopy. The labrum would appear normal, uh, normally positioned, but it is functionally inactive because it has been detached from the uh, edge of the glenoid. But it does not translate medially. When a Perthes lesion, a torn glen uh, labrum translates medially, that becomes your ALPSA. So that is the ALPSA lesion where the anterior labral ligamentous complex rolls up in a sleeve and uh, gets displaced medially and inferiorly. So it is an anterior labrum periosteal sleeve avulsion which occurs. It is also called as the medialized Bankart's lesion and it is definitely more traumatic than Bankart's. Coming to the next lesion that is GLAD, glenolabral articular disruption is a traumatic glenoid cartilage lesion characterized by anterior shoulder pain with no evidence of anterior instability on examination or on arthroscopy. It is basically a stable cartilage lesion of the anterior glenoid and uh, it generally requires no surgical intervention unless there is pain where you can go ahead and do your microfractures and get rid of it. Then coming to Hegel, Hegel is a humeral avulsion of the glenohumeral ligament. The IGHL, that is the inferior glenohumeral ligament, gets avulsed from the humeral head, not from the glenoid side. It is getting avulsed from the humeral side, causing instability and pain. It is often a missed cause of instability. So um, in your arthroscopy, you need to be vigilant to go ahead and look for these Hegel lesions as well. It can uh, be missed on a repair at the time of index surgery and can lead to persistent instability. So if you miss a Hegel lesion, you would have the patient coming back to you with persistent instability. It can also be associated with bony avulsion and is known as a bony Hegel. So in summary, I would say that your eyes can't see what the brain doesn't know. So you need to be aware of all the normal as well as the pathological variants of your labrum and make sure that you are vigilant enough on your uh, diagnostic round so that you can catch hold of these normal as well as the pathological variants and treat them accordingly. As arthroscopy surgeons, we have been taught to treat the uh, soft tissues with respect and that is a key factor in any uh, surgical success. So with this, I thank you for your time and I hope that we have an excellent session uh, in the, during the day. And again, I thank Sironix and Dr. Karthik Selvaraj for inviting me for this wonderful session. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you for the uh, wonderful presentation, sir. It was indeed an enlightening talk. Uh, uh, next, I would like to call Dr. Shailesh and uh, Dr. Subramaniam, sir, to chair the next session. Uh, 
next in line we have uh, Dr. Vijay Raj uh, for his presentation about uh, imaging of uh, imaging for shoulder instability. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome all to this wonderful meeting, the IMC series chapter one. And I, at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Karthik Selvaraj for inviting me to present my talk on the radiological measurements in bony shoulder instability. So we all know that the glenoid and humeral head bony integrity is critical for shoulder stability. When a glenoid bone loss combined with a hill sac lesion occurs, then this combination predisposes to high degree of recurrence. So it is important to radiologically assess this bony component in order to ensure good functional outcome and prevent further recurrence in this subgroup of patients. The tools that we use for the glenoid and the humeral head assessment are the CT scan, 2D and 3D CT scans and also MRI arthrogram. First, we will look at some of the basic glenoid measurements. So these measurements in the glenoid were initially uh, done using linear measurements, the method called as a linear method advocated by Griffith and then popularized by Chong et al. We'll go one by one in the next few slides followed by the surface area method. Surface area method was found to be more accurate than the linear methods. So the linear method, the first linear method was described by Griffith et al. in the year 2003 in which he actually did CT scan of both the shoulders, the normal as well as the injured shoulder in which, yeah. So after getting the CT scan 2D slices, he made a vertical line from the supraglenar tubercle to the infraglenar tubercle. This line represents the length of the glenoid, if you like, and the second line is a perpendicular line drawn at the maximum width of the glenoid. So he compared the ratio between the two, the ratio between B and A. B divided by A is nothing but the width of the glenoid in relation to the length of the glenoid, which is normally 0.7. So Naturally, in a bony bank heart, this uh, ratio is reduced. So the glenoid ratio, if it is less than 0.7, it represents glenoid injury. However, this method proved to be uh, of low reproducibility, which means that uh, surgeons were not able to reproduce this method. It was more inaccurate. Hence, uh, it had to be a better method to assess this glenoid. So, the next method advocated was by Chong et al. in the year 2008, which is also a 2D linear method, only lines drawn. Again, he used CT scan of both the normal as well as the injured shoulder. Instead of the uh, maximum width, sorry, one minute. So the same vertical line was used as with the Griffith method, but instead of the uh, perpendicular line, he chose to use the best fit circle method in reference to the postero inferior glenoid and obtain the diameter. This diameter represented the maximum width of the glenoid in this particular method, from which he calculated and he introduced the term glenoid index, which is C divided by A. The width of the glenoid on the injured side uh, represented by the diameter here and the diameter of the best fit circle, from which the glenoid index was calculated. If the glenoid index was more than 0.75, then this group advocated arthroscopic bank heart repair. If it is less than 0.75, then naturally it goes to a lateral jet procedure. If you look at the other side of it, actually, it is the 25 percent that still we uh, talk in terms of a percentage bone loss, okay? So 0.75, more than that in a glenoid index is arthroscopic bank at repair, less than 0.75 is a lateral jet procedure. This was more reproducible, but one inherent limitation of these linear methods is the overestimation of bone loss. So another popular 3D linear method was described by Sugaya et al. in the year 2005, in which only the CT scan of the injured shoulder 
was done. Here again, the circle of best fit was made in reference to the posterior inferior glenoid and the diameter of the circle was calculated. Again, the width of this bony fragment is measured. So the percentage of bone loss is calculated by width divided by the diameter into 100. So this again was uh, still it is used for uh, PICO method which I will be uh, describing later and as uh, described earlier, as uh, <coughs> discussed earlier, overestimation is a problem in all these linear methods. So the next better one that we currently use is the PICO method uh, popularized by Bordy et al. in the year, I think around 2008. Here, the surface area is calculated. Instead of the diameter, surface area is taken into consideration. After drawing the circle of best fit here. So 3D CT scan, circle of best fit calculated from which surface area represented by pi r square and then the area of the cord, that is the area of the bony fragment is also measured. Nowadays it is all available as a software calculation. There is no need for us to go into the trigonometric uh, calculations. All you have to do is to uh, put a perfect circle fit and draw the line and then it will give out the percentage of bone loss, which will be the area of B divided by the area of A into 100. This is still being extensively used and in fact it is a very uh, simple method for us to arrive at a surgical decision making. If the percentage of bone loss is more than 25, automatically we uh, recommend lateral jet procedure and if it is less than 25, then you may either go for a bank cut or a bank cut with remplissage. Still, the although it is 95% accurate, since it is done in a 3D, 3D CT scan, the hill sac lesion is not accounted for. We are looking at only one side of the oh, problem. So, uh, and with this method, we are not able to predict whether the head engagement occurs or not. This is where the landmark paper of Itai et al. in the year 2007 comes into vogue. So the need for combined assessment of glenoid and hill sac is to evaluate the dynamic interaction between the two. So the, uh, this group, Itai et al., introduced the concept of glenoid track and hill sac index. So till date, the only measurement that is made on the humeral head side is a hill sac index. Although we have a lot of uh, glenoid measurements, the combination of glenoid track and hill sac index gives us a better uh, <coughs> prognosis in terms of uh, surgical decision making also. Let's go into the concept of glenoid track now. So what is glenoid track? This group, they found out that the contact area moves from inframedial to posterolateral when the arm is put into abduction from neutral to abduction in external rotation. So this, do in doing so, the humeral head utilizes 83% of the glenoid width between neutral and 90 degrees of abduction. So of the 100% of the glenoid width, only 83% of the glenoid width comes into play when the arm is moved from neutral to abduction in 90 degree of external rotation. This contact area at 90 degrees of abduction in maximal external rotation is known as glenoid track. So when the arm is put in 90 degrees of abduction external rotation, whatever the contact area of the glenoid is there is the glenoid track. And the, they have also found out the uh, way to measure it, which is 83% of the full glenoid width. So in a normal uh, glenoid track will be normal glenoid width 0.83 times. In the case of bony bank art, that's where the glenoid track uh, <coughs> is critical. Here, using the Sugaya method, you do a circle of best fit and then calculate the diameter, the whole diameter of the uh, best fit circle and then the diameter or the width of the fragment. The uh, capital D minus small d gives the difference between the two and that will be the effective glenoid width, okay? and 0 0.3, 0 0.83 times will be the glenoid track. So we will be able to measure the glenoid track and then go for a hill sac measurement. This is quite straightforward. So in a hill sac measurement, naturally we measure the hill sac, which is D. Sorry, every time I violate this. 
which is D. This is the hill sack. So you measure the diameter of the hill sack lesion. The other important measurement is the intact bony bridge from the edge of the hill sack to the footprint, which is represented by the small d. So now if you look at these two variables, the not only the dimension of the hill sack is important, but also the location of the hill sack is also important, okay? If the D is up to here, then again, or if it goes medially, then also it can affect the tracking, okay? That's what uh, this principle and finding out this particular variable only help them to understand the dynamics between the two. So it is not only the depth of the uh, hill sack, but also the location of the hill sack and the intact bony bridge. So the hill sack index is nothing but the sum of capital D and the small d, okay? So that's what it is. So after calculating this, then we will be able to uh, decide if there is going to be an interaction in the terms of whether it is going to engage or it is going to fall off, off track the uh, hill sack, okay? If the hill sack index is greater than the glenoid track, then naturally it is an off track lesion, okay? If the hill sack is less than the glenoid track, then the track is uh, big enough for the humeral head to roll, and so it is not going to become off track, okay? So the track is bigger, the cup is bigger, the ball is small, so it is contained, that's what it is. So if it is the other way, then naturally it is going to fall off, which is known as a off-track lesion. So I'm going to give a couple of examples for this. So here in this MRI, we are able to see the diameter of the glenoid, which is 33.7, the amount of bone loss is 5.1, we are able to uh, measure the glenoid track, which is 0.83 times the difference between the two and 23. Also, Sugaya method, percentage of bone loss is 15%. The same patient, hill sack measurement, capital D, small d, which is 10.5 plus 9, totally 19.5, okay? So, to sum up, glenoid track is 23, Hill sack is 19.5. So the head is small, the track is big, so it is a non track lesion. Okay? So it's a non engaging hill sack, which means it is a safe uh, bony bank card. The bone less is also 15%. So the, the treatment guidelines based on this concept is that if the glenoid defect, the glenoid track, Here, the percentage of bone loss, if it is 15% and an on-track lesion based on the GT and HSI, then a bank art repair alone is sufficient. If the same 15% bone loss with an off-track lesion, then the patient may need a bank art replissage. This is the critical uh, thing that we need to know. The key thing is that even if the percentage of bone loss is less, but the lesion is off-track, then a replissage becomes mandatory. Okay? You can uh, overcorrect it with the lata jet also. On the other hand, if the percentage of bone loss is more than 25% on an on track, even if it is on track, then you go for a lata jet. So this is uh, an example of a off track lesion. Here again, the circle of best fit for this is 27, and then the width is 5. Glean track is 0.83 times this one, which is 18. Percentage of bone loss is D by D, 5 by 21 or 27 into 100, which is 19%. So here, the percentage of bone loss is just 19%, but you see the hill sack measurement. Here, the, di the diameter here is 11.1 .1 plus 11 is 22. 22 is more than 19. Naturally, it's a off-track lesion, an engaging hill sack with a bone loss of even 19%, then you go for a lata jet procedure. All right, so what is the uh, summary of this talk? So these radiological measurements, definitely any shoulder surgeon must be aware of before treating bony bank card because it is a very deceiving clinical scenario. And also uh, <coughs> the radiologists are not 
all of them are uh, very knowledgeable to guide us in this aspect. So we need to be very uh, pertinent and meticulous in calculating and having a good conversation with the radiologist to find out these measurements to ensure a proper treatment for the patient. So accurate CT or MRI preoperative evaluation of bipolar bone loss is mandatory and these indices predict risk of human related engagement and it also aids in proper surgical decision making. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vijayaraj. Um, shall we have discussion or we go for next session? Okay. Next is going to be online talk, is it? Dr. Nikhil Verma is going to talk on uh, global perspective, how to get bank card repair every right every time. Morning, can you guys hear me? Dr. Nikhil, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. I am Dr. Subramanian here and uh, Dr. Silish is with me. We are moderating the session. Are you ready Perfect. for your talk? Are you able to see I'm ready to go. Can you see the slides? Uh, not yet, no. Yes, we can see you now. <coughs> yeah. So your talk is going to be, first talk is about uh, how to get bank card repair right every time. Correct. So, yeah, please, yeah. Welcome to our okay. meeting. Please go ahead with your talk, yeah. Thanks very much. So good morning. Nikhil. Um, it's about a lot. Yeah. Yeah, Karthik here. Uh, thanks very much for accepting. Hey, Karthik. Uh, great to see you. Sure. <laughs> it's late night there, Saturday night, 11 o'clock. Yeah. Thanks for sparing the time and uh, being with us. We're all very eager to listen to you. For uh, Nikhil is, uh, is a great friend of India. He is a professor and director, Division of Sports Medicine, Fellowship Director, Sports Medicine, Department of Orthopedics, Rush University Medical Center uh, in Chicago. And he's a team physician for uh, Chicago White Sox, Chicago Bulls. He's a wonderful surgeon. He's been here several times. And uh, thanks very much, Nick, for uh, accepting this. Thank you. Go ahead. Please. Thanks, Karthik. So good morning. Uh, as Karthik said, it's about 11 p.m. here on Saturday night. Um, I just got back from dinner, so I want you to keep that in mind when you fill out your reviews regarding the uh, content of this talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about some pearls to optimize arthroscopic instability from a surgical perspective. And I think this is critical. One of the problems that we have when we look at the literature is that it's very difficult to get a, a clear idea of the technique that was used uh, for arthroscopic stabilization when outcomes are reported. And, and that, in my mind, is a key determinant of success or failure. My disclosures are available through uh, our U.S. Academy's online disclosure program. So I think if you're going to talk about success or failure with any procedure, the first goal is really to understand what are the true <clears throat> indications for arthroscopy versus open or bone loss surgery. And I think the indications are early stabilization. That means less than three instability events. We need to be critical about avoiding significant bone def defects. And you heard about how to measure those in the last talk. Patients that have had significant capsular issues, which is often represented by multiple dislocations. We know that our younger patients or those involved in high level contact or collision sports, such as American football or rugby, are clearly at higher risk for instability. One of the questions that comes up is given what we know about recurrence rates after arthroscopic stabilization, is there still a role for this in 2022, 2023? And I think the answer is yes, but we need to be thoughtful about our indications and also uh, very meticulous about our technique. Once you've indicated a patient for uh, an arthroscopic procedure, I think it's critical that the lateral position be used. Uh, this has several advantages for the surgeon. It provides hands-free lateral distraction or uh, balance suspension to distract the humeral head away from the glenoid. It allows you access to the inferior and posterior quadrants. And remember that shoulders don't dislocate anterior, they dislocate anterior inferior. And similarly, they don't dislocate posterior, they dislocate posterior inferior. So the inferior component of instability is critical uh, to manage for a successful outcome. And it also puts the surgeon at the head of the bed with access to both the front and back aspect of the shoulder. So if you're not familiar with the lateral positioning, it's something to definitely try when you have the opportunity to visit a lab. When you position these patients, make sure that they're not straight up and down. The scapular axis is about 30 degrees off the axial axis of the body. So you need them sitting back about 30 degrees in order to place the glenoid against the uh, flat to the floor. 
And here's a view from the anterior superior portal, and you can see that I can see the entirety of the inferior two-thirds of the glenoid. So this gives me this really good bird's eye view that will allow me to manage instability pathology really in a 270 degree arc to make sure that I can uh, appropriately repair the labrum and retention the capsule. The portals are again critical. I think we're all familiar with some of the standard portals that we use, the posterior viewing portal, which can also be used for suture shuttling. The anterior superior portal, which you'll see in my presentation, goes behind the biceps, and that's the visualization portal that I critically use. The mid glenoid portal is just above the subscapularis, and this allows access to the anterior inferior quadrant. But if you're going to successfully manage instability, you have to become, become familiar with these two accessory portals, the posterior inferior and the anterior inferior 5 o'clock and 7 o'clock portals. And these are really what allow you to place your anchors down in that critical zone that exists between, say, uh, 4 o'clock in the front of the glenoid and 8 o'clock in the back of the glenoid. This is what it looks like from both the back, which would be on the left of your screen, and the front, which is on the right of your screen, and where these three portals exist. On the posterior view on your left screen, you also see that central portal, which is the portal that we'll use for remplissage. And I'll show you quickly how I do that procedure as well. In addition, you need to be familiar with the different types of instability pathology that you may encounter. Here's what a standard bank art looks like. You can see the detachment of the anterior labrum, a flap of labral tissue that exists inferiorly. But as we go down to look at the capsule, what I want you to pay attention to is look at the capsular laxity that exists in that anterior inferior capsule. And you have to resolve that in order to render the shoulder stable again. This is an example of an ALPSA lesion where the uh, capsule and labral comp uh, complex is scarred in a medial position, and that needs to be elevated and mobilized in order to uh, restore it anatomically. A GLAD lesion involves the articular surface. My experience has been that both the ALPSA and the GLAD lead to a slightly higher risk of recurrent instability, and the GLAD lesion, these patients often have persistent pain due to the articular injury. And then finally, the Hagel lesion, and this can be easily missed. You can look into this and think that you're looking at the capsule, but what you're really looking at is the backside of the subscapularis. And it's really not until I reach down, and you'll see here with this final grasp that I get the capsule in the right position. And you can see how the capsule has been completely torn off the humeral side and retracted away. And that needs to be resolved and repaired in order to make the shoulder stable again. The mobilization is extremely critical. So we're looking here from an anterior superior portal. We're looking inferiorly. And we're going to completely mobilize that labrum down the front of the glenoid neck. And the, the picture or the video that you see on the top right of your screen and the top left of your screen is the same patient. So you can see the amount of mobilization that we're able to achieve. And in doing so, when we reduce the labrum into an anatomic position, we not only reduce the labrum, but we also retention the capsule at the same time. So this type of preparation is critical for both assessing a biologic aspect for healing, but also mobilization in order to achieve your uh, repair. And then finally, the zone of injury. As we talked about earlier, shoulders dislocated in an anterior inferior direction. And this creates a 180 degree zone of injury for this right shoulder that's between the 2 o'clock at the top and maybe the 7 o'clock in the back. And so we need to devise a uh, reconstructive option that addresses this entire zone. And for me, that's more than just the three anchors in the front. It generally involves a minimum of four to five anchors and often apply cation suture in the posterior inferior aspect so that I can get the capsule tension appropriately while repairing the, the labrum anatomically. We, we heard earlier a talk about uh, some of the measurements that are used to determine indications for different procedures. This has been what I've used uh, in terms of a clinical practice. I start to worry about glenoid bone loss at somewhere around the 13 to 15 percent range. And one of the issues with just simply measuring is to understand that there are patient factors that guide us in terms of making a decision. So it's not just about a number. It's about the number plus the patient factors. If it's less than 15 degrees, then I'll start to contemplate an arthroscopic procedure, and then I can decide whether I need to address the Hill sacs or not. Although we talk a lot about the engaging and the non-engaging lesions, what the evidence is clearly showing us is that it probably doesn't matter whether the Hill sacs lesion is on track or off track. If you see it arthroscopically, it, it makes sense to do a remplissage even for an on-track lesion to try to decrease your risk of recurrence. So we're going to put all that information together, and this is just a case example for me, a 27-year-old male, two years of uh, pain and instability after a skateboard accident. He's had self-reduced dislocations, about three at this point, but multiple subluxations and full range of motion. Looking at this with a standard radiographic series, you can see that the uh, glenoid appears relatively normal. And again, with the on-face 3D CT scan, we can see the glenoid looks uh, generally normal, less than 5% bone loss, but a moderate-sized Hill-Sachs lesion. 
So we're in the lateral portal here. There are a number of different positioning devices that we can use to try to uh, distract the humeral head away. I'm visualizing in this left shoulder from a posterior aspect. You can see that his labral pathology clearly extends into the posterior uh, inferior aspect, so I'm going to need to address that. The first portal goes in the mid-glenoid position, so this is high and lateral just above the subscapularis. And it's critical that you angle this portal from superior to inferior so that you can get the appropriate orientation in order to place your anchors in the right position. We'll generally use an 8 millimeter cannula here to accommodate a curved suture passing device. And then my second portal, anterior superior, goes high in the interval just behind the biceps. And I'll actually make a small slit, slit longitudinally. This is probably at the anterior border of the rotator cuff. And so we want to split along the musculotendinous junction, and my camera goes into this position. And again, this gives me this nice top-down view to see the entirety of the inferior two-thirds of the glenoid itself. Here you can see um, that we're looking to the back, and we can see the Hillsax lesion. We're going to take the arm out of the lateral distraction, which allows this lesion to come to us as the humeral head dislocates anteriorly. We'll make a portal that's centered on the middle portion of this lesion, and then we're going to use a uh, curette or a bank heart elevator or something to just slightly freshen the bone to create a bleeding bed for healing. I used to put sutures in and pass them and tie them in the subacromial space, which is very cumbersome at the end of an arthroscopic procedure. So what I do now is I just put a small five millimeter cannula, I sweep away the bursa overlying the capsule and rotator cuff complex, and I make a penetration with just my anchor guide distally in the inferior portion of the lesion. These are knotless all suture anchors. I make a separate per uh, percutaneous uh, stab wound through the superior portion of the lesion. So now you can see that the two anchors are in place. They're about a centimeter apart. And what I'll do is I'll take the working stitch from the inferior anchor and dock it into the superior anchor and the working stitch from the superior anchor and dock it into the inferior anchor. So I'm essentially going to link the sutures over the top, creating a suture staple. The next step is to not tighten that down, but leave it loose so that you can tension it at the end. And we're going to work from the front portal all the way to the back. You can actually prepare the entirety of the labrum, except for superiorly, working across and down from the anterior portal. <clears throat> Once we have the labrum prepared, we're going to uh, create the 7 o'clock portal. You can see that it's about 3 to 4 centimeters distal to the posterior lateral tip of the acromion. Again, we'll place our guide percutaneously, and this first anchor goes at about the 630 position, so it's just off the inferior aspect of the glenoid. We'll drill our anchor. I've moved to these all suture anchor constructs, which are knotless. They allow you to tension as you go. We'll bring in a curved suture passing device. In this case, it's a spectrum from posteriorly. We'll pass the uh, passing stitch through, which allows us to shuttle through the working stitch, as you see here. So the blue is the working stitch. The black and white are the passing sutures. And essentially what this anchor construct does is it, as we retrieve this, we're going to link the anchor, the working suture back into the anchor and it locks into the place in a knotless configuration. So you can see here I'm shuttling it back through the anchor and now all I do is tension it and it locks into place so that the uh, anchor is a knotless configuration and it allows me to retention. I'm going to place a second anchor in this case because the uh, tear continues in an anterior superior direction and I'm going to tension these but leave them in place. The next step is to establish this anterior 5 o'clock percutaneous portal. This is low down in the axilla. It's a worrisome place when you look at it on the skin, but we're actually lateral to the glenoid and we're through the subscapularis tissue, so we're still about a centimeter to a centimeter and a half away from the uh, axillary nerve. And you can see the difference in the angle that this gives me in order to get an orthogonal approach to the anterior inferior aspects of the glenoid. So again, I'll put in my uh, guide percutaneously. This allows me to get down low to place this additional anchor at the 530 position. And rather than using a curved suture passing device from the front, what I'm going to do is actually use a curved suture passing device from the back. And what this allows me to do is to grab, grab the capsule and pass through the labrum down low so that I'm accomplishing a south to north shift. And you can see as I, I reduce the labrum back into position and tension this, how I'm able to reduce the labrum and retension the capsule in a single uh, step. Once you've resolved this inferior component of the instability, now it's simply about working up the glenoid and continuing to pass our sutures. Once all of the glenoid sutures are in place, we'll just cinch down the remplissage sutures, and then we'll tension each of the sutures in the uh, glenohumeral joint, and then cut them, and this is what our final repair looks like as we look from the top. So you can see we've got an excellent apposition 
We've got a 170 degree or 180 degree repair construct and we've completed our remplissage which gives us the best chance of a successful outcome for this patient. So in summary, I think the lateral position is very important. If you don't have experience there, it's something to try in the lab. These accessory portals are critical for placing the anchors in the right position. We need to be comfortable with both posterior inferior and anterior inferior repair. And then I think if you're doing an arthroscopic procedure and you see a sail sacs, regardless of it's on track or uh, off track, remplissage is an important adjuvant. And technique matters here. I think the technique is critical if we're gonna be successful in managing these patients uh, with arthroscopic approaches. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Nikhil. Do you want to finish off the next talk also? Because uh, another one, sure. you, back to back, you can go. Bony augmentation of glenoid, your way. All right, so what happens when the orthoscopic technique is not going to be sufficient? How do we manage these more extensive defects uh, with bone loss and shoulder instability? So this is just an example case. Again, a 19-year-old right-hand dominant male. He plays American football, um, also plays basketball. He wants to play at the college level next year. He dislocated his right shoulder six times over the last two years, all in traumatic in nature, but increasing oh, just one second. ease of dislocation. Is uh, your presentation on or your, because we can't see your yeah. presentation. Yeah, can you see it? Hold on. Is it coming? Not yet, not yet. Uh, give me two seconds. I'm not sure why that's not showing up. Are you guys seeing it yet or no? Not yet, no. I think we have to go for the share screen again. And it's in PowerPoint, so maybe that's why it's giving me a problem. Is it in the same laptop, isn't it? The one that you showed it. Uh, it is, yeah. It was nicely coming earlier. No issues. Okay, let me see if I can just stop share, try to do that. How about now? Yes, yes, go ahead, uh, we can see it. Okay. So again, this is the case, a 19 year old football player dislocated six times. The most recent dislocation was about a week ago with a self-reduction, and this is what his x-ray looks like. And you can see if you look critically at the anterior inferior aspect of the glenoid, particularly in the axillary view, that we're starting to lose the sharpness of the definition of the peak of the anterior inferior glenoid, which should give you a clue that you're dealing with a bone loss situation. Here's what his imaging looks like, both uh, from the MRI scan as well as the CT scan. And now we've got a decision to make in terms of how we treat this patient. We can rehab him, we can do an arthroscopic bank heart repair, a bank heart with remplissage, we can consider open repair, coracoid transfer, a distal tibial allograft reconstruction. Uh, and for me, this is really a bone loss procedure based on his age, his activity level, the number of dislocations, and the glenoid bone loss. We know that over the last 15 years or so, we've evolved from open to arthroscopic techniques, which have worked well in general. Probably do have some role, but the question is, how do we identify which procedure works best for which indications? Sorry, we're getting some feedback here, guys. That arthroscopy is no longer valuable. There uh, was a systematic review that we published now about three years ago. That hang on for a second. So the question is: Is arthroscopy still valuable? And I think if you follow the indications that we talked about earlier, it is. Uh, but you've got to be aware of these bone loss situations because otherwise we'll see recurrence rates that can be as high as 20 to 25 percent as reported by a number of these authors. So the question is why are we failing? Well we know all about the patient related factors. We talked about technical factors. 
But really on the anatomic side, there's two major issues that we deal with, poor quality capsular tissue and bone loss, which is most commonly in a bipolar nature. Now, Pascal Boileau has talked about the instability severity index score, looking at patient age, the type of sports, uh, whether it's uh, young or older patients, hyperlaxity and the presence of bone loss. None of us have been able to really reproduce the scoring system per se, but I do think it's valuable to think about because it includes all of the different factors that we have to go through in our mind in determining which procedure is best for which patient. And the fact of the matter is that even small degrees of bone loss result in significant percentage loss, whether it's a surface area measurement or a diameter measure, uh, measurement on the glenoid, anywhere between three to five millimeters results in somewhere between 15 to 25 percent of glenoid bone loss, which is relevant. How much bone loss is too much bone loss? Well, at least if we look at time equals zero biomechanical studies, the number that seems to come up frequently is about 20 percent. But we know from the literature that especially as you get into high demand athletes and or military populations that even smaller amounts of bone loss in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 percent can be very relevant, particularly with regard to clinical outcomes and the patients reporting whether or not their shoulder feels stable. We know that bone loss is extremely common. It probably occurs in about 90% of patients, even with first time dislocations. And therefore we should be very aggressive about ordering CT scans in order to determine bone loss, particularly in patients that have had recurrent situations. Now, not all types of bone loss are the same. We can see acute fractures. We can see partial resorption with bony bank heart fragments, and then we can see fully attritional bone loss. And each of these probably needs to be managed differently. The problem is that once you develop bone loss, it leads to increasing recurrence rates, and with each recurrence, we see that the bone loss continues to become worse. And we also know that bone loss occurs not only on the glenoid side, but also on the humeral side, and we need to think about these as how they interact. Now, as we talked about earlier, although we can all come up with these numbers to say, well, we use 20% or 25% or an engaging or non-engaging lesion, the reality is that bone loss at 10% may be relevant for one person, and bone loss at 20% may be relevant for another person. So we need to think about all of these different factors. What's their age and activity level? Do we have a bone fragment that we can use to rebuild the glenoid? Is it an isolated defect or combined? What's the quality of the tissue that we're working with? And is this a primary or revision procedure? We should start thinking about bone loss in all of these situations. So younger patients involved in high level contact or collision sports, patients that present with multiple dislocations, patients that present with instability in mid-range of motion or nighttime instability, and almost all patients with revision situations need a critical assessment of the bone loss that's present. And if you start to see some of these warning signs coming up, it means that they've got a substantial capsular injury, or most commonly they have a bone loss problem. Now we know that there's all of these different procedures that we can choose, and what we struggle with is instability is how do we demand match the right procedure for the right patient. And as I said, it may be that a remplissage works well for an older low demand patient, but a latter J is required for a, a younger high demand patient, even though those patients may have the same degree of bone loss. There have been some of these complicated formulas that are used to try, try to determine when is bone loss appropriate, but it all starts with trying to under, identify what is the quantity of bone loss that's present. We heard a lecture about this, so I won't bemoan it, but the critical aspect here is a 3D C CT scan with humeral subtraction. We can model <clears throat> the inferior two-thirds of the glenoid as a circle and then either use a surface area or diameter-based measurement in order to approximate the amount of bone loss that's present. We've written about this in the arthroscopy journal, and if you're not comfortable measuring bone loss, we have an arthroscopy techniques video that will help you to learn how to do this. The Hillsax lesion is also uh, critical. Um, one of the things that I found really helpful is that if you don't have time in the clinic or you're not comfortable with measuring bone loss, just look at the front of the glenoid. If the glenoid becomes a flat anterior margin, that tells you that you're dealing with at a minimum a 13 degree, or excuse me, percent loss of glenoid. So just a quick look at a CT scan. If you see that it's a flat anterior surface of the glenoid margin, you're in a, at least a subcritical glenoid bone loss situation. Etoy has talked about this on-track, off-track lesion, and we heard a very uh, um, good discussion about what that means. The way that I look at it that helps me to understand this best is a tire going over a pothole. We certainly have lots of potholes here in Chicago after the winter season. Having been in India, I know that you have a lot of potholes too. So think about the tire as being your glenoid and the pothole as being your hill sacs. Essentially what we're saying is if the tire is wide enough and the hill sacs lesion is small enough, the tire goes right over the pothole and you don't even know that it's there. 
Unfortunately, what happens is you start to lose bone, your tire becomes smaller and smaller, such that for any given pothole, you're more and more likely to fall into the defect. And the same thing happens with glenoid bone loss. So it really just helps you understand how you can't look at a glenoid site independently. You can't look at a humeral site independently. You have to understand that each of these affects the other in terms of making one another more relevant. Now, the good news is once you get into a substantial bone loss problem, the reality is that glenoid-based procedures will almost always resolve glenoid-based problems and bipolar problems because it will simply make the tire big enough so that the hill sacs becomes irrelevant. It's very rare, less than 10% of situations where we see a substantial hill sacs in the absence of glenoid bone loss, and that was the, the case that I saw you, uh, showed you in my last talk. We have all of these different options that are available for managing bone loss, but really the latter day has become the take home uh, for me in managing primary situations. I use the distal tibial or ili iliac crest bone grafts in situations where revisions are necessary or patients that have substantial bone loss greater than 25 to 30 percent. So I look at the glenoid side. If the glenoid is relevant, I already know I'm doing a remplis, excuse me, a, a latter J, and I don't need to consider the humeral side. If the glenoid side to me is irrelevant based on the measurement as well as the type of patient, then I'm going to decide on whether I want to do a REM massage or not. And so these are the steps that we go to in helping to assess how do we manage uh, these bone loss situations. And these are the typical algorithms that have been used historically to try to help manage that, although I think that we can certainly be better at that than we have been. The REM passage option I think is a good one in cases where you're going to augment an arthroscopic procedure. I've already showed you that technique, so I'm going to skip over that here. Uh, but remember that there are options when you have enough bone to be able to reconstruct that. And these are two good examples of glenoid fractures in an acute situation where we've got great bone and great cartilage, and we can manage this using either percutaneous screw fixation, open screw fixation, or double row techniques where we place one anchor medial to the piece of bone, we come around the bone fragment as you see on your lower right, and then we dock those sutures back up onto the glenoid margin, which essentially creates a transosseous equivalent type repair of the defect in order to reduce that into an anatomic position. And here's what it looks like when you get done. So what about iliac crest? I think it's a great option, but it typically is used in larger situations. And the latter J has really become our workhorse for managing these uh, patients. It's autograph bone, it's locally available, and it can manage up to about 25% of bone loss in a standard technical fashion. So there are some barriers to acceptance in terms of why people aren't doing this more frequently. Uh, the indications are in clear but evolving. I think we're all very comfortable with arthroscopic techniques. We all don't follow our patients more, more than two years to really recognize what of our failure rates are. For many of us, we weren't trained on the latter J procedure, and so it can be somewhat um, difficult for us to learn this in practice, and it can be somewhat scary to perform these procedures based on proximity to the neuro neurovascular structures and the technical challenges that they uh, produce. In terms of some tips I have for you in terms of doing the latter J, I do this in about a 30 degree beach chair position. I try to bring the head of the bed uh, patient to the side of the operating room table that I'm operating on. Remember, we want the glenoid and scap scapula to fall away from us. We need to work on the glenoid neck. This is not like a total shoulder where you want to look at the glenoid face, so you need the uh, glenoid to fall away. The subscap split is very helpful. It preserves subscapularis function, and I think bringing the graft over the top of the inferior aspect of the subscap provides some secondary restraint to anterior translation, and the graft position is critical. We know that you've got to be flush or slightly recessed because if you get any graft proud, you're going to increase contact pressure in the joint and potentially increase the risk of arthritis. We've looked at screw configurations as to whether they matter, and the, the answer is they really don't. So whatever screw you're most comfortable with is really the one that, that you should use. And so finally, I'll just show you my technique for coracoid transfer. So again, we're in the beach chair position. Uh, we're sitting up at about 30 degrees. I always use a general endotracheal anesthetic uh, along with a muscle relaxant to be able to get the retraction that I need. I use a small, uh, about eight to 10 centimeter incision that I call a bikini strap. So it goes from the coracoid process inferiorly uh, to basically the axillary fold. We're going to place one pointed home and retractor that goes over the top, and this allows us to identify the coracoid. The CA ligament is transected, and then we're going to dissect out the pectoralis minor from its insertion on the medial border of the coracoid. One of the landmarks that you want to look for here is the palpation of the coracoclavicular ligaments. 
and this generally marks the medial extent of your resection. And then we use an oscillating saw to take about a 20 millimeter piece of, gleno of uh, ladder, uh, coracoid fragment, and we complete that with a curved osteotone. Here you can see the, uh, the base of the coracoid process and how it curves up uh, in order to create the coracoid neck, and that tells you that you've taken enough of a resection to get an adequate piece. It's critical, I think, to prepare the backside of the coracoid in order to get a bleeding bed for healing. And then we drill two parallel drill holes. They're generally between 10 to 12 millimeters apart. This is a commercially available system that's uh, by Smith & Nephew, but there certainly are a number of systems that are available out there to help you to do this. In this case, I'm going to use the coracoid in a standard configuration. I'm going to measure the offset between the hole and the edge of the coracoid that will become my articular surface. And I'm going to measure the depth of my inferior screw hole so that I know later can add that to the depth of my glenoid hole and come up with my uh, measurement for my screw. We're going to use a deep, curved, uh, self-retaining Gelpie retractor. This allows us to get down, split the subscap, and identify the glistening capsule underneath. We'll then incise the clap capsule longitudinally, and we'll place a Fukuda retractor. And then across the neck of the glenoid, we'll place an anterior glenoid retractor, which really allows you to see this anterior capsular tissue. The capsule is elevated in a T-capsulotomy. We'll tag the inferior portion of the capsule using a standard suture. And here you can see the view of the glenoid neck that we get. And once you get to this point, it really just becomes a simple AO techniques in order to put the coracoid back down into position. We'll lightly decorticate. Now remember, I measured the offset between the hole that I drilled and what will become the articular edge of the coracoid process. I'm going to use an offset guide very similar to what you use for ACL surgery in order to recreate a hole in that position. And then I'll simply use that predetermined hole to screw the graft down into place. I can then rotate the graft uh, to line it up so that it sits flush with the articular surface, use my first screw as a guide along with the drill hole that I previously placed in the coracoid to place my second screw, and then I <coughs> sequentially tighten these screws in order to uh, tension the coracoid back into position. I do think it's important that we repair the capsule. There's a number of ways to do this. We can either place uh, sutures around the screw heads. We can repair to the coracoid uh, uh, clavicular uh, excuse me, the coracochromial stump, or I generally use an anchor at about the 330 position, and I like to repair the inferior capsular split. And the reason for this is because patients can dislocate below the graft, and you want to make sure that you reconstru reconstruct that hammock of the inferior glenohumeral ligament complex. Finally, the arthroscopic ladder J is uh, evolving. I think what we're going to transition to is arthroscopic bone block procedures where we don't have to split the subscapularis. We don't have to identify the musculocutaneous uh, and axillary nerves because the, the rates of complications, even in the most skilled hands, are probably unacceptable for most of our populations. And then finally, when do we need to do something more than just the ladder J alone? The best data that I've seen is from Peter Millett, where he essentially looks at the, uh, the lesion on the humeral side. He estimates how large the glenoid will be after he places his coracoid in place and then recalculates the glenoid tract. If your humeral head lesion is large enough such that it remains off track despite the coracoid being in place, then I think that is an indication to either graft the humeral side or to do a remplissage in, in conjunction with your ladder J procedure. So I think that if you keep these principles in mind, you'll be successful in, in uh, performing bone loss procedures for the management of glenohumeral instability. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Questions, Anthony. guys. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Uh, questions we'll take later. So, uh, so for Nick, if there are any questions now, we can take now so that you can... Uh, Okay. Is there any questions? For any uh, questions uh, from Doctor for Doctor Nikhil? So we can take now. Hello. Uh, hi, uh, Nikhil Verma. It's uh, Doctor Arumugam from Chennai. Hello. Hi. How are you? Hi. Hi. Great talk. Excellent presentation as usual. One question I saw: Your critical bone loss is fifteen percent. That's based on yeah. your personal experience or some literature evidence or uh, uh, what is. Uh, your take on 15% uh, uh, of your critical bone loss? Yeah, so I, I, like I said, I don't think it's a hard number. Um, for example, if a patient has had 10 dislocations and they have a bipolar lesion and they want to go back to playing rugby or, or some high contact sport, I think that our success rates, no question, are going to be better with a ladder J compared to a soft tissue procedure. 
The flip side of, is if I have a 40-year-old, fairly sedentary individual who's had longstanding instability, has a 20% uh, glenoid defect with a, rump, with a hill sax lesion, they still will probably do fairly well with an arthroscopic stabilization and a rump lesage. So I think the number is somewhere between 13 and 20%, depending on all of the different factors from a patient-related standpoint that we, we think about. But I, I think that it's really hard to just put a number on it without looking at the patient, the history, and you know, primary revision, those types of things, and making a decision. What we do know is that, is that if you start to look at patients with even 13 14% glenoid bone loss, they may not have true recurrent instability, but they'll often have apprehension and, and lower results on their WOSI score, which are reflective of uh, persistent problems in the shoulder. So I, my number has clearly been moving down over time as a result of the fact that uh, I just, you know, I think two surgeries in these young people, if we can avoid them, um, we have much better results in the long term with a latter day. Uh, uh, Dr. Nikhil, uh, Dr. Sundarajan from Coimbatore. Um, my question is that when you have a comminuted bony bank uh, I heard that you are going to do a double row for most of your cases. Uh, sometimes it will yeah. be, uh, sometimes it will be very uh, bad situation where sometimes it's very difficult to reconstruct. It's a messy operation. Yeah. Did you yeah. uh, do any time like straight away like a letarche or a bony replacement procedure? Yeah, so it's a great question. I tell you my experience has been twofold. Number one is you have young patients with good bone with bony bank hearts and almost always in that situation, it's a single piece or two large pieces that can be repaired. And, and I won't be afraid to make an open incision there and use smaller screws. I'll do a, uh, a separate split between the subscap and the capsule, come over the top and then repair them in an open fashion if I need to. The situation that you're talking about is really twofold. One is chronic instability where they've had attritional loss of the bony piece and resorption over time, at which point I think we A, usually don't have enough bone to repair and B, it's probably not the best biologic environment. So I won't hesitate to cut those out and just do a ladder J. The second situation though is the older patient that has a fractured dislocation along with most commonly rotator cuff pathology. And what you recognize in the older patients is their, their biggest problem is stiffness. And so for many of them, I'll leave the glenoid side alone. As long as the humeral head stays with the glenoid and is not subluxed anteriorly, in most of those cases, you can leave the glenoid alone, just fix the rotator cuff, and you'll be fine. Thank you. Uh, hello. hello, Dr. Nikhil. Nikhil, this is Dr. Senthil from Chennai. I've got two questions. Uh, you actually showed that your anchors, you start quiet at uh, around 6 o'clock and 6.30 sometimes. Uh, so do you uh, also plicate the capsule? Uh, uh, because do you uh, also do a shift posterior inferiorly when you do that or you just repair? Uh, is there a risk of over tightening or do you actually individualize repair depending upon whether the patient is in uh, a collision athlete or is it uh, you know not an overhead athlete? Because uh, whether posterior inferior plication would actually offer more stability or stiffness, uh, your opinion. And my second... Yeah, so... Uh, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll ask the second question after your answer. Yeah. Okay. So stiffness, in my opinion, is not a problem in these younger patients. I, I can't remember a time where I've ever had to go back and release them, and I would rather them have a little bit of loss of motion, which is almost irrelevant in the with the exception of the overhead throwing athlete which is where you have to be a little bit careful about over tightening them that's a tough problem when you have instability in an overhead thrower uh, because you need to balance making them stable but also retaining their motion the good news for us is those are mostly baseball players and they're not in a collision sport so their risk of actually having a recurrent dislocation is lower and so i think we can get away with less of a plication the two comments i would make are number one what i've been amazed at is when you when you mobilize the bank cart appropriately, what you find is that actually by reducing the bank heart into an anatomic position, meaning shifting it uh, uh, back up to the glenoid margin and superiorly, most of the times that will resolve the majority of your uh, capsular laxity. So simply by getting the labrum back and reduced anatomically will resolve a significant com component of your instability. Having said that, if you do have these patients that have hyperlaxity, um, then I will Plicate, and I'll at times do a pinch and tuck technique where I'll come about a centimeter off, take a bite of capsule, and then come back towards the labrum and then duck underneath again for a second bite. So you can certainly titrate based on the specific situations, the amount of laxity that a patient's exhibiting, their examiner anesthesia, whether they're lax in, in more than one direction and whether they have an inferior component of the instability um, uh, to try to dial in how much plication you want to do. 
But I, I think the risk of over tightening is extremely small in these patients. And I would go larger with your plication rather than smaller um, because of that fact. Just uh, one, one more question is regarding the Remplissage technique. Uh, is is there? Do you think this there is a role for actually doing remplissage in uh, on track lesions? Because obviously we talk about off track lesions, but um, in specific yeah. subgroup, uh, especially there's a paper from uh, the UK which talks about remplissage for on track lesions, whether that will offer more stability, especially given that yeah. after three years they do stretch out the anterior part of the capsule. So, what's your opinion on that? 100%. I think all of the data that's coming out in a contemporary fashion is showing us more and more that remplissage is a critical aspect of achieving a positive result. The flip side of that is that all of the papers, including the systematic review that we published, really have shown that there's no penalty for a remplissage. There's no significant motion loss. We're not seeing increasing pain. Again, the one area to be cautious is in the overhead throwing athlete. So uh, that's why I asked the question during the lecture is, do we even think calculating the track is relevant? Because for me, if I can see the lesion arthroscopically looking from the front to the back, uh, if they're a high risk, high demand patient, they get a remplissage regardless of whether it's on track or off track. Thank you, uh, Dr. Subramanian here from Madurai. I have one question about your 270 degree repair. It's nice to see that video, it was wonderful. What is your specific indication for? Do you do for everyone or only for patients who are having posterior tear and all? Yeah, so uh, my experience, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, 200 degree, that's what I'm asking, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so my, my experience has been that the good news is that the vast majority of those resolve, um, and most of them resolve within four to six weeks. So for me, I don't think there's an urgency to address those operatively, and, uh, and I'll at least demonstrate signs of early recovery, meaning either sensory over the uh, lateral aspect of the arm, or mo more commonly, they may have weakness, but you can at least elicit firing of the deltoid. Uh, the bigger issue for me has been those patients that I talked about earlier. They're usually fracture dislocations in older individuals where you have cuff pathology. Um, and we know that rotator cuff pathology does better in the acute situation when we fix it early. And my approach there has been that because we know that the vast majority of those uh, patients will resolve the neurologic injury, I just go ahead and fix the cuff within two or three weeks and then continue to rehab uh, with the expectation that the neurovascular injury is resolved, and it, it pretty much always does. And so I think that's the situation where I would consider an early intervention is uh, significant rotator cuff pathology in the setting of a fractured dislocation where you want to put that cuff back normally. Thank, I think, you, uh, thank you very much, Nikhil. Uh, wonderful session with you, a lot of interaction questions. I know it's very late night there. so. Uh, Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for uh, sharing your time and uh, teaching us. Yeah, congratulations on your con Thank uh, you. Congress. Thank you, Nikhil. Uh, Thank you very much. Okay. Take care, guys. We'll go on to the next talk. And uh, that's uh, first time dislocator. What is the update for this year? Dr. Sanjil is going to tell. Oh, yeah, okay. 
So thank you very much, Dr. Karthik, and thank you very much uh, for uh, providing the opportunity here. So uh, the talk is actually on first-time dislocators. Uh, what do we actually know more? Uh, so th this is more of uh, decision-making, whether we need to operate on the first-time dislocators or not. So we know the natural course of the, you know, the first-time dislocators is that the humerus displaces the labrum by means of an avulsion force, and the labrum we know is a passive stabilizer of the shoulder, and with each dislocation, the glenoid and the capsular distension increases the risk of instability. So um, the plastic distension of the capsule itself offers better environment of the healing and the acuteness. Uh, and the treatment protocols have varied over time, whether we immobilize them after a first dislocation in internal or external rotation. Uh, and in the past, uh, surgically, arthroscopic washouts used to be done where you know, historically where they, it was thought that that will create a better milieu, but it has a number of studies have uh, actually refuted that and it's more of a placebo effect. So in terms of internal or external rotation, Etoy popularized the external rotation brace, uh, showing with MRI evidence that the labrum actually heals better, but this same result of external rotation brace has not been able to be replicated in other studies. So we now the consensus is to, after the first time dislocators, to uh, reduce them primarily, close reduction, uh, and then put them in a neutral brace. So whether we operate them primarily or not will be more of the focus of the talk. So what happens after the uh, first time uh, dislocator is that in the normal mechanics is that the, the capsular injury occurs and there is a permanent deformation or a non-recoverable strain of the capsule. So whenever it goes beyond its elastic limit, then that's when actually it also a significant contributor apart from the bone loss that we actually talked about. So that's when actually we think about whether we have to plicate the capsule and shift them. Sorry, can you? Uh, so this is, uh, in spite of the current techniques, we know that about 20%, you know, 6 to 20% actually after a period of time, which we actually talk about not just two years, this is about four to five years time, they tend to actually have a recurrent subluxations. So, and again, in spite of all the best efforts, we cannot, you know, get all of them back to sport. So about 25% cannot return to the sport. So this is one of the recent cadaveric studies, uh, you know, which is actually, uh, uh, they actually looked at cadavers and then put in micro markers in the capsule. Uh, and then actually they put strain gorges and then had robotic arms uh, and uh, looked at the amount of strain that actually happens or deformation of the capsule that happens anteriorly, posteriorly uh, with one dislocation followed by multiple dislocations. So using that, we ac they actually could show that there is a non-recoverable strain that happens you know, with multiple dislocation. But what was interesting is that they actually also showed not only in the anterior part of the pouch or axillary pouch, there was also posterior inferior part that actually has some amount of non-recoverable strain. So it depends upon the, the amount of capsular strain because anteriorly about 16% happened, but there is also posterior inferior capsule that actually undergoes amount of deformation. So this puts us into question whether we may have to address the posterior inferior part also uh, during, uh, but only clinical studies will actually tell about that. So uh, that there is a, we already discussed that there is a dose dependent effect. Basically with multiple dislocations, the more amount of capsular and the labral stretch happens and uh, this can result in suboptimal outcomes if, uh, you know, with, with, with subsequent repairs. So still with all this biomechanical evidence and also, you know, the subsequent meta-analysis which I'll probably be showing, that still there is no surgical consensus that, for that whether we have to actually just to treat them uh, non-operatively or operatively for the first time dislocators. So the reason for this is that although there has been overwhelming evidence that it, the recurrence rate is actually reduced, but there's still about chance of uh, about 30 to 25 to 30% of the first time dislocators if you operate on them, there's a 30% chance that you'll overtreat them. So that is probably where even with uh, multiple evidence base, there is still not consensus that we should actually be operating on all of these first time dislocators. So the decision making ultimately then would depend upon the risk factors, demographics, functional demands, the soft tissue pathology, and also when the patient actually wants to return back to sport. And so we know 
also about the point of view. We know this landmark study from Hovelius that is a 25 year follow-up study is often quoted. So the significance of this is that the younger patient, the more risk of dislocation. But also to look from another point of view is that about 50% of them could not actually return back to sport and also they also had surgical stabilization. So which essentially means about 50 to 60% of them did well with non-operative management, but then about 40% needed some kind of treatment. So it's about, again, point of view. So the other risk factors would be whether the patient has associated injuries, like whether the patient has a haggle lesion or associated uh, rotator cuff tear, uh, and also the glenoid bone loss, which is now becoming more and more important factor in determining you know, uh, the outcome of the stabilization, but also it has a factor in whether we actually be operating on them or not primarily. So uh, in terms of the operative versus non-operative management, the young athletic population forms a significant subgroup, especially patients who are actually, because most of the literature comes from the overhead athletes. So this subgroup definitely would form a, a group where an operative treatment is more favored than actually a non-operative non management. Because in these pa subgroup patients, the risk of further dislocation, we know that they are reduced by about 76%. And also, there is also more likely that they actually have returned back to sports by a uh, number of studies. And also, in terms of arthroscopic band cut repair, primarily if it is done in a first-time dislocator, over a period of two years, this is a paper from actually a randomized study from uh, Robinson in Edinburgh, which actually showed that about two years' time, they actually compared the arthroscopic band cut repair versus actually the lavage, which is the control group, and they showed that uh, two years' time, there was a significant reduction in the redislocation rate. And over a period of time, they repeated the study. And more recently, they have shown that, you know, by about like 14 years, average period of 14 years, the results are maintained. So this is another study. Uh, this is quite an old study, though, which is actually showed that the, the randomized trial between that of arthroscopic bank art versus actually non-operative, which actually reduces the rate of uh, subsequent dislocations by about like 45, 47% uh, in the non-operative group is the risk of dislocation, whereas 15% in the, uh, so it, there is a significant reduction. And also it is maintained over a period of time. So in a patient who is very young and also a high level athlete, then there is evidence that which is in supporting of operative treatment. So this is another systematic uh, analysis from 2018, which actually showed, uh, which looked at 710, uh, you know, the patients, uh, and uh, the, there is a reduction in the, again, the recurrence rate uh, compared to that of the conservative management. But they did not find any difference in actually the outcomes after you actually repair, which essentially means that if you do a repair and subsequently looked at these patients after the second dislocation, they did not have any significant superior outcome. So this is another recent meta-analysis uh, from 2020, which actually showed that uh, for a primary dislocator, when an arthroscopic bank cut repair is done, um, which looked at 10 prospective studies, 569 patients, there was a significant uh, reduction, about seven-fold reduction in the rate of recurrence. So there is more and more overwhelming evidence to suggest that the rate of recurrence is reduced. But still the question lingers, uh, you know, about 30% of the patients still will be overtreated. So this is another meta-analysis and systematic review in 2022, 348 patients uh, looked at 10 studies, and then the risk of uh, recurrence is reduced in the short term as well as the long term. But they did not actually find a significant difference in return of sports when you actually looked at uh, conservative management. So. The risk of recurrence, uh, you know, after non-operative management re really goes up in a male athletes compared to female. And the, the, the overhead athletes, they form a significant subgroup of population which, you know, uh, have significant recurrence. And the question is, if you actually decide to actually operate on the first time dislocator, do you have to do it straight away after their dislocation or can you actually delay them? So the data here uh, shows that um, you can actually delay till they actually even finish that particular season or the year where they are, this, this study from Dickens actually showed that almost like 90% um, were able to uh, return back if you actually even delay their stabilization. They were able to complete the uh, season without any s significant episodes. So, um, but the problem is that 
you know, most of them had some amount of subluxation, but they still still were, were able to carry on with their activities. Uh, sorry, hang on, just uh, we'll go back. Yeah. So this is another uh, systematic review which uh, showed that about 80% of the patients uh, were able to return to sport uh, and about 60% were returned to about their pre-injury level of activity with a primary uh, you know, repair of the, these sports persons. But it also found that in the subgroup that these patients actually had access to accelerated rehab programs and also the 70% of them actually returned to sport and 40% returned to the pre-injury level of activity. So the question again is that uh, what is the difference between one first dislocation and multiple dislocations? Because you know, is there a difference? Because if you actually have multiple dislocations, is your risk of actually having a poorer uh, outcome is there? No, actually, if you actually operate them on the first dislocation or the multiple dislocation, the outcome is similar, but you tend to have more recurrences after your first dislocation. So this again puts us into the question whether you will have to operate them straight away, but we'll probably try and dissect whether we'll get an answer or not. So the immediate surgical stabilization after the first dislocation, it reduces the recurrent dislocation compared to a two or a three dislocation cohort. That is uh, the other study. And also other factor which would be actually at play is whether the patient is actually sustaining a bony bank art lesion at the same time of the dislocation. So data suggests that up to about 15 to 20% uh, of bony bank art lesions in an acute uh, situation. This supports the evidence that actually supports that your decision making that primarily you can actually repair these patients compared to a situation where a primary dislocation where there is no bone loss at all. But this is again only in the younger subgroup of patients. You know, when you have a bony bank at lesion in a first dislocation, in a young su subgroup of patients, you tend to actually deviate towards the surgical route. But the same dislocation, if, the, if it happens in a 40-year-old and they have a bony bank at lesion, uh, there is evidence to actually suggest that you actually treat them non-operatively. And the CT-based studies have shown that these actually, these patients have almost, you know, Equ uh, good results with non-operative management with, with very minimal recurrences. So it's important to actually look at the age group because this study, which is a nine-year follow-up study, which actually uh, looked at the CT subsequently, showed that if they have a bony bank at lesion, even the first time dislocated, but the age matters, more than 40 years, you tend to manage them non-operatively. So the factors that may occur, uh, the, uh, the outcome of the surgery, I'm not going to discuss because it's been discussed in uh, great depth uh, in terms of bipolar bone loss and the glenoid tract, but these are factors which affects the outcome after you do the procedure. So the, in terms of the factors that will actually affect whether you have to operate or not, is that in spite of all these evidences, the, uh, you know, there is no real concern because there was a Delphi, Delphi survey done recently which actually showed that only about 5% of the surgeons really agreed that all of them have to primarily operate on all first-time dislocated. So that means that in spite of all this biomechanical studies, in spite of all the RCTs and the meta-analysis, there is a risk of over-treating about 30% of the first-time dislocators if you apply the rule that if you will operate on all first-time dislocators. So it has to be individualized to each particular patient. So that is the that is what we can actually come to a consensus uh, as far as 2023 occurs. But if you were to actually, but there are a subgroup of population which are the overhead athletes, less than 25 year old patients, associated bony bank art, the patients who have an associated haggle or an alsa lesions. These are the specific subgroup of patients where you can offer a primary arthroscopic stabilization. And you can actually delay them. You don't have to operate them straight away. You can actually delay them. And you know, after that, uh, you know, the particular season or that year is over, still you can actually offer them and the results are similar, the outcomes are similar. And the point based on the biomechanical studies, whether we should be actually in the first time dislocators also, whether we should be actually looking at uh, associated posterior application is another question which for only time will tell whether this will actually add up because we actually tend to have stretching of these 
capsule even after repair by about like four to five years time. This one particular point is that if the patient has this associated GT fractures or they have a nerve palsy, studies have shown that there is less incidence of recurrence, which essentially means that you can very well manage them conservatively because they actually tend to develop stiffness. And so it is not like an absolute indication that you actually have to repair them. So thank you. So uh, thank you, Dr. Senthivedan. We'll take the questions later. So no, later. So I would like to invite uh, Dr. Roshanwade sir for his talk on this session, Suture Anchors Types and Trends in 2023. Loading the talk, can we take the questions? So I'm going to speak on today's uh, on the hello PPT. So meanwhile, we can discuss something, you know, by the time the laptop is, okay, it's got connected. Thank you. So today I'm going to talk only on the anchors and uh, thanks to Karthik, he gave me a something different which I have to scratch my head and start making some new presentation. So anchors and instability and uh, one has to understand there is a, a big array of anchors starting from your metal to titanium to peak to biodegradable and one has to choose these anchors very carefully. So what is this anchors basically purpose for? This is for trans, this, they are almost like a trans sutures and sometimes they work as staples or screws which are often used for fixation, especially in uh, unstable, uh, unstable knee and shoulder. So the first anchors, the uh, suture anchors were designed by 1985 and since then people have started using anchors. The, there are many manufacturers now, but initially when they started, they started with a very uh, small number of manufacturers. And I think the anchor development and anchors research has led to upsurge in the number of surgeries across the world. But this is the picture by Dr. Jody Baer and when he described this, the uh, inverted pear shaped lesion on instability and how to use anchor in this situation is a very, very important issue. And this is where your surgical skill and art will come in picture. So usual role of anchor is still the uh, phase of healing. It starts with inflammation, then there is a repair and remodeling of the tissue. And the moment you have an anchor, it is the mo most function of your anchor ends by around 12 weeks to 16 weeks. By that time, your soft tissue healing is complete onto the glenoid. So the first generation anchors were metallic anchors. They were associated with migration, loose and chondral injuries. The second were biodegradable. And third were the peak anchor, the polyethyl ethyl ketone is a material which was used. And now we have a biodegradable, biocomposite bio anchor that is tricalcium phosphate anchors and the all suture anchors. So you have all kind of anchors in our kitty now for use. The usual parts of anchor which is very important, especially in instability is this eyelet. Any anchor which has bigger eyelid is contraindicated in uh, instability situation. And in fact, never advocate using a um, metal anchor for an instability case. So never use your metal anchor in instability case because eventually there will be a chondral erosion and the neck of the anchor will be exposed and it will lead to serious uh, loss of articular cartilage. So the historically, the Tita, uh, the nickel titanium, that is uh, uh, nitinol, was the first metal which was used for biodegradable and uh, not biodegradable, for metallic anchor, especially when they wanted to use with the fixation technique. Because these anchors were wedge shaped anchor, they never had any screw in mechanism. And first uh, nitinol wire was used as an expandable anchor for fixation into the glenoid. Then came the screwing anchor, so we get a very good uh, fixation onto the glenoid. The problems associated with all these kind of anchors were the severe osteolysis, whether it's the metallic or the biodegradable, that led to invention of something known as peak. Peak is a very, very stable material, highly, uh, 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 an highly unreactive structure. And it is uh, inert material which can it take very high loads, 
the load to failure is very, very high, and there is less irritation, and excellent post-op imaging is possible, especially in peak when you use in cuff and buglenoid anchors. Bioabsorber anchors has a very big role because they started as the uh, bo uh, anchor which can form bone, so there is no defect into the bony lesion, especially when they started with the, uh, the BR anchor, that is uh, the PLA anchors. The PLA anchors eventually lead to osteolysis. But when they came with PLG and tricalcium or the phosphate anchor, as you can see here, there is a osteol no osteolysis, and eventually you can get a normal glenoid, which can be used in your revision situation. So there was a very, uh, a, 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 a very good study by Dr. Carpenter, and he has presented that the uh, load to failure, especially with the old generation anchors, was very, very high. And when they use the metallic anchor, is associated with more complications. So the design for newer anchor was a need. How to fix the anchors onto the bone is uh, again a problem. There are screwing mechanism, there are push-in mechanism, there are wedge shape theories, then there are back shape theories like uh, what you use in uh, all suture anchors. The osteoconductivity was studied by Milvesky and they found out that anchor resorption, especially when you use the biodegradable anchors, is very, very high on the glenoid side, especially the, the the superior and posterior side because there are very stress, low stresses. And the replacement by bone uh, by the anchor on the glenoid side was less on the anterior side because of more stresses. So this is a very important study where they have shown that this osteoconductivity effect of the anchor is very, very less. And this all led to the formation of new suture-based anchor that is ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene which can give you a very good baggage tag type of fixation on the undersurface of the cortical bone. The first one was in uh, this series was Juggernaut. And then there are a lot of series of anchors which was published by the market. Alan Barber way back in 2013 has studied all the anchors, the forces, the tested, and he found out that certain anchors have peculiar problems. Especially the peak, peak is a bionic material, but uh, eventually the knot associated peak or the edge of the peak is so strong that it can lead to early chondrolysis and cartilage loss. Whereas if you see the, the uh, metallic anchor, they are the worst in this instability, uh, instability type of situation. Biodegrading anchors are uh, more better because they don't have a head. The head is at the end so that they can get better, better fixation. And suture-based anchors are the best for the instability situation because you eventually don't lead to the, uh, the cartilage loss and chondrolysis onto the glenoid or the either on the humeral head. So Alan Barber projected the load to failure and he found out that the best load to failure is with the all suture anchor which can give you a very good fixation. And uh, the displacement of the glenoid onto the humeral with respect to the uh, bone with regards to the all suture anchor is less as compared to the, uh, the metallic anchor. So you can get a very good load to failure when you use the cortical anchors especially in glenoid side. The usual load to failure should be at least 296 Newton so as to get better and better uh, the anchor fixation. The anchors can be classified based on the size, shapes, not material. There are different type of material. Based on size, you can see this uh, rotator cuff anchor or uh, the instability anchor, cortical anchor, cancel screw anchor. Based on shape, there are waist shape and screw in anchors which are commonly used in your clinical practice or it could be expandable or tack anchor. Based on material, it could be metallic, biodegradable, biocomposite, depending on the any situations. And uh, on uh, metallic, it could be a stainless steel or a titanium, which is commonly used in clinical practice. Biodegradable anchors have got more important role, especially in the rotator cuff type of surgeries than the instability surgeries. So for instability surgeries, the complications associated with this bio, metallic, and peak is very, very important. And that has led to the formation of new design of anchors, either in the form of peak or it could be in the form of all suture anchors. So biostable anchors are commonly used in your clinical practice. The all suture anchors, either it could be off ethibond or it could be off ultra high molecular polyvitylin or it could be ultra high molecular polyvitylin along with the polydaxanol, which is commonly used in our clinical practice. There could be knotted anchor or knotless anchor, depending on your expertise you can use is There are n number of knotless anchors which are available and eventually they have shown their failures as compared to the other anchors. So now there is a new kit in the block that is very, very popular. It's called all suture anchors, the easy to drill. You can have a six o'clock anchor, you can have curved anchor, you can have all different type of anchor and the thickness of this anchor is very, very small. 
it starts with 1.3 millimeter and goes up to 1.9 millimeter for instability situation and for cuff you can go up to 2.9 so revision in those anchors is very very easy as compared you can see there are uh, five types of uh, all suture anchors which are commercially available start with your q fix which is the uh, expandable anchor all suture and rest all other are bags type of anchor which form a bag underneath the ca uh, cortical bone and they give a stability so all these anchors can be used in clinical practice. I'll just demonstrate few uh, anchors, how they use in clinical practice, especially for Remplissage situation, you can, you have to use either a titanium peak or rotator cuff type of thick, big anchor, either in the form of 4.5 mm or 5.5 mm anchor. You can use uh, biodegradable or titanium anchors. So in clinical practice, we use the, uh, uh, make the portal and then we debride the lesion and gradually we can uh, debride the lesion and gradually we can fix the anchor. I don't have control of the laptop, so sorry, <laughs> sorry for that. Uh, uh, this is a titanium anchor which you can use in clinical practice and there are n number of anchors which you can use. You can decorticate the bone for amplissage and you can use the biodegradable anchor as you can see it here. Then we have another situation where we can use the all suture anchor for uh, ramplissage. Here in this situation, I'm trying to use the all suture anchor for ramplissage, which is very tricky because it's a metaphyseal bone. Sometimes it can come out. But if you have a very hard bone, especially in a young patient, you can use all suture anchor or you can use a simple titanium anchor as uh, demonstrated previously. So this is for ramplissage situation. Since instability, we do ramplissage surgery first. I spoke ramplissage first. And then we'll proceed with the instability that is uh, glenoid lesions. So you can see here, you have to create a portal. Then you have to mark your portal and create a portal in such a way that you can get a better outcome. At least three anchors should be put on the glenoid so as to get a very good effect. Otherwise, you will have a, a failure with less uh, stability to your repair. This has been published by many researchers that two anchors are not good. At least minimum three anterior anchors are needed to stabilize your glenoid and to the... So now, uh, when you are trying to fix your glenoid anchors, you can have different ways. Either you can use uh, all suture anchors or you can use the... Bio, uh, bio composite anchor, wedge shape anchor, and you can still get a better outcome. Uh, I, I can't fast forward this video because I don't have a control over it. I think I'll move on to the next video. Here you can see a small size anchor which are easily put on the glenoid and you get a very good outcome with the repair and you can get a very good uh, stability with these small anchors. The advantage of these small anchors is you can do a revision surgery with ease. You don't need to, you're not really burning the bridges so that you create a more bone loss situation as compared to the other larger anchors. Then there are uh, other anchors which can use in clinical practice. This is especially lupine loop type of anchor, PLA anchor, which was initially used in clinical practice. Now I think it's outdated, but this type of anchors usually get a very good stability when you want to go at six o'clock or five o'clock position. The zig was such and the malleability of that anchor was such that you could easily reach up to 5, 530 position when you wanted to do a glenoid and tensioning repair. This is a Caspari, a Caspari type of uh, a device. The old uh, uh, surgeons like me, they will recognize this. Now new generation people use the uh, quick fast or um, AcuPass type of device. The, this is an old Caspari device. Then there are knotless anchors which are commonly used in clinical practice, but eventually they have been faded away. This is my very old video where I have done the bank art repair. This is a poplop type of anchor, which is expandable anchor. You can use it and you can get a very good shift of uh, uh, labrum onto the glenoid. And this tightening will create a bumper effect, which has been termed as a, uh, the most important stabilizing effect in your glenoid labral uh, surgery. Then uh, there are n number of ways you can uh, incorporate. Uh, since morning, we have been listening to Nick Verma. He spoke about the uh, ramplissage. And now there is a new technique called anterior stabilization or anterior augmentation of subscapularis onto the glenoid. So that also is possible with the small anchor. You can have double loaded anchor or a, a single loaded anchor. You can get a very good stabilization of subscapularis without any irritation to subscap because the metallic age can irritate the subscap and break the subscap, whereas all suture anchor, since they are deep, they will not irritate the subscap and there will not be any break into the subscap. So all suture anchors have been promoted to use in subscap augmentation also. Then something about six o'clock anchors, do we really need to do six o'clock anchor? If you see this calavery dissection by Boskan, he has shown that all six o'clock anchor, 
they land up in this kind of trouble. So unless you have a curved zig, which goes well back inferior and at an angle 90 degree to the glenoid phase, you should not use six o'clock anchor. So none of the titanium anchors could be a six o'clock anchor. None of your biocomposite anchors could be a six o'clock anchor. Only the all suture anchors could be a six o'clock anchor. The, the advantage with six o'clock anchor is gives a fantastic stability because that is the real, uh, the anterior inferior glenoid bumper effect or uh, the uh, capsular shift which is helping the stabilizing the shoulder. Then something about dead man's theory. It commonly we describe dead man theory as the most stabilizing effect for the anchor because when you put the anchor in the bone, how it stays back. Uh, anchor is the, uh, anchor is the word derived from the sailor's anchor, the one which uh, the ship goes to the sea and the, the commonest place where they put it, the anchor and they put it at an angle. They don't put horizontal. If they put vertical anchor, it will go away. So it was always at an angle. And this dead man theory was uh, proposed by Burkhardt, where he said that any anchor which is put at an angle will have a fantastic stability. If you put it at 90 degree, it'll the stability will be compromised. But if you put it at 45 degree or 60 degree, the, the, uh, the, uh, this, uh, uh, the stability will be far, far better. So Burkhardt gave this description of dead man angle and he has shown that the stress uh, at the insertional of 45 degree as compared to 90 degree is far, far, far better and you get a better angle. So even in glenoid, you should put your anchors at an angle rather than going at a perpendicular to the glenoid. You'll never get that stability. So going at an angle is very important. So the common anchors used in your liberal repair are TAG, PEAK, PLA, TCP, all suture anchors. There is a stative anchor by Ceronics, which is commonly used in our clinical practice. And there are n number of anchors which we use in our clinical practice. So in summary, the anchors are materials are there to help us to get a better fixation of the labrum onto the glenoid. You can use uh, any anchor, but see to it that you don't land up in more and more chondrolysis or chondrogenesis into the glenohumeral joint. The most effective anchors are the one which give more than 250 Newton meter failure load to the anchor stability. And the failure mode depends on the design and the fixation. Never put in your anchor at 90 degree, always do it at 45 degree angle so as to get better fixation. With this, I'd like to invite you, all of you, whatever people are here, to uh, ninth International Arthroscopy Academy meeting in Mumbai. Thank you. Thank you, Roshan. Thank you for a wonderful talk. I think uh, due to shortage of time, uh, we will move on to the next session. That's what I've been instructed. Um, Next uh, is uh, Dr. Rahul Kot and Dr. Sujit to come for moderating the session. Okay. Thank you all the speakers, Dr. Amit Mahajan, Dr. Vijay Raj, Dr. Sandil Well and Dr. Roshan Wade for nicely contributing for the full session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Subramaniam and uh, Dr. Shailesh for chairing the session. Thanks. To invite Dr. Rahul and Dr. Sujit on the stage, please. Call upon Dr. R. Mugam, Vice President of the Indian Arthroscopy Society, for this uh, talk on decision making shoulder instability. Okay. We'll be starting the session two, uh, which is decision making in sto shoulder instability. So, uh, topic is now decision making <coughs> in shoulder instability. My algorithm by Dr. R. Mugam, sir. Very good morning to all of you. At the outset, I'd like to congratulate Dr. Karthik Selvaraj for taking the new initiative, Interstate Collaborative. Uh, something new idea. We all know Dr. Karthik Selvaraj is a very enterprising, talented, in fact, multi-talented uh, personality. And I wish him all the very best in all his new endeavors. And can I have my slides, please? So I'm going to talk on uh, um, decision making in shoulder instability, my algorithm. From the morning, we've been listening to many of the talk, and especially Nikhil Verma's wonderful uh, interaction. Hopefully, I'll try to give some take a message, especially for my younger colleagues. This is the Ramchandra Center for Sports Science, one of the most advanced uh, sports center for assessment of athletes uh, in this part of the world. We've been uh, awarded the India's first center of excellence for football medicine by Asian Football Confederation. Our uh, thank you. And our biomechanical lab is one among the five labs in the world for uh, 
accredited by ICC. So, Matson classification, this classification we all know ever since our medical school, basically Tubbs and Ambry whenever talk about instability, Tubbs basically it is a torn, the ligaments are torn, Ambry is you are born with that and it doesn't give any of any more uh, uh, indication how to manage these uh, lesions. Then far more um, accepted a stand more classification where uh, three phase uh, not only structural as well as um, uh, atraumatic, uh, more of muscle rehabilitation and all those things. But all this doesn't give real uh, indication to how to um, uh, clinically uh, give guidelines to treat these patients. So before going that, how far we still treat these uh, patients conservatively? Over the last 50 years of uh, leveraging literature, what can half century of worth of studies tell us about uh, primary shoulder dislocations? Current evidence suggests that early surgical repair to address the pathology has been advocated. There's been a big shift now, you know. Uh, this has been shown clinically and physically effective and natural history of recurrent dislocation, we know development of arthritis. So we kind of, uh, like more like a ACL reconstruction. About 30 years ago, we talked about uh, uh, non-operative management of um, ACL, copers, non-copers, but I think we now, uh, we are moving away from that. ACL reconstruction. In fact, we have to tell the patients take some time to get rehab and do that. So I think the shoulder instability also slowly uh, moving into that direction. Uh, thanks to uh, advancement of understanding of imaging our uh, pathology, then as well as advancement in the uh, technique and the sutures anchors, as Dr. Roshan already uh, presented, a lot more easier, patient friendly. So that made a shift. So. What are the decision to go for a um, uh, surgery? The decision is a multifactorial. All in was all this age uh, to number of dislocation, all kind of things. We'll see one by one. Age we all know increased recurrence with the young age. The less than 20 years, there's almost 90% of recurrence. If it's more than 30 years, recurrence of shoulder instability only um, only 30%. And this study showed about. Uh, 200 shoulders, almost um, 12 years um, uh, follow-up. Uh, 50 patients had a uh, recurrence. If the age is uh, less than 20 years, there is a 50% failure rate, and if the age is more than 20 years, is only uh, 24, is uh, significant. Uh, in the older patients, uh, compared to the younger age studies, older age shows less recurrence. So we tend to kind of, um, uh, we have after the bank are prepared, in the older patient, it's better. Laxity, we all know, Brighton School is always worried about lax patient, we should not uh, treat arthroscopically or uh, surgically. And we all know this uh, classification, more than four is hypermobility. And this study showed uh, about 34 patients equally in uh, two groups, non-laxity and laxity. There's no di significant uh, the difference in the failure rate. So even the lax or laxity doesn't really have to change your decision. And again, sports. We talked about contact sports, uh, high chance of recurrence. But what happened to the people who undergo surgery after uh, people on high, high level sports? In fact, the contact sport people, they get back better than the non-surgical. You know, it's uh, 34 studies, meta-analysis, almost about 2,000 shoulders. It showed the uh, high rate of return to sport after the uh, arthroscopic bank cut repair. A number of dislocations, again, uh, early intervention. Now, about uh, less than 30 years, two years follow up, 170 shoulders. What's shown, the surgically managed after uh, six months of the first dislocation, five times more of um, recurrence. And if it is uh, two to five times of the dislocation, is about eight times more recurrence. So al already there was a talk on uh, how to manage uh, the primary, the first dislocation. I think the shift is more and more towards the surgical repair because we're going to wait uh, 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 what is going to prevent from dislocating again. So it's going to dislocate further, is going to attenuate the labrum, the quality of tissues of the uh, capsule all going to become weak. And if you're going to give a repair at that time, your surgical outcome is not going to be that good as after initially of the first dislocation where you can have a good uh, juicy labrum and the capsule which you can do a uh, very good um, uh, surgical repair. Then 
pre-op planning, uh, we all uh, listened to the morning, uh, the x-rays, the MRI to assess the soft tissue and the bone loss. And the bone loss, the one thing which our, my younger colleague, I want to take home message is one thing what you need to analyze or assess is a bone loss. That gives a algorithm how to further manage these patients. We had an excellent talk by Dr. Vijayaraj about the glenoid track. I don't want to go again. So basically, glenoid track and then on track, off track, as Nikhil Verma put out, the car tire and a part tool is a very simple way of understanding. So if you understand that, then this uh, on track, off track is very easy for you to access. Then uh, there was another study, why you always need a 3D CT, whether just a MRI will be enough. This study published and they said the MRI itself is good to assess the bipolar um, bone lesion. And we did a small study comparison of MRI and the uh, 3D CT. We didn't find any significant uh, difference. And uh, the MRI is uh, good enough to assess the uh, your uh, uh, on track, off track lesion, and we presented in C card. So, decision making now is more simple with this uh, insevability severity index score. This is uh, by uh, Pascal Bailo. Basically, it takes into age, type of uh, degree of sport, type of sport hyperlaxity, and uh, totally about 10 points. About, uh, 10 points, and then uh, with the age and everything, you know marks, uh, up to four, you can treat arthroscopically, okay? But four to seven, you may add, add some soft tissue procedure like a ramp massage. But more than seven, then the bony procedure is needed. But this is not that simple because uh, this uh, severity score used only plain X-ray. Now with the 3D CT, we talked about on track, off track. So the latest one is the glenoid track instability management score published about three years ago. This is more current and gives you a good uh, algorithm to um, uh, treat these patients. It's all same as the Pascal Bilo, except for here, instead of the X-rays, it's on the 3D CT. Again, it's 10 points, no difference. So you don't see the X-ray, which is not uh, is only uh, two dimensional use the 3D CT, then the same uh, scores are um, used. So how we use them clinically? Case one, this 23-year-old uh, um, uh, call center employee, moderately failed, no sports activity, dominant right side, uh, four dislocations is a clinical examination. So, and this is his um, AP view of the X-ray, bank card lesion and the hill sacks lesion on the MRI and, and the 3D CT, it's, um, it's that lesion is uh, more than the glenoid tract. Glenoid bone loss is 8%. So we apply this criteria, the score is four. So we decided to do arthroscopic bank card repair with the ramp research. Again, this is the arthroscopic picture of this patient. And one important thing is, uh, as uh, my previous talk, uh, the lectures told, the uh, ramp research, place the anchors first, you do all that, but don't tie it. You know, same uh, two anchors, same technique of double pulley technique, what Nikhil Verma uh, showed, we use that. You can use a different way of doing that. So you pass all the switches through infraspinators and then keep it ready for fixing. Once you finish the anterior labral repair, you come back and tie it. And the important thing in the uh, um, labrum repair and bank cut repair is we talked about improved results. That's mainly because of improved uh, technology or our technique. Is the paramount important, you must have a bird's eye view, as Nicola must said. You must view from the anto superior portal, view the glenoid, and you have to mobilize the soft tissue. If you view from posteriorly, you will not see that. So uh, superiorly see that, mobilize all the soft tissue, that is the paramount thing. Then you should uh, do the south to north shift and place the anchors. Next patient is 25 ml system analyzer, well built cupboard player, and he had uh, about 50 dislocation last five years and sleep dislocation. So these are his uh, images, and um, th this is the bone loss, 27 percent, and here it's a uh, off track. So you apply this criteria, the total score is seven. So we plan to do a arthroscopic lethargy. And uh, so you need a bank card with a severe bone loss, so lethargy can do open or arthroscopy. So we started now doing arthroscopically here. It's technically more demanding, but it's more um, uh, acceptable to the patient. As um, Nikhil Verma pointed out, 
Uh, we start with the open procedure, but it's beach chair. Then you can evolve into arthroscopy. Uh, the, the neurovascular accident nerve is always worrisome, but first identify that. Then you do. Uh, uh, you don't have to split the subscap. So correct cut osteotomy done. Then commercially available zig to place the screws. And um, uh, then the letter J is not uh, that commonly used, but that really uh, what cause whenever there's a bony. Uh, uh, procedure to be done. Advantage is opposed to iliac crest or tibia, everything here also the conjoint tendon has the uh, sling mechanism. So not only bony block, also has a sling mechanism. That's why the letter J is uh, more uh, biomechanically uh, superior than the other bone block procedures. So other one thing what talk about is a subcritical bone loss. So the initial classification, Itoy and uh, Baka talk to 25 percent. And there are some people, they say critical bone loss could be 17 percent. And then there are some people even say, even as it is 13 percent. So uh, it has to be individualized. There are some surgeons, like a uh, very famous surgeon in France, Lafont. He doesn't care about even no bone loss. He does arthroscopy letter J for all the patients. So you have to take all in this into and see how you can transform into your practice. But uh, to, to take a message, I still, at our center, we follow this one, basic, uh, whether the Gilnard bone defect is 25% or not, and less than 25% on track, orthoscopic bank cut repair, so off track, add ramp research. If more than 25% Gilnard bone loss, then let us do procedure, uh, open or orthoscopic. So this is what we do. And only other um, uh, adjustment is, the 25 percent can go down to 20 or 15, depending upon the patient, and that's individualized, you know, no uh, clear thing than that. And also here, uh, the uh, letter J, sometimes even with uh, less than 25 percent can move into. So these are the things I don't want our younger colleagues to be confused. If you understand the basic principle, then you can choose uh, which uh, patient needs what. And uh, and one interesting thing is after this Grenard track incipient management uh, score uh, algorithm, the number of patients who undergo bony procedure is significantly down. So all of them have a soft tissue procedure, a bank card to the ramp research. So that uh, one interesting um, uh, uh, paper. So in conclusion, the Grenard track uh, uh, incipient management score is very useful. Our management still based on this on track, off track. We talk about 25 percent; it can go down. And uh, orthoscopic stabilization provides good to excellent results in most cases anterior to the instability. When there is the glenar bone loss, less than 25 percent can be treated orthoscopically, uh, like ramp research. If it is more than 25 percent, then bony procedure. Then, then Indian Orthoscopic Society now we launched a knee registry. I, I request all of you to use this because uh, we do a lot of uh, surgeries but not documented. Unless we're documented, we don't have a say in the international forum. Uh, forum. So with this uh, evidence, we can make uh, India really a su orthopedic superpower. And very soon, we'll be uh, launching the shoulder registry also. And also, I invite you all for the next edition of LSD, that's uh, listen, see, do, concept, uh, caravan course, and the uh, data lectures uh, next January. Thank you for patient hearing. Uh, so next lecture is, hello, is mobilizing the labrum trip, tips and tricks by Dr. Subramanian sir. Good morning. Thank you, Karthik. Actually, it's a very well thought of the topic. Mobilizing the labrum is uh, not a topic that has been very commonly asked in many conferences, but it's a very well thought of topic because something which is very important surgical technique we have to do for that. So first, uh, let me thank uh, our uh, IMC Chapter 1 team for uh, uh, organizing this meeting and uh, inviting me for giving this talk. He has asked me to talk on how to mobilize the labrum, what are the tips and tricks in that. 
And if you see the outcome of the arthroscopic bank card repair, you will see the difference in recurrence rate after surgery from 3% to sometimes up to about 33%. Why such a vast difference from 3%? There, is, there are some variables which you don't have control on that. That is a, one of the main reasons why we have that much vast difference in recurrence rate after uh, uh, surgery of doing arthroscopic bank card repair. So if you see what happens after first shoulder dislocation, invariably there is a labral tear and the labrum tear becomes gets displaced and it stays in a position where it is non-anatomical. And a lot of the time it malinates at that place and forms a loose fibrous tissue along with the adjacent bone or adjacent uh, uh, fibrous tissue, whatever you have. So in a labrum which is non-anatomical, the humerus normally which is well centered on the glenoid becomes off-centered. So that there is a tension problem. Tension between the anterior structures and posterior structures becomes unequal and they constantly becomes off-centered the glenoid. That's what happens in almost all the patients who are having a labral tear which has been marinated non-anatomically. So if we see the structure, the factors that governs the outcome in shoulder instability surgery is there are three factors, patient factors, indications, and rehab. These three are out of our control because it's done by the patient and uh, patient who is coming the indication. But there is something which is very important for the surgical technique. And the surgical technique is the one which determines the real outcome of the patient and we have to take into account about how to mobilize the labrum in that. If very important understand about the surgical technique is if you don't mobilize the labrum to the correct position, it's almost doomed to failure. There is no doubt about it. The first and primary important step in uh, doing bank card surgery is to mobilize the labrum to its anatomical position. That only leads on to the success of the surgery. So first thing about uh, when you do the bank card procedure is identifying the labrum correctly. In Sometimes if you see from the posterior portal, you may not be able to see the labrum at all. So you have to switch your camera compulsorily from the anterior side and visualize the labrum. As you can see here, the, this is the labrum here, which is far away from the glenoid. It's almost medially displaced. This is an alpha type of lesion. And uh, here, if you don't see it from the anterior, you'll totally miss it. It has happened in one of the live surgery itself during our conference. They almost totally missed this one. And because the uh, labrum is totally lying very far medially, and this is a typical alpha lesion. And first thing is we have to identify the right plane where to put our liberator and to mobilize this labrum from the glenoid bone. If you do it in a wrong place, you will shred the labrum into many pieces. So. You, I, you, I, we actually have a systematic plan where you start mobilizing from the, either from the distal area to proximal area or from proximal distal, but make a near correct plane and try to keep on mobilizing from superficial to deeper area. And many times you will see that labrum is, uh, it can be managed to take it out in a chunky piece even after mobilization. Initially you will see that labrum is not seen at all. Once you mobilize it correctly, you can see that labrum is nicely coming up and uh, you can try to repair it to the right position. For example, the same case which I told you, which I showed you earlier, here what we are doing is we are trying to put our liberator from the anterior superior portal and the camera is in the anterior superior portal and the anterior inferior portal has got the labrum and the liberator coming in. Try to identify the right plane and dissect it right down to the most deepest part. I use a small hammer to just gently tag it up and until it gives the resistance. Resistance should be giving away. And once you see that from, uh, you start seeing that glenoid labrum is floating up to the level of the glenoid, that you know the end point has come. So it is very important for your labrum to come and float to the level of the glenoid when, uh, after liberating the glenoid fully. So the, all the glenoid labrums are not same. We actually documented in our own study itself, there is certainly the capsular deformation occurs. In every patient you will see how capsular deformation is there. And labrum may be normal or may be discrete or even shredded also. We have, we, have, we have got our patients where 108 patients we have done the study and we have classified it according to how the appearance is. And so you have to understand that labrum and capsule will not be normal in majority of the patients. They are capsulized, capsulated, deformed, and labrum is also become damaged. So you have to keep that in the mind. And uh, I can see that in a case where it's got only two dislocations, for example, like this, where you can see the labrum nicely, once you liberate it, you have to liberate to make it, the surface should be bleeding surface, and the edges have to be nicely freshened, and then only you have to do the repair. If you do repair without doing those steps, then the healing will not occur at all. 
So as you can see that here we are, I'm trying to liberate it from the proximal, distal to proximal and make sure you see the subscap muscle underneath. Then you know that's the end point of your liberating of the mobilizing of the labrum. So once you see, see that, then you see that uh, the labrum and the capsule comes to the level of the glenoid, you can easily approximate it. This is actually what is a simple, this is actually a very simple case. Next one which has got eight dislocations. Here the capsule is very badly deformed and uh, labrum is also become like a very thin structure. After liberation, you real realize that the labrum is very thin and the capsule has to be mobilized to come comfortable to the level of the glenoid and reattach it. So here I'm using the rasp to freshen the edges. You have to have in your hand liberator, rasp, shaver. Sometimes you'll have to use the RF probe also if it is a, uh, the addition is very badly done. For example, this case is a, has got a small bony lesion also where you cannot liberate it just with the help of the, the simple metal liberators. You have to use the RF probe to release the capsule and uh, additions and the scar tissues under the medial aspect so that you make to the float the level of the glenoid. This one is another one where you can see the capsular tissue and labral tissue have become very thin. This is after like 15 dislocations the patient has come. So here also again it's important to make it to mobilize comfortably to the level of the glenoid. Use a shaver blade if needed to freshen the edges when you are using the shaver blade not to use on the other side, use on the side of the bone, bony side. If you use on the side of the capsular side, then you can actually chew off the tissue very easily. So you have to be very careful in the surgical technique. This is another patient who has got more than 20 dislocations. And you can see that uh, capsular tissue and uh, there is a lot of chondral damage also there. You have to freshen those edges and make sure the labrum is totally liberated and floating to the level of the glenoid. And this again, you have to do it from the systematically from distal to proximal direction and go right up to the medial aspect, release up to the, until you see the subscap muscle and uh, make it to float at the level of the glenoid. If you actually see the literature, there is not much literature available for this particular topic, how to mobilize the labrum. I can actually see only, there are only one or two articles only available. And unless you liberate it correctly, you cannot make that inferior capsular shift correctly. For example, after doing that, once you put the liberation stitch, I put a stitch through the inferior most capsule. I usually use the anti-grade passer like a, a scorpion like device where you can use it or if you want you can use a, a lasso type of device in the posterior aspect also and this actually helps you to take about one and a half centimeter of tissue from the inferior capsule. This actually helps you to do inferior capsular shift. As you can see here, I've taken almost one and a half centimeter of tissue from the inferior most aspect of the capsule and try to bring it to the <coughs> uh, labral attachment. So here, when you put the anchor, try to put it in about 5.30 position or 5 o'clock position and take the bite at about 6 o'clock position. By that, what you are trying to make is you're actually trying to pull the liberated tissue and attach it to the superior area. So this is actually not only doing capsular tightening, you're actually doing a inferior capsular shift. So think always that lab anterior uh, so instability procedure is not just labral repair, it's a tensioning procedure. As you can see here, when I do the anchor application and suturing of the labral tissue back, you will see that capsular tissue starts getting heaped up and gets tightening effect, inferior capsular shift and bumper effect all together. So if you, unless you achieve these things consistently in each and every patient, you will see that instability rate after the surgery becomes much higher. So this, you can actually consistently get this effect each time when you are doing this procedure. So at the end of the procedure, if you liberate correctly and if you do the tensioning correctly, you will see the glenoid is, the humerus is well centered to the glenoid. This is what the anterior instability surgery means. Not just suturing the labrum back to the glenoid, you have to make sure the tension between the anterior and posterior structures are almost equal and the head of the humerus is well centered to the glenoid. So if you see the literature, they have described something called suction reduction sign. What it actually means is, after mobilizing the labrum, if you put the suction on, that labrum which has been mobilized very well should come and float to the level of the glenoid comfortably. Then you know you can do your tension-free repair. If you are pulling the tissue with a lot of tension, invariably the tissue will get ripped off and uh, your instability surgery will totally fail. So this is very important to have the suction reduction effect each time when you are doing that uh, mobilization of the labrum. 
So with that, uh, whether primary or revision surgery, tensioning is important step so that the humerus has to be centered on the glenoid at the end of the repair. This will not occur unless the labrum is mobilized very well. So mobilizing the labrum is the most critical step of the whole banker surgery. In all cases, identify the labrum correctly and identify the correct plane where you have to put your liberator. If you don't identify correctly, then you will make multiple planes and you are totally sure of the tissue at all. And use good elevator, rasp, or a controlled use of a shaver and RF if needed. Even in severe cases, what you can see is that the whole labrum can be mobilized in a chunky way if you do it appropriately. This is what I would, I would like to say. With this, I thank you everyone for listening to this. And I want to invite everyone for Voyasis Nikon. It's an advanced CME in knee, in, in knee. It's for the Scopian plasty. It's going to happen in Madurai next month, June 24 and 25. A lot of faculties are coming. It will be a very useful meeting. All of you get registered. And abstracts are there for postgraduates. So please encourage your postgraduates to submit their abstracts for free paper session. And with that, I also being the governing council member of the Indian Author Society, I would ask everyone to become a member of Indian Author Society. If you are already not there, please make it soon. Thank you. Questions? So I would like to ask one thing. Uh, what is the inferior extent of your release uh, till which uh, you will go? So if for your mobilizing is labrum, you go right up to about, if the, for example, the labral tear is only up to 5 o'clock, yeah. then I deliberately extend a little bit to about 5.30 or 6 o'clock. So that you will have that good chance of bringing the tissue up. Sometimes you will see up to 6 o'clock, they don't have to mobilize further. Thank you, sir. So next, uh, I invite Dr. Subair Khan for the topic, Boni Bank Card Repair Tips and Tricks. Good morning, everyone. I thank uh, Karthik for inviting me for this wonderful program. And uh, it's quite well been organized and it's a wonderful session which is going on. So I'm going to discuss about the bony bone card fixation. You have gone through the different methods of bone losses and how it's to be handled. I'm going to discuss about like uh, bony bone card, you know, like glenoid uh, loss is around four to 70 percent is wide variable. <coughs> yeah. Vigilani in 1998 has classified the bony uh, bank art lesion into basically three types, type 1, 2, and 3, whereas type 1 is displaced avulsion with the attachment of the capsule. Type 2 is a mal union of the uh, glenoid rim, maybe acute or chronic, and whereas type 3 is, uh, we all know, like there is a bone loss or erosion, it could be type 3A or uh, type 3B, depend upon the amount of uh, bone loss, whether it is 20 25%. But st still, this classification holds good when it comes to bony bank art. So this was the methodology which has been followed in 1998 by Bajilani. So what they did for ununited fractures, uh, which is type 1, they repaired with the capsule and the labrum. Still, we do the same. When it is a mal united bone is there, still we try to repair it. Again, if it is the controversy comes here on the 3A or 3B, various uh, techniques are there to fix it, whether to augment with the bone without augmenting, that completely depends upon the bone loss and the activity age of the patient that has been widely discussed. So when it uh, comes to fixation, all bony bank art has to be fixed. There is no doubt about it, that, and it has been proven. Acute fixations are much, much better than chronic fixation. So when it comes to fixation options, these are the options in hand when it comes to bony bank cut. That is one is screw fixation, transglenoid, or transosseous fixation, or indirect reduction. Most of the time when we see a bony bank cut, we land up in doing uh, indirect fixation or a single row. And now, which is popularizing, is a double row technique where you have more stable fixation, but technically demanding. Now, there has been a study being done long time, 
about screw fixation and the percutaneous are open when it is a bony bunk cut. But only problem with the screw fixation is the metal projection. And uh, you cannot have a rotational control with the single screw. There again, you can have problems. So ideally, you need to have two screws, which is not possible when it is a small bony, frag, uh, bony bunk adhesion. And uh, you need to put screws, which is like uh, fixing like a lethargy, which is not advisable when it is when you are doing with the primary. Now comes the transosseous fixation where a K wire is passed into the bone fragment through the percutaneous technique or a very small uh, anterior inferior portals and the switches are passed around it. Again, the problem is it is mainly meant for the bigger fragments. If it is a small fragment or a small bony bunk lesion and there will be difficulty in passing the wire through the fragment, sometimes there will be a combination of the fragments. So again, it can lead to a mal reduction if the alignment is not uh, proper. So this is the transosseous technique but still holds good for uh, bigger body uh, lesions. Then a single row technique where we can easily uh, fix it with the, like a labral repair. But only problem in this technique is like uh, when you fix it uh, with this method, it can be over uh, crowding of the uh, rotation of the bone cannot be controlled. And same time, it cannot, may not be an anatomic fixation. Sometimes it, it can displace when you are trying to do with a single row fixation. Now a double pulley. Double pulley is a, again a better technique where we pass two anchors, one on the medial, the other one on the uh, lateral aspect. But only problem with this technique is you need to pass through and around the bone fragment and it has to be fixed on both ends and the suture management is uh, very, very difficult in this technique. So the advantage of this method of uh, double pulley is a two-point fixation. You have a fixation on the medial as well as on the glenoid face aspect. And uh, you can avoid the fractures, hydrogenic, because it is going around and fixing like a double row in the rotator cuff. And you can accurately reduce the anatomy fixation and you can tension before fixing it. So these are the main advantage. But only problem is that there are not much of clinical uh, results of the double row technique. And uh, you need to use more anchors and it is not much cost effective. And sometimes the suture entangling is a major issue. So uh, this, this is a study uh, by Gilles et al. where uh, the double row and single row almost given us a similar results, but only thing is they have modified in fixation of the bone fragment. And the results are uh, almost same till now. But compared to the single row, double row is more superior in initial stability. But still, we can get away with a single row, which I'm uh, going to show now. So when it comes for a bony bank card fixation, the key factor is the pre-operative -pre planning. What is the, you should always know whether you are dealing with a chronic or an acute situation. Chronic, again, we need to think about whether we need to go for a lethargy or any other bone block procedure because the resorption of the bony bone cut is very common if it is a chronic situation. And acute, of course, we need to know what is the size of the fragment. And uh, CT, 3D reconstruction CT is almost better when it comes for a bony bone cut compared to a labral. And I think uh, Dr. Armagam sir has uh, given the study about the MRI comparison for the half track and track lesion. But when it comes to the bony uh, lesions, when we are looking at the bony bunker, I would say like in acute situations, CT might be a, a better uh, assessment tool, the acute than on a chronic uh, scenario. And associated lesion is very, very important. And uh, you need to know whether there is any uh, hill sacs lesion which is acute or deep or uh, shallow. And sometimes you can get the, um, see the GT fractures. A lot of the GT fractures we see in the X-ray can be associated with the glenoid labrum or a bony bunker lesions. And the peroperative uh, technique here, which I want to emphasize, is two methods which we have been following regularly. One is the visualization that is through the anterior inferior portal and reduction of the fragment with the traction switches. Yeah. So accessory inferior portal, uh, you would have gone, gone across that uh, percutaneous passage of the anchor because the accessory inferior portal is a crucial portal when it comes to fixation of the bony bunker because like when we put the anchor in the inferior, it will be very easy and the angle of uh, anchor placement is much easier when we put this uh, inferior accessory portal through the subscap. And this is a, a study it has been done about the making of the inferior portal from outside or inside out technique. But basically, like it is going to uh, emphasize, I mean, uh, help in assessing the fixation and gives a stability while doing the bony bunker fixation. So this was a 43-year male. I want to discuss about like how we did this case. Uh, we had a bony uh, bangard lesion, which is quite big. And now it was associated with the subscap tear, which was very rare. And that's a CT image of the patient. 
He had a bony bankard with a subscap register. And uh, what we did uh, in this, can you play the video? Yes. So initial assessment of the bone fragment, whether it is reducible or not, you can see very well the bone is well visualized. So first we did is a traction sutures. So this traction suture is a key factor because when we take the anchors around, it will be assisting and reducing. Then we pass the uh, suture, uh, all suture anchors into the uh, labrum and through the bone fragment, we brought it back. So the air, the main advantage of placing the anchor through the inferior portal is you will get the reduction easily and the anchor placement is much better when it is done at the inferior portal technique. So this is after the reduction. This is a kind of indirect reduction at the same time. You can assess the bone fixation as well. This was the associated uh, subscap repair we did. So the main take home message here is pre-operative planning, whether it, we are dealing with acute or chronic situation and we need to know the size of the fragment and associated lesion should not be missed out. And whichever way we are comfortable with whether single row, double row or transosseous depends upon the bone fragment and the uh, individual technique uh, expertise, we can decide what is best for the patient. And again, paraoperatively, the traction sutures makes a very important uh, role because it assists in reducing the fragment as well as the passage of the suture is very much easier when there is a traction suture. And the accessory inferior portal uh, for the anchor placement. And uh, you have to place the anchor in such a position the, there, is, there is no roll off of the uh, bone fragment and reduction is much well preserved. Thank you. like to invite uh, Dr. Sundar Rajan for his next talk on posterior shoulder instability and MDI. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Karthi, for the invitation and congratulations for the wonderful uh, course for collaborating with Maharashtra. On behalf of uh, TNAS and TNOA, I welcome all the members and also our Maharashtra friends. Poneka is from early morning flight still, I think, in the sleepy mood. Um, <clears throat> so my topic is on posterior instability and multidirectional instability. I'm not a as brainy as Roshan. <laughs> <No. laughs> you can ask questions to Roshan. Any, anything in all suture anchors? No? Okay. Thank you. So how common uh, to have that posterior instability or a multidirectional instability? I think we know that uh, 2 to 10 percent of all unstable shoulders are uh, <coughs> posterior instability. And we know that the rate is around 20 times lower than your anterior dislocation. And uh, how do they present? They can present as a posterior multidirectional instability. They can have a recurrent posterior subluxation or you can have a traumatic unilateral posterior instability or a traumatic posterior instability with uh, anterior lesions. When to suspect posterior instability clinically is the question. Usually you don't have enough posterior dislocation like uh, anterior dislocation. Most often the patient presents with vague postro, um, posterior based shoulder pains without any mechanical symptoms. And they can have a like in a provocative position where the arm is flux, uh, flux to 90 degrees flexion and do an adduction and internal rotation. They can have a pain and uh, pain followed with the uh, sports activities and the seizures. I think any patients comes with the seizures, you should suspect a posterior instability or a multidirectional instability. The another important clinical history is the electric shock. Again, these patients can have a posterior instability or a multidirectional instability. Always these patients presented with the limited internal and external rotation. Rule out generalized ligament laxity. 
because we can have a only post instability. If you have a generalized laxity, then you should suspect that patient can have a multidirectional instability. O'Brien's test can be positive because many posterior instability are associated with the slap tear. Dryer tests should be tested. Of course, the most important test for the posterior instability is the jerk test, mo most, mo mostly for the posterior lesion, and Kim test is for mostly for the inferior lesion. So the presence of painful jerk may be uh, associated with the poor outcome in a conservative management when you deal with this kind of posterior instability. And the sens uh, sensitivity in detecting the posterior labral lesions increased to 95% when you combine with the jerk test and also the Kim test. So that gives you a clue that this patient can have a both posterior and a posterior inferior instability. So a risk factor for recurrent instability when the patient have a posterior instability, age below 40 times at the time of the first time instability, or dislocation during a seizure. Usually these patients can come with recurrent instability or large reverse hill sacs lesions. Or the patient, the patient has got a glenar detroversion, again they can come with, uh, reverse, uh, with uh, recurrent instability. Of course, we should look for the capsular hyperlaxity. Mostly that indicates when they have a sulcus test, which where you have put a finger, one finger breath below the acromion, then they can have a inferior laxity that this patient, sus you should suspect a multidirectional instability rather than posterior instability alone. Glenohumeral dysplasia and high humeral or glenar retroversion should be evaluated for this kind of patients. And the shoulders with the posterior instability were found to have significantly greater, uh, great, <coughs> uh, significantly greater control labral and osseous retroversion and in comparison with the controls. So this uh, retroversion of more than 60 degrees showed higher incidence of contralateral uh, injuries. Even though we don't, we'll deal with the retroversional in the uh, acute cases, but in a chronic cases, you may need to deal with. Of course, they, they can have a reverse bank heart lesions or they can have also in a Bennett lesions, especially in a throwing athletes or an associated with the tears of posterior labrum in symptomatic. MRI is very sensitive, uh, cannot be very sensitive. In a sensitivity, sensitivity and specificity is not great, but in some papers suggest it's good. Some patients, some papers suggest it's only a 44 to 100 percent of sensitivity and 66 to 95 percent uh, specificity. Kim lesions is uh, one of the MR orthogram can clearly uh, clearly detect the incomplete aversion or loss of contour of the posterior labrum or loss of lateral height and all uh, intact junction between the glenoid articular cartilage and posterior labrum can be detected more in the MR arthrogram. MRI is not very clear. When you come to the posterior instability, of course, the most often in acute lesion may not require any operative management. Most often that we can treat conservatively uh, unless the patient has got an unsuccessful but they may not, be, may not be unsuccessful in a very active patients. And if they do not respond to the conservative management, then you go for a uh, surgery. So if you can, the patient has got a soft tissue injury, you just do a soft tissue uh, repair if there is a, no bone loss. This is a 25 years old male patient, pain, presented with the pain on the four months. Usually the patient will come very late because they may not know that they have a posterior instability. Sudden jerk in shoulder while playing a shuttle four months before. This patient also had an injury again after uh, uh, three months uh, back before uh, after that injury. And usually the patient present with the pain in overhead activities. Usually they have, this patient also had a ovarian test positive. But if you see the, all the anterior uh, dislocation test will be negative for in these cases. And uh, apprehension speed test. Sorry about it. Can you move the slide? This is the problem. Okay, this one, this one can see this, this case. Both uh, application test was negative and speed test is negative. That is the Wolverine's test. I'm sorry about it. Again, you can see this patient has got a Wolverine's test positive. It's a very hulky man. Next slide. And you can see that uh, this is the arthroscopic view of that particular patient. You see that, uh, I go back, one slide. This is a problem, you don't have a laptop in your control. It's not playing the videos. Yeah, you can see that this patient also had a, most of the posterior, posterior instability cases can have an associated with the slap lesion. And uh, so these cases, we had to do the uh, posterior instability repair along with your slap repair. This is another medical student, the 24 years old, uh, presented with a deep shoulder pain. This patient had a, had a history of dislocation two months before when he was playing cricket. 
and uh, only a simple uh, single episode of posterior dislocation. This patient, we can see that the MRI shows clearly the reverse Brancard lesion and the reverse heel sacs lesion. And uh, that is the video. Can you play the video, please? Yeah, I can see that. This patient, you can see that that is a typical posterior labral lesion will not be like an anterior labral lesion like how Subramanian showed. You can see that just you can see the only the separation of the labrum from the uh, glenoid. So you can see that is a, uh, and also you can, this patient also has associated with uh, uh, biceps lesions, that is a slap tear. And um, these patients are required again posterior instability repair. So when you do a posterior instability repair, you require mostly your posterior lateral portal also required when you start from the uh, inferior portion. But when you come to the superior, you can manage some of the anchors with the play the videos, please. Uh, some of the, uh, most of the anchors can be managed from the posterior lateral portal and some, uh, when you come to both superior like a slap lesions and you require an antero superior uh, portal also. So most of the anchors from posterior inferior to the antero superior can, uh, can be managed with this kind of uh, two portals. Here as you say, see this in this video, you don't need to take a big uh, capsular, uh, a capsule for the bite, you just repair the labrum to the glenoid that is more than sufficient here. So take uh, two or three uh, stitches uh, uh, for the uh, labrum to be repaired. Uh, usually, if you start from the posterior inferior to the anterior superior, require at least three to four stitches to have the complete uh, posterior labral uh, repair. The only difference between the anterior and superior, uh, anterior and posterior uh, difference is that you don't require the your capsular ligamental uh, complex repair. You just repair the labrum is more than enough. So if you compare, uh, if you see the uh, studies that the arthroscopic capsule labral reconstruction is a very effective procedure in athletic populations with very good results. Sometimes they can have, you can have a global uh, tear like a 270 degree or a 360 degree labral tear. So sometimes when you see the MRI, it will show only the anterior labral tear. If you don't examine click carefully, these patients will have a, even the 20 degrees abduction, they'll have a dislocation. Whether you suspect bone loss or you should suspect this patient will have the uh, panlabral tear. So you should suspect this case of, in these cases, you should suspect uh, panlabral tear because the cost issue is going to be almost uh, twofold. So it is, uh, whenever you have this kind of uh, recurrent uh, dislocation with less degrees of abduction, there are two things, bony bank card. If you are ruling out the bony bank card in the CT scan, then you should suspect the a slab tear or 270 degree tear or a 360 degree tear. So you should counsel the patient that you may need a panlabral repair in these cases. What happens when there is a fracture? So some, most of the time you will be able to repair like an anterior bo bony bank card repair like uh, what they had shown before. You can he hear this case, you can see this patient not only have a fracture, can you play the video, please? You can see this is like almost like a bucket handle tear. You can see the whole posterior labrum is torn and retracted to the uh, posterior inferior uh, axillary fold. So this is not a very uh, common common scenario, but you can see that with uh, with the suture retriever, I'm pulling back to the original position. So it's like a bucket handle repair for, repair for your uh, meniscus. So you, you should not miss this kind of cases because these patients will not become all right unless you do the repair of this particular case. So here we did a uh, repair and uh, you can see the, can you play the video? Uh, so that is how it looks when the finally you cre create that posterior labral complex over there with that bony fragment. So that gives you a uh, good repair. In chronic cases, uh, unfortunately, I don't deal with many chronic cases, but when there is a bony deficiency, you can, uh, with the retroversion, you can do consider the open with osteotomy or a posterior bone block procedures. Or when you have in uh, chronic cases, we all of us know that there are different scenario you can have a present, you can have the presentations or you can do that this kind of case where I did a modified uh, the McLaughlin procedure where I take lesser tuberosity and put over your hill sacs, uh, reverse hill sacs lesion to prevent the recurrent instability. When you come to the multidirectional instability, as I said that most of the symptoms are almost like the same like what you can see in the posterior instability. Carefully, you should look for the shoulder asymmetry and the scapulothoracic rhythm. That is very important. This patient also can mimic like a multidirectional instability. So you have to rule out before you may deal with multidirectional instability with the scapular um, uh, dysfunctions. Of course, as I already said that uh, sulcus test and you have the hyperabduction Haggard test can indicate this patient can have a multidirectional instability. And of course, these patients will have, when come to coming to the range of movements, usually they'll have a internal rotation can be limited with the more excessive external rotation. And uh, 
uh, of course, gender, generalized ligament laxity is another clue that this patient has got a multidirectional instability. Most often, we deal with uh, these cases with the rehabilitation, and uh, very rarely these patients comes back with the failed uh, 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 rehabilitation. Then these patients can go for a surgery. When you come to the surgery, uh, you can do a just a capsular application where there is no bone issues like retroversion, uh, or you can do an open capsular shift. This is a case of 16-year-old female, national basketball player, uh, dominant hand, presented with the history of trauma one year be before while playing the basketball. And uh, she had an intensive physiotherapy for eight months, but no improvement, and presented with the repeated instability. Can, can you play the video, please? Uh, if you see the video here, that uh, the, especially the second video, even with uh, less than 20 degrees, you can see that cluck. So you can see that the second video again. So this patient had a lot of pain with uh, even slightest abduction without any actual rotation, they have an unstable shoulder. So because he's a player, so he wants to have uh, something to get treated uh, because conservative treatment failed. So in these cases, you can see the CT scan is normal. There is no bony pathology. So that is the MRI. MRI will mostly will give you some anterior labral lesion, but they cannot give us this multidirectional instability. But we suspect clinically we diagnose these cases in multidirectional instability. Play the video, please. You can see this case, you see the, all the labrum will be normal. So whenever you go in, sometimes you can, MRI can present as an anterior labral tear. If you don't do a clinical examination, this patient can have a multidirectional instability, car capsular laxity. So you can see the how joint is open. It's a very unstable joint here. Completely uh, 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 both postro uh, inferior and antro inferior is so wide open here. So here, what I do that play the play the play the video both the videos. So here you keep on repairing the uh, uh, entire postro uh, entire anterior posterior and antero superior because you want to just reduce the volume of the joint here. So you are not going to repair any capsular labral uh, construction like what you are doing for a posterior instability or an anterior instability. And uh, this is how you do the multiple anterior capsular refi. Play the video, please. Anterior and posterior capsular uh, uh, refi. It's OK. And uh, play, the, play the video. So this is the, <coughs> the what you are seeing on the left side is the, uh, this is the, uh, um, as soon as we entered the joint, we can see the, the next video is after repair. You see the joint was very wide open. What we are doing that is just you are, you are reducing the volume of the joint. So that will give you uh, a good stability of that particular joint. So this is the final repair of that particular patient. To conclude, of course, diagnosis is difficult and can be missed. And careful examination for inferior laxity and multidirectional instability is very important whenever you deal with the posterior instability. Labral repair and capsular uh, raffi are the treatment of choice when there's a unilateral or a sports person's related posterior instability. Of course, panlabral tear should be suspected and you should have always a differential diagnosis. Thank you very much. I don't know when I, I, whether I should talk this about us because already somebody told everybody is putting on a conference. But anyway, this is a 2024 in March for Ganga arthroscopic course, uh, more than 25 life surgeries, uh, knee and shoulder, ankle and wrist. Thank you very much. Thank you for the excellent talks. Uh, uh, Arumukam, sir, uh, just a small question for you. Uh, after the lethargy, have you ever faced with a non-union or a bony resorption? And is it more common with an arthroscopy and an open technique? Yeah, it can happen in both, but I have not seen in my series. But that's one complication you have to be aware of. Any, any procedure has its advantages and disadvantages. Uh, arthroscopy, I mean, lethargy is not a uh, simple procedure. That's why we are resisting from doing that. And uh, But uh, if you can do it properly, it's a good procedure, and we shouldn't shy away from doing that. And more common with iliac crest or a coracoid? Sorry? It is more common with an iliac crest graft or a coracoid process? I have not done many of iliac, iliac crest because, as I said, uh, I prefer uh, uh, the lethargy not only the bony, also as a conjoint and an axis sling effect. So that's an uh, advantage. Thank you, sir. I uh, thank the chairpersons for this uh, chairing the session. Thank you very much. We are actually running behind schedule, and uh, the European colleagues are waiting uh, for the presentation. So, uh, a very quick uh, inauguration. Um,
taxi at the at the outset i would like to uh, welcome all of you to this meeting um, it's a uh, when uh, this idea came up about uh, collaborating between just two states and getting uh, people from the uh, two states to interact with each other um, i thought it was a good initiative uh, to bring up new talent and also make this platform uh, available for uh, anyone who is actually has got something interesting to discuss and learn and uh, i'm uh, happy that it has turned out well and in fact uh, i'm uh, extremely thankful for uh, colleagues from uh, maharashtra who come all the way um, dr roshan um, you know amit sujit and shailesh dr ashish dr anand jadav i uh, thank all of you for cam- have having come all the way down here and of course we've got uh, star studded uh, national faculty in tamil nadu uh, we are blessed with uh, um, a lot of stalwarts here and i exp- I, uh, i take this opportunity to thank each one of you uh, for having made time and uh, come here and um, this uh, whole meeting i thought should be a learning opportunity for everyone so uh, we, uh, we we are very grateful for our uh, faculty who could join us virtually uh, the av team actually did a good job uh, nick's uh, session went very well uh, it was almost like uh, interacting with him live and uh, uh, thanks uh, nikhil and i also thank um, jean kenny who is going to join us shortly and uh, alex ladderman Uh, jean kenny i think lot of fellows uh, from here have traveled and visited uh, jean kenny he's a wonderful surgeon and alex ladderman actually designed the biceps uh, augmentation operation so i wanted him to come uh, live and explain us about this new kid in the block actually we uh, don't know much about it and we are not very keen about but there is a lot of literature coming out saying that it's a good uh, good op- good surgery again you know something which we need to watch out for so alex has uh, uh, gratefully ac- i mean uh, th- accepted his uh, accepted our invitation so i thank him as, as well and uh, thanks ironix team for organizing everything uh, it was it's, uh, it's, uh, it's great that we could do it and uh, i see a lot of crowd here and I, i thank all the delegates for having joined us today so i just now call upon uh, uh, dr armugam um, dr sundar rajan dr roshan dr roshan please come and uh, light the lamp and uh, formally inaugurate the proceedings like Thank you. 
on behalf of all the faculty uh, and the, all the i mean i thank uh, for everyone for lighting the lamp so we'll have a quick um, i thank all the faculty uh, for having taken time and uh, come here so we'll just like to honor them quickly with a memento i'd like to call upon dr arumugam sir and just receive the token of gratitude Next, uh, I would like to call upon Dr. Amit Mahajan, sir. Quick, quick, you can call the next person. Uh, next in line, uh, Dr. Anand Jadav. Dr. Ashish Arbut, sir. opportunity to welcome uh, Heath Matthews is a celebrity physiotherapist who has come all the way from Mumbai to teach us about shoulder rehab come on come on Roshan Wade, sir. Dr. Uh, Rahul Kort, sir. Dr. Rahul. Sundarajan sir, uh, to please rise. I'm pleased to call Dr. Sujit. Dr. Sujit sir. Dr. Shailesh Mishra, sir, to come forward. Uh, next is Dr. Subhair Khan, sir. Subhair Khan, sir. Sandil Valen, sir, please do come forward, sir. Mm -hmm. 
डॉक्टर सुब्रमण्यम सर डॉक्टर विजयराज डॉक्टर विजयराज नेक्स्ट आई वुड लाइक टू कॉल डॉक्टर आर मुगम सर टू फेलिस्टेट डॉक्टर कार्तिक सेल्वराज सर I'd like this. Uh, I'd like to take this occasion to uh, also acknowledge our fellows. Uh, we've had a fellowship program uh, in uh, knee and shoulder surgery, which we have. Uh, we, uh, so I would like to uh, uh, give the completion certificate to my fellows. Uh, I invite Dr. Uh, Dr. R. Mugam, Dr. Sundar Rajan. So just uh, we have four fellows who have finished our fellowship. It's a six-month fellowship. They have survived the fellowship, so I really have to thank them and also acknowledge them. Shreyas, Sagar. I wish all the best uh, to the fellows. Uh, they've done an extremely good job, and I wish uh, very best of luck for their future. So now we'll proceed with the academic uh, program. We'll go John Kenny's line. So I think we'll have to have the panel a little later. We'll finish off with uh, uh, Jean's talk and uh, Alex's talk, and then we'll come back to the panel. Is a Zoom link live? Is John? Okay. I invite Dr. Armogam, Dr. Roshan, and Dr. Shailesh to uh, chair the session, please. Jean. Yes, hello. Bonjour. Bonjour. <laughs> Good morning. Tu m'entends? Good morning, my friends. So, nice ceremony and thank you for your invitation. So, it's very nice to see you and to see my friend Alex Lederman. I'm with you. I was discussing with Philippe Colin. Thank, thanks a lot for, for the invitation. Nice to see both of you here. We've got uh, Dr. Arumugam and Dr. Shailesh uh, chairing the session. So, over to them. Uh, very good morning to all of you. And good morning. Uh, um, and we are waiting to hear from you. And uh, 
I, I request Dr. John Kenny to start to give his lecture. Okay, uh, let me share my screen. Uh, this one. Uh, do you see my screen, my presentation? Yeah, very well. Can you make in a presentation mode? Uh, wait a minute. Yeah. Uh, do you see this first slide? Do you see the second slide? Yes, very well. We can hear you okay. and see you very well. Please. Go. Okay, so, okay, thank you. So I will try to, to sum up uh, my thinking about the Boonyang mutation uh, when you have uh, a unit bond loss. Uh, so I have no conflict of interest regarding this presentation. Um, I think uh, you know Hegel was a French uh, German philosopher. We learn thanks to our mistakes, and I've done a lot of mistakes in my life, especially in case of instability. Uh, when you look at the story of uh, the technique of arthroscopic bankart from Morgan to the anchors today, you can see the right of failure uh, have decreased a lot uh, to uh, 11 percent uh, in the most recent publication. But remember one thing, the rate of recurrence with bone block is not more than 3 percent. So even with time and uh, with a good technique. Uh, uh, okay, uh, you, you have some failure. You, you can see here uh, the publication from 2004 to 2006 with a follow-up of uh, two to four years. And you can see the average of the uh, recurrence of after bank card repair is 9%. So it's a lot. And uh, a few years later, you can see all the papers with a follow-up of two to five years. And the rate of follow-up is not better. So even with time, even with the technique, even with the experience of the surgeons, the rate of failure after arthroscopic bank art is 12.5, is, is more than for the bone block. This is the work of a French shoulder society. We've made a multicentric study. And uh, we follow up the patient from four to eight years after the surgery. After the surgery, eight years after an arthroscopic bank art, the rate of recurrence is 25%. So that means with time, the rate of recurrence increases a lot. It's not 12%, it's 25% after eight years if you follow your patient. So to understand our failures, uh, Pascal Bolo helped a lot with the easy score. Of course, you know the easy score. And the easy score is done just to, to understand whether you can propose or not an autospeed bank card uh, when your patient is at your office. Uh, to sum up the easy score, if the easy score is more than six, you have a rate of 70 percent of failure um, if you make a, an isolated atroscopic bank card. And finally, you can propose an atroscopic bank card only if the easy score is less than three. But what is uh, easy score less than three? That means isolated rim lesion without any bone lesion after 20 years old with an automatic sport and very few patients are elective uh, in this uh, population. So how can we improve the result of a bank art procedure? Because we have a lot of failure. Of course, we could imagine the, the bank art plus remplissage and I've modified the technique of Eugen Wolf and I've called that the arthroscopic bipolar fixation the difference with uh, Eugene Wolf is my posterior amplissage is not to feel the defect, but to be more lateral, to prevent any injury of the teres minor, to prevent any uh, muscle injury posterior, and to, lead to, to, to prevent any uh, posterior retraction of the capsule or limitation of the rotation. So my posterior amplissage is not a, a real amplissage, but it's a posterior superior capsulotene disease plus uh, bank art, of course. Uh, this was my experience 15 years ago. Between 2009 and 2010, you can see uh, my uh, indication of open lethargy in blue clear and my bipolar fixation in uh, dark blue. And you can see I was very happy with my bipolar fixation at the very beginning, up to 80% of my indication were poorly uh, soft tissue procedure, in fact. 
But now look at the follow-up of my patients after one year, after two years, after four years. Uh, excuse me. Uh, we had, I had uh, more and more failed uh, with recurrences and even with a bipolar fixation. Finally, I was exactly like my colleague with isolated bank card fixation, and I have the same rate of failure. Uh, so now the question is why or when an atroscopic bank card plus or minus remplissage cannot stabilize correctly an unstable shoulder. Uh, probably because there are significant bone loss and there are significant soft tissue lesions that are probably underestimated uh, with our exam, preoperative exam. If you look at this publication of Shugaya, uh, you can see that you, you, you may have a glenoid fracture in more than 50% of cases and a glenoid attrition erosion in more than 40% of the cases. That means 90% of your patients are supposed to have a glenoid erosion. It's a lot. And look at this CT scan. At the very beginning of my experience, I just look at axial view. This is the same patient, exactly the same patient. And you can see that the uh, Gerber index is 54 persons. And um, in fact, if you make your own reconstruction, you can understand that probably in the past you understand, you uh, underestimated the glenoid bone loss. So remember in the easy score that if you have a, a glenoid bone loss, the rate of having a failure uh, of your uh, bank card is uh, 37 persons. So it's like a golf, a, a ball of a golf on the tee. If you have a lesion of your tee, the ball cannot be stabilized enough on your T. So you have to compensate, of course, and soft tissue isn't strong enough. In the same way, we have heel sacs lesions. So these are some publications that show that you may have, after uh, after recurrent dislocation, close to more than 90 persons of, uh, of uh, significant heel sacs. And if you have a significant heel sacs in the easy score, the rate of having uh, failure of your bank card is uh, 31 persons and look at if you if your ball in a golf uh, is flat it cannot be stabilized uh, with the T so you have to compensate uh, so to sum up this introduction uh, uh, look at this this T which is broken sugar have shown that we have 90 percent of uh, been with erosion and uh, other authors have described more than 90 persons of uh, hill sacs lesion. So that means for me, uh, not for me, but it's clear that uh, uh, less than 10 percent of the patient are eligible uh, for an arthroscopic bank card isolated. And uh, now with the glenoid tract, uh, we know very well uh, and we understand why uh, we, we, we may have some failure with a soft tissue procedure when you are off track, uh, when you have an off track lesion. So, uh, a last but not least point is, which is totally underestimated, is the agar lesion. Agar lesion have been described in 1942, it's not something new, but probably underestimated. If you follow the publication, which are not very numerous, you can see that it's not 2%, but maybe 10% of the patient have urinal avulsion. And you can see here, or oh, unfortunately my video doesn't work, okay. Um, <clears throat> This, this is a huge problem, and uh, uh, don't try to make a bank card, of course, but you have to repair the, the agar lesion, uh, but it's very demanding to repair an agar lesion, especially when it is uh, anterior. Oh. Okay, so... The question now is why a bone block uh, like the Latarge procedure can stabilize an unstable shoulder. So Latarge, of course, is a French surgeon. I have described his technique in 1954. And a few years later, with Pat, Daniel Pat, we've understood uh, why it works very well with a bone block, the sling effect, uh, armbok effect, and the ligamentous effect, capsular shift in addition. If you look at, uh, if you read with, uh, meta-analysis, you can see that the Latarge beats the bank card. The Latarge procedure can produce fewer recurrences, less than 
updated patient reported outcome, no more revision rate or complication, less than 3%, quicker recover and return to sport, less restrictive external rotation motion. Uh, this is my personal experience. I have three papers now. I just want to sum up my experience. These are uh, the operative time of my first, very first 300 cases. It is published now, and uh, after three, 30 to 50, you can attain the steady state operative efficiency. The operative time in this publication is 40 to 50 minutes for an atroscopic lethargy, and routinely it's 35 minutes. But of course, if you open, it could be quicker. And uh, routinely, when I opened 15 years ago, it was 25 minutes. But the problem is not only the time when you do the surgery. What about the positioning? This is also my publication. You can see in my very first period, only 50% of my bone block were, were well positioned. Now, more than 80 to 85 of my uh, bone block are correctly positioned, so it's not so bad. Uh, it's possible. And what about my complication? Out of my very first 103 patients, I had no vascular injury, only one transitory x-ray palsy, and only 2.8 revision because one infection, one, one mild positioning screw, and one uh, very bad uh, positioned uh, bone block, uh, as you can see here. Um, in case of significant gluing bone loss, more than 30 persons, some People say that the correct process could be too short, too small, and you need something else. I disagree with this concept because uh, uh, we have now the congruent arc lethargic corpus transfer described by Burkhardt and Jodeby. You just return the uh, 90 degrees of your of your of your bone block, and then you increase a lot uh, the surface of your reconstruction, and this creates. A round shape, uh, you can recreate the, the, uh, the technique, and I, uh, I, I have no time to show you here, but I, I do this uh, congruent arc procedure routinely uh, in arthroscopic procedure, and this is the publication uh, which show the very first uh, follow-up uh, of my patient. So, in this morning, there was a question, what about the hidden, hidden ibinet-like procedures? We, we have lots of publication now with German people, Italian, Greek guys, uh, American guys, who, who prefer to use the iliac crest bone or maybe something else. Uh, I disagree uh, somewhere with technique uh, because the lethargy is outperform the isolated bone block. Why you have lots of publications which show that the sling effect, the belt effect is much more efficient than the isolated bone block alone. And in addition, finally, when you take a, a bone block, it's very invasive. Uh, you have to use two different uh, patient positioning. It's longer and it's more invasive. You have a high risk of infection. It's less efficient because you have no amok effect and you have a higher risk theoretically higher risk of osteolysis because it's not vascularized. So you understand I don't like uh, the Eden Ibinet. For, to, to, to sum up my, uh, my uh, evolution, uh, out of around 1,000 surgical instabilities from 2009 to 2022, um, arthroscopic lethargy is the blue clear. Uh, Open lethargy is green, so you can see I've stopped the open lethargy in 2010 and I do X only uh, arthroscopic lethargy. And I've stopped, quite stopped the bipolar fixation. So out of my 1,000 last surgeries, now quite 95% are for, are for uh, arthroscopic lethargy. So finally, when you have no granulation, of course, I do the bancar, but I always do a bancar plus uh, posterior cutular tetonidis. Uh, but this is very rare, less than 10% of indication because most of the time you have granulation loss and now I do latarge, latarge, and latarge under arthroscopic technique. So thank you very much, my friend. Thank you, Dr. John Kenny. So uh, we'll go to the next talk by Dr. Alex Lederman.
डॉक्टर जैन यू कैन यू आर यू रेडी विद द नेक्स्ट टॉक कैन वी हैव अ नेक्स्ट टॉक फील्ड लेटार्जेट कॉज एंड मैनेजमेंट यस यस आई एम आई एम टोटली रेडी यस आई कैन शेयर द नेक्स्ट वन आई थिंक इट शुड बी दिस वन डू यू सी वेट अ मिनट हाउ कैन यू डू यू सी माय स्क्रीन नॉट येट uh wait a minute i try again okay uh oh, it doesn't work mm. oh do uh, do you see my yes, screen yes. now yes we can see it yes uh fail la tarje pause in management correct yes okay so uh this is is I think more a discussion and I will ask your point of view and the point of view of my friend Alex Lederman uh because um uh, because we need discussion for that. So of course if you read some papers you can see we have lots of complication with uh, open Bristol Latarge procedure this is uh, a meta analysis and I know this paper with more than about 2000 shoulders rate of complication 30% recurrence rate 8.7% yes of course but uh, we have other papers uh, the paper of Jill Walsh Mizuno the paper of the French society it's totally different the recurrence rate is only 3% and for the failure are related to either an incorrect patient selection maybe hyperlaxity is not a good indication when you have no bone loss it's not a good indication Probably the technical errors are the most important cause of failure with bone block malpositioning, uh, fracture of the process, neurologic palsy, and complication as infection or arthritis. We can see 23% after 20 years. Um, uh, I remember that my personal series is here with, uh, out of my very first 700 patients, very few complications. And I think it's really technical dependent um you can see here a big mistake uh, of course uh, you you can have problem with your hardware so uh, you can have in a open procedure you can have it in arthroscopic procedure it's not a problem if you just realize your mistake immediately or if you uh, realize your mistake on the x-ray after the surgery but of course this is a very big mistake this is a technical mistake of course uh so you you do you just have to change uh the, the problem uh this was an infection uh and uh, after one month my patient had sign of infection it was an arthroscopic uh, latarge you you just make a very uh, early debridement of your of your of your bone block you you can use antibiotics if you it's like a prosthesis if you do it in the very few days after your surgery or your infection you can see that the bone block is perfectly flush with antibiotic you don't have to remove everything but what is clear is you have to treat immediately your patient because you you cannot wait few months uh, because if you wait too 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 long time it's not a good time so sometimes you can see you have failed open latarge so it was a, it was an open latarge there was a failed latarge so in case in in the failure latarge finally when you have no bone loss you can make a revision by your bank art repair bank art plus remplissage you just remove the screw if if needed then you do a arthroscopic bank art procedure i don't say it's a bad thing and you can see how is the capsule which is sometimes not so bad so uh, of course if you have a glenoid bone loss I think you have to make uh, uh, a good look if it had been at me in that situation I realized I would re- just remove the screws there was no bone loss and I made a bipolar fixation so now I, I propose to discuss with uh, with Alex uh, with uh, this clinical case of my friend Pierre Mété from Clermont-Ferrand so uh, you can see this is a 19 years old man right and dominant he plays rugby in competition there are two brothers and a very good result after an arthroscopic bank art so one of the twin had been operative purpose before with a very good evolution with arthroscopic bank art so the second twin 
had uh, the same problem and there was four previous dislocation and the easy score was five out of ten so uh, Alex, do you want to? There is no trap here, Alex. J j just I want you to participate. What would you propose to this patient? Bank card, bank card, something else, Sean, uh, sure. thank you so much for including me in this discussion. Uh, I would clearly go for an Atarje for several reasons the number of redislocation, the, the age of the, of the patient, its activity. Uh, the only problem is that is of course the, the broader. Um, it's like when you have a patient on one side that has a reverse and there is a very good indication on the other side for an anatomic. And the patient is happy with the reverse. What do you do? Do you do an anatomic on the other side? Or do you say to yourself, okay, I'm going as well for reverse. Otherwise, by definition, the patient will be disabled. It's exactly the same problem. And for me, clearly, I will choose Latarge. Why? Because in my hands, this is the best result. And if the patient does not agree, I think he, he needs to find another surgeon because you don't operate because of your patient, you operate because of your believings and your experience and the pathology you are facing. So I will go for Latarge. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Alex. So, uh, Pierre Mété, my friend, have made an arthroscopic latarge, you can see the CT scan. Uh, so the bone block is flush, uh, there is a good contact. The three weeks, there was no technical problem. Unfortunately, after one month, there is a very bad and red scar. But uh, unfortunately, my friend Pierre did not make a revision uh, with a debridement, as I told you in just, just previously. So after six months, there was still pain on the shoulder. And uh, you can see there is uh, quite a total osteolysis of your bone block. So, Alex, uh, in such a situation, uh, what do you propose? Culture, blind antibiotic, debris mount? So, I, I, I let you the, the, the discussion. I give you the discussion. Yeah, thank you so much. So, uh, so, could you go back on the postoperative x ray? I think that there is an important thing. As you said perfectly, there is a contact between the, the graft. Uh, go, go back uh, on, with your slides. Yes, perfect. So there is a contact between the graft and the glenoid. However, if the, the, if the contact is on a minimal surface because the, the graft is not perfectly against the anterior part of the glenoid. And one of the reasons could be uh, screws that are a little bit divergent. And if your screws are divergent, are not perfectly parallel to the glenoid, you cannot have a good contact. And this is one of the prime. Second thing, the graft is, according to me, a little bit high. So this was for the, uh, the comment of the, the previous procedure. And then if you go back to your, uh, to your proposal, so I would uh, clearly revise this patient, uh, do an Adenibinet, open adenibinet with a good uh, cleaning of the joint, um, a new graft and antibiotics, at least until I have the result of the definitive culture, meaning that during the surgery, the patient does not receive uh, antibiotics. I, I take samples um, and then do a revision and I keep antibiotics until at least three weeks. If something grows, I treat it for three months. If nothing grows, I stop the antibiotics uh, after uh, after three weeks. This is this is oh. my. And I'm, I'm okay. not sure that you, you need to do two steps. You know, if it's a proper knee, okay. one step is fine. Okay, so in the one step, you remove the screws, you do a an ibinet and antibiotics. Uh, and right. It depends on the evolution. Okay. Correct. Right. Uh, so my friend Pierre. Uh, just decided to remove the screws arthroscopically to make a debridement and to use antibiotics, but not uh, a new stabilization of the shoulder. Uh, so in the follow-up, you're right, uh, Alex, it was a QT bacterium acne. He received antibiotic for three months and there was no recurrent of infection. But, but yes, unfortunately, he had a recurrence of the instability. 
So, uh, Alex, <laughs> I think I know your, your, your answer now. What do you propose uh, in case of new instability? Uh, uh, do you do something else or do you do now uh, a element procedure in the second step? I, think. I will do an uh, open uh, ad enabling procedure, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, so this is uh, what I've done, uh, what I've done, uh, Pierre Mette, but he made it by uh, by uh, arthroscopic procedure. But you're right, uh, Alex, uh, the bone block is much more better. The screws mm -hmm. are more parallel to the glenoid surface. The bone block is more distal. And uh, you're right, there was probably a technical problem in the very first one. And uh, another point of the, the, the design of the screw uh, was not very good in the first technique. And uh, the design of the screw had to change with time. So in the follow up, this patient had no recurrence of infection, no recurrence of instability, he plays really big game, so very good evolution. Uh, I, I think I have no time to show you the technique of arthroscopic lethargy, it's not the goal today, but uh, you know the technique, it's published and we can see also just in conclusion, in case of uh, complication after lethargy, uh, you may have an acute infection, don't wait. It's like every time in surgery, you have to make a debridement or either arthroscopic with antibiotics. And I agree, if it's acute, you can leave the screws. If it's a chronicle, you can make a one-stage procedure because you have to treat the problem, both the instability and the infection. In case of recurrence of instability, the problem is, is there any technical problem? Yes. Probably there is a technical problem, and sometimes you can make a revision with a Bankart Plus remplissage or Eden Ibinet if you have significant bone loss, exactly in this case. If you have a neuro palsy, this is a very big technical mistake. I didn't have this, this problem. But the arthroscopy can help you to identify the neurons, and uh, you know that it's very easy to see by arthroscopic procedure the neurons. You don't see the nerve when you open, and I think the arthroscopic procedure is more safe than the open one if you want to control the nerve. Finally, when you have arthritis after 20 years, uh, maybe there is a technical mistake because your bone block must to be flush and well positioned, but maybe after 20 years, the arthritis is not because of a bone block, but because of the story of the instability. Thank you, my friend. Tom, I have a question. Do you Yes. Well, when do you consider that it's flush? It's flush to the cartilage, or is it flush to um, to the bone? Uh, thank you for your question. Yeah, I know maybe there is a trap behind that because I know you very well. I think I will answer like a French with two different cases. Um, if you have a significant bone loss, Alex, I think maybe twenty percent. You have a gap on the glenoid valve. And I think in that situation, you have to recreate the glenoid vault and you have to be flush onto the cartilage. Yes, I confess in that. But of course, when you have a very small uh, bone defect, and we know Jill Walsh proposed lethargy every time, even when there is no glenoid bone loss, in that situation, you have to be flush. That, meant, that means you have to be very middleized, so flush to the bone, but not flush to the cartilage. So I would like to, to sum up in saying that it depends on the uh, the, the, the quantity of the bonus. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jankani, for the excellent lectures and uh, discussion. But I request you to stay back. Uh, we're going to have a more uh, discussion on your uh, topics. And I uh, invite Dr. Lederman to give his lectures. Uh, first is the new frontiers in uh, shoulder stabilization. Dr. Lederman, yes, we can see your presentation. Thank you so much. So. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to repeat what you already heard, and um, I just wanted to, to show you some studies that I am uh, finishing, because this is something new, and this is something that might interest um, um, the, the Indian people, because I, I think it's, it's new, yeah, it, this is something that, in fact, this is my baby, so I'm going to present you my baby. So if, you, if you think about the instability and uh, apprehension, the, the localization of the lesion can be uh, uh, at several places. It can be at the level of the joint, but also at the level of the periphery, capsule, muscle, nerves, but also at the level of the brain. And 
Um, the, the last level has been something that we, we studied quite extensively during the last 10 years. And I'm not going to, uh, to go through all the study, study that we publish about this topic, but I will try mainly to, to focus on the, the two last one with some, with some just a reminder of the, of the previous one. So the first study that we initiated in 2011, um, what about, uh, we, we, we thought that apprehension is consecutive to brain activation and cerebral remodeling, and that short instability to, could lead to cerebral reorganization. And if you have then, after a surgery or a, a dislocation apprehension, this is something that could persist even if we have, we obtain a, mechanic, uh, a mechanical stable joint. So therefore, in some cases, the sensation of apprehension could be linked to abnormal cerebral conditioning and not necessary to persisting instability. So we, we took um, 12 patients that had a traumatic unilateral instability, and all these patients had a functional MRI, and we also had a group control. And during the MRI, so, um, we, patients were looking at self-made uh, animation movies, um, so during the MRI, and some of the scene were putting the shoulder at risk of dislocation, and we also had control video with identical situation except for the lack of movement, which could induce apprehension. And of course, if it was a female, the movie was a, a, a movie with a female, and so on, and so on. And what we found and we published in 2013 is that the instability induced a functional reorganization of the brain, meaning that a simple peripheral orthopedic problem can lead to a complete reorganization of the brain. And I think that this is, this was for me uh, very interesting. So then we, we say to yourself, okay, if the patient has dislocation, he has some brain remodeling, maybe that if we operate this patient, this could help the brain to heal. So we, I operate all these patients, and then at one year, all these cohort redo a functional MRI. All these patients were doing well, they returned to sport and work activities. We didn't observe uh, any recurrences, and you will see it was quite high level patient. One of them had a persistent dislocation. This is one of the female that I operated, and this is another uh, patient that is part of the uh, Swiss key freestyle uh, team. So quite high level athletes. And interestingly, one year after the st stabilization, we observe a recovery that was, however, incomplete because some alteration remained. So why was why was it not complete? Because most of these patients, you know, they, they were doing well. So it could be a peripheral problem, meaning if it's not anymore, uh, we know that there is something in the brain, but why do we still observe lesion of the brain? It could be the muscle, the nerve, the, the capsule. So like a peripheral injury. And we know that there is neurological lesions in 40% after dislocation, and some of these lesions uh, involve sensory motor branches. So this could explain, you know, that the prime of uh, proprioception, there is lesion of the capsule that remain a little bit distended. There is lesion of the inferior glenoidal ligament, lesion of the subscapularis muscle, and all these structures help to control muscular action. So. There is still maybe after stabilization a problem of proprioception, and I just would like to show you this video that I really love. Uh, we operated this patient with Steve Burkhardt in 2011, and I think that with with this video we understand what is soft tissue lesion after a general dislocation because this patient doesn't have any more labrum, it doesn't have any more capsule. The thing that you see in front of the shoulder is the axillary nerve. This is the only structure remaining in front of the shoulder. There is no more subscap, nothing. So clearly the periphery is important. And this could, could also be a mechanical problem. So 
it's known that postoperative microinstability of the shoulder remain possible, uh, already published by Singer in 1995. However, it was a theoretical concept because he did not prove it. So what we did, we, take, we took 10 patients with a traumatic unilateral, unilateral um, instability, no hyperlexity, no previous surgery. And all these patients had a capture motion and with this type of capture motion, and this had been vali validated by several studies, we are, we are able to precisely analyze the anteroposterior translation of the humerus compared to the glenoid. So, and this, this is precise. So, I took patient that has one, uh, this unilateral dislocation. I operate them from bancard, open, arthroscopic latarge at that time. And then they redo an analysis one year later. And what we observe, so on the pathological side, before the surgery, there, there was an increased anteroposterior translation compared to the other side. And I operated these patients that were all doing well. And one year later, if the, even if the patient was, was doing well, if it was moving like this before, it was moving like this after. And this is important because it's, it means that stabilization, at least at that time, was able to control micro instability, uh, macro instability, but not the micro instability. Because subtle glomerular transition exists and persists even in asymptomatic patient, and this was statistically significant. So you just prevent dislocation, but you do not, you do not restore a perfect uh, glenomeral, glenomeral translation. So what are then the, the next steps? Shall we simply wait for uh, more time? So uh, I, I said that we, we did the functional MRI one year after the surgery. Maybe we need more than one year to heal. Or shall we change surgeries? Shall we reconstruct the glenoid concavity? And this was exactly the, the discussion with Jean Cani. Uh, shall, shall we put off uh, or graph flush to the bone or maybe flush to the cartilage, try to reconstruct this concavity? Or maybe shall we uh, do better reconstruction of the anterior capsule? So the group that has the, uh, more, uh, the functional MRI in 2011 redo a functional MRI 10 years later. And I think that the, uh, a very in interesting finding is that there was a significant in, uh, improvement between the preoperative phase and one year follow-up, but there is no difference between the one year follow-up and the 10 years follow-up. It means that the patient that we operate from a stabilization, after 10 years, they continue to have an excellent result. They do not improve, but they do not deteriorate. And I think that this is, this is the, the first important finding. And the second finding is at 10 years, we could not find any more brain lesion, meaning that this patient with time heals their brain. So you need more than one year to have to lose, you know, the, the apprehension that you, that you have after dislocation or even after stabilization. So the next question is, as 10 years is quite long, can you reduce this length of time? So I decided to redo the 2016 study that analyzed the anteroposterior translation, but this time with a better capsular reconstruction. So I took again 10 patients and I did again a bilateral uh, comparison. And be, uh, I did this because I trained with Gilles Valch and I remember perfectly, and it, this is also in the video, the, the, the famous video of Gilles Valch on ViewMedi. Gilles Valch was tightening his capsule in external rotation, abduction external rotation, and in this position, the human head is anteriorly subluxated. So Gilles Valch was tightening his capsule with the joint a little bit dislocated. So I said to myself that this is something that we, we could improve. And um, we developed and published a new technique of capsular reconstruction with the labrum that we reinsert between the joint, between the, the, the joint and the graft, first point. And the second point is, is this. When I, when I tight my capsule now, I put my arm in elevation, external rotation, uh, and then my 
resident you will see will push the human head posteriorly. So before I tight my capsule, my resident will tight this, he will push, he will do a posterior level push to reduce the shoulder. So today we reduce the shoulder before we, uh, reconstructing the anterior capsule. And I redo uh, an analysis one year later. And interestingly, and this is true for flexion, and for flexion, this is statistically significant, but also for abduction and rotation. The stability is more important after a compared to the contralateral sign. So this is why some of my patients say to me, to myself, after a latage, you know, sir, my shoulder is more stable than uh, the, the normal one. And this is a very important concept, I think. So take home message. Uh, a simple peripheral orthopedic program leads to consequent brain remodeling. Short instability induce really long-term neuroplastic alteration that persists after stabilization. However, you can obtain a brain healing, partial at one year, complete at 10 years, and the operated shoulder is more stable than the controlled shoulder one. So persistent instability, soft tissue injury, and brain sequelae may explain residual pain, persistent apprehension, impossibility to return to same level activity and we found it in 83 in 17 percent of the cases and also it could explain emergence of dislocation if you continue to have uh, um, two important anterior posterior translation so today i completely changed the way i reconstruct my capsule uh, i stopped to immobilize my patient and i think it's important to avoid a range of motion limitation but also to improve proprioception and the next step will be maybe to work on a uh, new protocol of rehabilitation the actual protocol of rehabilitation are based on stable shoulder so maybe we should move to protocol more based on proprioception reaffirmation kinesophobia treatment and so on and so on so thank you very much for your attention guys thank you dr Lederman, for our excellent and thought-provoking research and I request, there will be some more questions, uh, but uh, I request you to go ahead to the next lecture. Then we can have the discussion on all the topics. So, next topic, I need to share again, I'm sorry. I think this is this one. Yeah, it's dynamic anterior stabilization with the long head of the biceps. So, um, Jean, can you talk a little bit about uh, Boncart? Honestly, no. Isolated Boncart, no. Thank you so much. Not in my hand. And just read the, uh, the study from Kukkonen from the BGSM in 2022. I think it's clear that the recurrence rate is too important. What about the Latarge? Uh, I learned Latarge with the master, Gilles Valge. This is clearly the best French surgery of the world. Uh, we had very good results, low rate of recurrences, low rate of persistent apprehension, good long-term results. This is clearly the best bony procedure. Uh, it's more stable than a bone cart. So this is why I love this procedure because I really want something that is strong uh, because we don't need anatomy that failed previously. However, in my hands, the, this is not the best result in new hyponax female without significant bone loss. And for this kind of patient, I know that it's not the, the this is the, not the more frequent patient, but for these ones, I think that the latage in my hand at least is not the best uh, surgery. So there is something like a missing piece between the bone cart and the latage. Uh, for this patient, for example, that are hypernax, they have subcritical bone loss, but no heel sac lesion. So in this, Patient without heel succession, for me, it, not, it does not really make sense to do a remplissage. So what about these patients? So we, we try with Philip Connor to think different and then again, like Steve, Job, uh, Steve Jobs taught us. And we say to yourself, okay, we know that maybe that the size of the graft is not so important because when you do a Bristol, uh, the graft is small, but the C type of surgery is still efficient. And could you obtain similar result with maybe the conjunct transfer tendon? And this has been proposed by Teng. 
or maybe by uh, with the long kind of the biceps and this is what we proposed in 2017 so uh, we were the first one to publish a video in 2016 then we published simultaneously with Tong the technique in 2017 and at this moment we realized that a lot of surgeons actually were doing exactly the same uh, Oleg uh, from uh, Russian Oleg uh, Milenin they were surgeon from South, um, South America and so on. And when everybody is pushing in the same direction, or at least a lot of people, I think this is a, this is the good news. So what is the idea? This is a normal shoulder. This is what you do when you do a Bristol or Latage, you cut the concrete process and you just fix it on the anterior glenoid. And the idea is to take the long head of the biceps and to fix it through the uh, anterior glenoid. So this is, um, in all hands, indication are uh, anterior glenomerular instability with limited bonus, and I will explain you why we think that this 20% is the limit. Patient with unstable painful shoulder, um, instability in hyperlax patient, and of course the best indication is if you have a, an associated slap lesion. So this is a, a four minute video that will show you the, the technique. So we start with a posterior portal and we do a diagnostic arthroscopy. So you just confirm the anterior instability. This is the surgery performed during uh, the ANSI shoulder course. Then an anterior superlateral portal that needs to be parallel to the superior part of the subscapularis. So in this patient, we could not find any um, uh, cuff lesion. There was no haggle lesion, a small loose body that I, I removed later on. That's it. And when this is done, you just open quite widely the rotator interval and you will prepare the anterior glenoid and the anterior capsule. So my first step is to create a horizontal split in the capsule. Why? Because this will help me to pass then my graft into the joint. This, we, we, we develop an easy way to, to pass, to do this transfer. And the most important step is to do the transfer is this horizontal split of the capsule otherwise your biceps will never go into the joint so just open the capsule and create these small windows you see the muscle this is exactly what you want to see then you go in the front you pre you remove the clavideltopectoral pectoral uh, fascia so you need to see the conjunct tendon you need to see the upper part of the pec you need to see the anterior part of the subcapillaries. And when this is uh, done, you can just cut the long head of the biceps, put a suture around it or not, it doesn't really uh, matter in my hand. Then I will move to the anterolateral portal. I will debride the anterior glenoid, and I love to pass suture at this moment through my labrum, because this way I will manage my labrum and I will also, um, this will help me to repair the labrum at the end. So I just pass through the suture through my labrum and do a very gentle decortication. When this is done, you drill a hole in the, in the glenoid and you really need to be at the limit between the bone and the cartilage. So today I do not hesitate to rim some millimeters of the cartilage because I want to be uh, almost on the cartilage, not too medial. In, if I had some failure, it was because I was too medial. Then you move again anterior um, to the anterior joint, grab your bicep through the anterior portal, and then you prepare your biceps with a uh, fiber loop number two in a whip stitch configuration. And I love to prepare the two centimeters at four millimeters, and then at least one centimeter at six. This is the usual size of the biceps. Then I push this suture and the uh, biceps into the uh, in the front between the subscap and the conjunct tendon, and through my posterior portal with um, a bird beak, I will grab my suture and pull my biceps into the joint. At this moment, I do internal external rotation. This will create automatically the split in the capsule. So the biceps is going now into through the subscap into the joint. Through the rotator interval, I load the sweep block and I just fix, I push two centimeters of the biceps into the joint, otherwise you are not isometric, and fix it with a sweep block. Uh, this is the first. And then at the end, you just repair 
the, the capsule on the top. And I will show you if you do, do it in a caravan, at the, at the end, this is what you obtain. So the biceps is going from lateral to the subcap and is fixed on the anterior glenoid. So we, we, we proposed the inlay fixation. However, Anna and Clara proposed an onlay fixation. You can take the, the biceps and reconstruct the missing labrum like was doing a leg. You can drill from posterior and use an auto button like Pascal Boileau is doing for his latarge. This is the, the technique of uh, Anna and Clara. And I think that this is, this is also very interesting because it's more bone preserving. The subscap split the easy way when the biceps is into the joint, put some pressure, some pressure from posterior and you do your rotation and you will see that this will create. So this is something very easy. You don't need to see the nerve. You don't need to do a plexus release, nothing. You just pull your, your, your biceps, do your rotation and your split will be done. Uh, the split length is usually 20 minutes millimeters, so it's unlikely to limit external rotation. And the biceps is quite isometric, and this is why we didn't observe any crumbs or Popeye sign. And as I said at the end, you just do the, the bone cart repair. Post-op rehabilitation, I put a sling for 10 days just to protect the, the skin incision, they stretch the day after the surgery. I don't want them to do any sport with the upper arm. They can, uh, they can walk, they can do home trainer, but not more. No flexion of the elbow against resistance because, of course, you uh, you don't want them to contract too much the biceps, and I ask them not to carry. So this is the result after uh, seven days. This is the result after three weeks. And honestly, since I, I stopped to immobilize my patient for a long period of time, like one month, the, the, they have less and less uh, limitation in rotation, and the result are thus clearly uh, better. So this technique has some theoretical advantages. It provides hammock and sling effect that are important stabilizing factors. Uh, this eliminates the risk of nerve dissection. So this is consequently easier and safer than the uh, arthroscopic latarge. There is no traction on the cricoid process and the drilling is done in an inferior direction. So you go quite far away from the uh, suprascapular nerve and this reduces the risk of neurological damage. As there is no coracoid transfer, the surgery can be performed with only three small incisions. This avoids uh, also cortical resorption, and as you don't have screw or graft of ranging, it should probably reduce the probability of dislocation atropathy. There are, however, some drawbacks. First of all, the direction of the conjunct of the bicep that is not uh, as in a latarge going do down, up, and down. That is probably an important stabilizing uh, effect. Um, what about bi bi biomechanically? Is it relevant? I think yes, there are actually uh, at least four publications that has been published. This is our publication from 2019. We show that the, the DAS, if you don't have bone defect, is quite effective. You have less relative trans uh, anterior translation However, this does not reach uh, uh, significance. If you have 10% bone defect, then it leads to um, a, a significant decrease in anterior translation. But the problem is, if you have 20% of bone defect, then the effect is so strong that the human head remains posteriorly. The human head stay posterior, it does not reach the native starting position. So the translation of the human head stopped less anterior after a death. However, in large bone defect and application of a um, low, low strength, it does not even reach the native starting uh, position. Another interesting study show, showed recently that uh, the anterior translation is better with the latarge. This is the stronger configuration. And then the second one is the DAS plus the bone card. So it's more than nature. And this is, as I said previously, my goal. Result, uh, I had some stiffness at the beginning. And this was, this was probably because I was immobilizing my patient too much. I had recurrences. And three of them are part of our article. Uh, 
several problems. First thing, I probably bad indication with too much bone loss. Uh, too small sweep lug because I, I didn't manage well the sweep lug at the beginning. My hole was also too medium. This is why I am now really on, on the cartilage. And honestly, since I understood, the results are, are good. We published in December uh, 22 patients with more than two years follow-up. The raw score increased significantly and almost all patients improved their score beyond the uh, MCID. So in my practice, I do exceptionally isolated bone cut, maybe only for unstable painful shoulder. I do that in patients that do not practice contact sports with limited bone loss or il sac remplissage if I don't have any anterior bone loss and an important il sac lesion. And in case of doubt, and this is like uh, Jean, in my hands, still 95% of the case, I do an open lathargy. Um, just one thing, if you are interested in that, we have a community on BMED, go there. You can just register and we are always sharing cases, uh, answering answer. So this is something that could be interesting if you, uh, if you want to start. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ladderman, for a very nice uh, presentation and very interesting technique. And now, uh, is Dr. Jen Kenny also there? Uh, yes, I am uh, still oh, okay. here, my friend, yes. So any questions, uh, yeah, Dr. Sundar? Uh, Dr. Ladderman, it's excellent talks. Uh, Dr. Sundarajan from Coimbatore. My question is that now, what is your algorithm when you see all the instability patients, when you do a bank card, when you do a DOS, when you are doing your lethargy? So, if I have a patient that is uh, hyperlax, that don't have consequent bone loss, uh, don't have bone loss above 90%, that don't have um, ill sex lesion and do not practice contact sport, then I will think about the DAS. In all other situation, I'm fine, DAS plus Banca. In all other situation, I'm just doing an open latage. It's quite easy in my practice. Dr. Lederman, that was a wonderful talk on uh, dynamic anterior stabilization of uh, biceps tendon. Uh, do you think really there is no role uh, for intraarticular part of bicep tendon, especially in a young, a young group, which uh, you said uh, with less than 20% bone loss, and uh, such patients will have a very good stable shoulder only with the anterior sling effect of subscapularis and really the uh, long part of the bicep tendon, which is attached on the supraglenar tubercle, has uh, no role in shoulder stability. Um, this is a very good question. I think that if you discuss with uh, Simon from England, he will convince you that the, the biceps is, uh, is the key. Uh, the biceps has a role in stability for overhead uh, athletes, and this is why all my overhead, overhead athletes are treated with latage. So I respect the, uh, the, long, head, the long head of the biceps. For all other patients, and you know mainly the the young ladies, the young hyperlax ladies that I operate, I'm not sure that the biceps is the key in the shoulder. I have big doubts. Jen, if you have to operate same patient, 25-year-old uh, male uh, with little bit of hyperlaxity, less than 20% bone loss, will you offer him the dynamic anterior sling or you will go ahead with Lataji? Um... I have learned a lot with uh, Alex and Philippe Collin, I confess. When they made the very first presentation in Val d'Isère a few years ago, uh, I did not really believe in that. But I confess that in my latargy, after more than five or six hundred procedures, so there is no technical problem. But when you have no really bone loss, you will have a remodeling of your bone block. Uh, with osteolysis and impeachment with the screws again the subscap uh, and we know that with the pubic system of Giacomo uh, when there is no glenoid bone loss you will have an automatic osteolysis of your graft and in that situation I think the lethargy is a bad indication uh, I totally agree now with, uh, with Alex uh, in case of hyperlaxity without any bone loss on the both sides Hillsacks and Glenoid side, 
then I do the dance. And I have some some experience, a very modest experience of dance, so I cannot talk about my results. But I do the dance in such a situation. I don't. I stop the latarge when there is no great blood loss. Yes. Any more questions? So, this is Dr. Senthil, an ex excellent talk, a question to Dr. Ladman. Uh, it's regarding your uh, functional MRI study, uh, regarding the apprehension uh, that you actually you know, nicely demonstrated that there is a central brain element to it. But most of the subluxations that happen, happen at around like, you know, four years uh, or, you know, th that five years interval where there is probably stretching of the capsule. So uh, did you notice that obviously your uh, functional MRIs were at like one year and then subsequently at 10 years time and you showed nicely that they resolved. But these uh, probably, uh, will it, will there be a more of an effect if you actually look at them at around four years, five years time? Is there any, anything that you actually have noticed uh, at all, uh, Dr. Ladiman. That is one question. And the second question is regarding the DAS. Uh, the technique, Have do you think that the remplissage is out of oak? Because now that you can actually um, do it even for subcritical bone loss, then the track concept uh, goes out of the way because then you're able to stabilize even for subcritical bone losses, then the, then the remplissage may not have a role in, in that particular patient. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your, your two very interesting questions. Um, for me, it's difficult to answer you, your first question for several reasons. First first of all, on the whole cohort, only two patients had a bone cut at that time, meaning that most of these most of the patients had latarge. And if a latarge is stable at one year, it has been shown that it will probably be stable forever. So we, we, do, we do not or really observe uh, sublocation at four years, five years after a latarge. And this is why um, it's for me difficult to answer because I haven't done any MRI, uh, functional MRI at four years or five years. And I did latarge in most of the patient and none of these patients had redislocation. For, for the, the remplissage, I'm clearly not saying that the remplissage is dead, and I, I just published a study with uh, Patrick Donard showing that remplissage in some cases is doing absolutely well, at least in the short, uh, short term. Um, and this is something that I also regularly perform if I have no anterior bone loss, but the consequent hip sac lesions. So remplissage is clearly not dead in my hands, neither. Can I ask a question to Jean? Uh, Jean was a big proponent of bipolar repair where he wanted to bank art and remplissage. Now, now that in 2022, he hasn't performed any bipolar repair. So Jean has completely given up uh, remplissage, is it? No, uh, he, um, I, I, I still do remplissage in addition with latarge, for example, when there is an epileptic guy. Uh, in case of epileptic, when you have uh, significant bone loss on both sides, maybe latarge is not enough, or maybe you can help your latarge uh, with a remplissage. But uh, clearly, the bipolar fixation uh, for me is not a good technique. So I am afraid, and Alex will tell us in the next years, uh, I'm afraid maybe the death will be the same evolution because uh, at the very beginning I was very happy with the technique of bipolarification, but with time I had a lot of recurrences. And uh, I hope the, the death will not uh, follow the same evolution. But uh, I think I've done a lot of mistakes in my indication of bipolar fixation because I pushed the indication probably too far, uh, even in case of, uh, of uh, un underestimated bond loss. So I continue to do remplissage in latarge, but bipolar fixation is something quite finished, and I switch to the DAS in, uh, when there is no great bond loss and in a half an accident, yes. Just one more question. Uh, Dr. Laderman, this is Dr. Subramanian from Madurai. Uh, my question is about uh, after advent of this dynamic anterior stabilization the biceps, what is the cutoff for you for uh, doing a bony procedure now? What percentage of bone loss makes you to do bony procedure? Have you 20%. changed? Twenty percent. 
20 percent. 20 percent. Yeah, because we showed that above 20 percent, uh, the effect of the dust is so strong that the the human head remained posterior, and I'm not sure that this is something that is good in the long term. So this is my cutoff. Thank you very much, uh, Jean and uh, Alex, for joining us. I uh, visited Jean in 2015, and uh, subsequently, Jean Kenny actually came to India to Coimbatore, uh, and he performed live surgery here. Uh, thanks very much for invi uh, for accepting the invitation. And I also visited Alex Laderman in uh, 2015 as part of the ESCA fellowship uh, team, and uh, I was uh, just enthralled with his ideas and his uh, surgical skills. And uh, Jean performs over 1,000 shoulder surgeries a year, I think. Uh, and uh, same with Alex. So they are real high volume shoulder surgeons and uh, they are, um, you know, thought uh, leaders in the field of shoulder surgery. Uh, we are really grateful to have both of you here uh, for our session. We learned a lot. Thank you very much, Jean and Alex. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Ciao, ciao. Salut, Alex. Bye bye. Salut, Jean. Thanks, uh, Dr. Armo and Dr. Shailesh, for uh, chairing the session. I think uh, we'll continue with the panel discussion. Uh, and uh, lunch also will be served side by side. So people can grab a plate and come in. Uh, because we, we will run sh uh, short of time if we don't, uh, if we break completely. So we can have a working lunch. We'll continue with the panel. to play yeah so this to go uh, this to go back yeah so this to go forward yeah. you keep pressing and if there's a video you press it again the video will play ah, okay fine
interesting panel discussion here. <coughs> so, this is the patient, this is the first case. It's a 24 year old uh, male, shoulder giving way more than 10 times in 2 years, self reduced every time. MRI shows a bank heart lesion and a small hill sack lesion. It is on track and uh, ER with examination uh, elbow on table is 95 degrees, capsular laxity is there, Beighton is 6 by 9, there is no bone loss on 3D CT. So, since morning we have heard a, a lot about each and every one's view, uh, perspective on shoulder instability. People have been discussing uh, about uh, how they would treat each and every condition. I think at the end of the day, everyone, uh, each surgeon individualizes the treatment for a particular patient rather than go by a general protocol. The amount of bone loss, the um, physical activity of the patient, the age of the patient, everything matters. It's not the not just a cutoff line with the amount of bone loss. So, Dr. Roshan, what do you think about this patient here? Question will go to someone else, but uh, uh, he's a 24-year-old male, no sports, right? Not a sportsman. Not not a sportsman. We bite six to nine, and uh, there is no bone loss. Probably it's a capsular laxity. Uh, I like to do examination under anesthesia. Okay. About the amount of laxity, and I like to see the MRI. Where exactly is there any anterior? Uh, bony lesions or posterior bony lesions? No bony lesion. No bony lesions. Uh, soft tissue lesions? There is a bank heart lesion. Th there is a bank heart. Bank heart lesion, small heel sac. It is on track. So, for me, it will be a bank heart repair as well as capsular labroplasty. So, I am going to tighten the anterior redundant capsule as well as inferior redundant capsule. So, I will take the bite through the capsule, then go through the labrum. So, I will be creating a 270 degree lesion. Uh, along with uh, all, ac all across glenoid, just the superior part of the glenoid where there is a bicep and uh, superior labrum, I will not release that rest. All other capsule, I will release it, retighten it and re reattach it to the glenoid. So, okay, now we have got a, uh, uh, exactly right. I think uh, I will come to others also. So, uh, this is a young patient, unidirectional traumatic instability with shoulder capsular laxity and generalized hyperlaxity. He is not a patient with Euler Donlaw syndrome or something like that. He's just a patient who has hyperlaxity. <coughs> now, I want a show of hands uh, from the audience. How many of you test for laxity for the patient, for a shoulder instability patient when you treat? So, everyone tests it. And uh, what do you use? You all use Baiten score? Baiten score. So, Baiten score tells us the shoulder, uh, the generalized hyperlaxity. So, for caps uh, shoulder capsular laxity, the test which was prescribed in the IC score is shoulder exonotation. Okay, so exonotation of the shoulder in adduction. In adduction, if the shoulder exonotation is more than 85, it was called um, shoulder laxity. Uh, it's a lax shoulder. So IC score, one point is added. Do you have a different way of assessing shoulder laxity, sir? Sujit? Same way. Same thing. Shailesh, finally, finally well, sir. Only intra-articular, uh, we can see how much the capsule is stretched. Otherwise, it's very difficult to uh, see it uh, by clinical examination. It's very difficult. To you know, <coughs> especially when you have this kind of uh, bank heart lesion along with the bite high Biton score. In such patients, you might get the anterior drawer which is positive clinically in shoulder examination. So, that can give you a fair idea. And examination under NSSA will add to your more uh, knowledge because the moment you see more anterior <coughs> instability instead of the posterior instability. That means it's related to bank cut, but the shoulder laxity because of the uh, the gross movement of the humeral head onto the glenoid, you can easily translate that. So translation of the humeral head onto the glenoid can be easily judged. So you uh, you would always examine the patient yeah, under yeah, anesthetic. Always, always, always. So the when importance of examining the patient under anesthetic cannot be over yes, yes. You have to examine the patient. You look for anterior, posterior, and also yeah. inferior. You also look for a sulcus sign, sulcus if the sign. sulcus sign is sulcus positive. Sulcus sign is actually, you can do it in awake patient also, that's very possible. But uh, the gross anterior instability may not be, a, you know, patients will hold on. Yeah. Their muscles will contract and those situations, patients will not allow you to do anterior apprehension or the anterior draw trace on the humeral head. So again, for those who have, those who have come late, young patient, unidirectional stability, 
with shoulder capsular laxity and hyperlaxity, what are the options? Show of hands, bank card alone? Anybody would do only bank card? I think after the French and the Americans spoke, nobody is going to do only bank card for anybody. For this patient? For this patient. Uh, I said capsular labroplasty. That yeah, you know, it's coming, it's coming, card. it's coming. Where is that? Anybody would do bank card and drum plissage? You would do bank card and trump massage two, three. So I can see about four, five people doing bank card trump massage. Okay, Sandil sir, why why do you want to do bank card and trump massage? See, uh, although there is because there is this capsular laxity again is very very subjective. <coughs> so although it is, uh, we actually see it in an awake patient and uh, what degree of capsular laxity? See whether basically because patient has got a high bite in hmm. and a increased dexa notation. That's yeah. the only thing. So. My point is that in the bank cut repair itself I'll actually you know do the capsular shift along with the remplissage because we feel uh, we've done a series now so we feel that you know there is no bone bone defect for yes, it is still an on track lesion you know it is an on got a small heel sack he's got a small heel sack it is an on track heel sack yeah. heel sack we've uh, done a series sack, which yes. shows that even in on track lesion if you do a remplissage they are not having any problems we are to just we are going to publish it in two years. And so in my viewpoint, this patient would have a capsular shift along with bank cut plus remplissage. Okay. Uh, do we have a CT scan of this patient? No. This the CT scan finding is this. No bone loss. No, no. Picture, Small picture. No. CT scan picture. No. Small hill sack on track lesion. So very common. It's a very, very common picture we see. The only thing which we might miss is the laxity. So I'm um, I'm just going to come to that. So Dr. Roshan has told that he would do bank art with Posterior tightening, he would do a 270, 180 degree sort of a repair. Finally, sir. Now, uh, I think I will go with uh, what Sendil said. Uh, bank card with replissage. Again, you can do an interval closure or you can you can include the middle glenohumeral ligament along with the plication. So, that will reduce the size of the uh, capsular stretch. And uh, <coughs> there is nothing harm in doing a replissage uh, in this case, this case, uh, replissage in these cases. Okay. Uh, that is so, bank card remplissage is a better option. Silesh? Yeah, I will also add a remplissage in this and the uh, inferior capsular shift. Okay. Going with sir only. Uh, 270 so, you want to do the capsular tightening on the glenoid, glenoid side. side? Okay, all right. Anyone for uh, rotate interval closure? Rotate interval closure is basically a suture between supra and subscap. You put a suture from the supra and subscap and completely close the rotate interval. Anybody wants to do it? Anybody routinely do, does it? Dr. Subra does it. I also combine if suppose if you feel that uh, the the reduction in the capsule size is not sufficient. Adequate. You then you add on. Uh, you would add a you would add a suture. Yeah. So I think these are all interop decisions. You know. Yeah. If yeah. If, yeah. if if I can get a very good bank card lesion, very good capsule, very good subscap. Not necessary. You don't need anything. And okay. in fact, uh, small hill sacks. So, you, uh, the, there is an option, subscap augmentation. You showed one of your slides. Yeah, uh, I do subscap, uh, subscap augmentation, especially in hyperlax patient. Because I feel if your amplissage is going to work, similarly, your subscap augmentation will work. Okay. Uh, so, I these are the I options, actually. I actually, this scenario, I do a bank card, capsular tightening also, where you take capsule far away from the labral yeah. attachment and rotate interval closure and also subscap also. Okay, so so this actually tightens anteriorly quite comfortably okay. because so you are saying Baiten score is almost eight or nine out of six 10. by nine. Yeah, he's six quite lax. Six by nine. Yeah. When he's quite lax. When you are taking this capsule, you have to be very careful that you should not injure the axillary nerve. That's one problem that happens. I have seen some cases where they have tightened too much, took a very big bite. So uh, a simple tip you is you hold it with your uh, you know. The grasper or yeah. some instrument yeah. and you lift the capsule yes, exactly. and then with the other hand you go you along take a bite. bite that's a that's so a trick of it. So that's an important tip when you you will include the axle nerve axle. also in your stitch uh, so that's the one thing you need to but you know the axillary nerve like what somebody showed is not that close you know that was scary of course i think that was <laughs> you were showing the axillary nerve uh, just uh, just next to the glenoid yeah. we have never seen axillary nerve that close to the glenoid yeah. It is a little bit away. It's not very, very and There close. it was completely absent. Yeah. Labrum, subscap, everything was absent. So, uh, routinely, uh, the way uh, uh, the uh, external rotation was tested was like this patient standing. And when the patient is standing in adduction, you check for external rotation. It's about 85 degrees was accepted as lax. But uh, uh, recently, I mean, it has been published a few years ago and this has been accepted. Uh, Thomas et al. have published, you make the patient lie with elbow on the table, it's called EOT or elbow on the table method, 
and then you look for x notation and uh, in that position if the x notation is more than 90 then the patient is considered to have shoulder laxity. So, in case of shoulder laxity this is a very recent uh, uh, recent editorial by uh, uh, Matt Provencher in arthroscopy journal. So, hyperlaxity is a common factor for failed arthroscopy bank cut repair. So, you just so the the moral of this case was actually to say that bank cut repair alone might not be sufficient in, in a case where you have hyperlaxity. So, so, hyperlaxity is something you have to always consider when you are actually treating a um, patient with bank cut repair. So, various methods have been uh, described uh, right from uh, this is rotate interval closure as I told you. This is coming up. People are actually reconstructing the coracohumeral ligament with a semi T graft. This is this is so uh, these are patients who have uh, extreme laxity. Uh, these are not uh, collagen disorder patients, they are normal patients with laxity and uh, um, Matt Provencher's group and uh, actually uh, Buddy Sawa's group is working on actually reconstructing how does, the… How does corocohumeral <laughs> So, corocohumeral ligament basically forms the rotator which interval. Which is acting above the supraterritorial no, 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 level. This area, this content of this rotator interval is corocohumeral ligament. So, by closing the rotator interval actually you are tightening the corocohumeral ligament. Many patients with shoulder laxity actually have a deficient CHL yeah, no. and a deficient MGHL. By reconstructing that ligament, are you going to add the stability? Because you so add stability add is you mainly add inferior. Uh, you add inferior stability. Basically, you pull the shoulder up. So, that is what they are claiming. This is subscap augmentation as uh, uh, this is again uh, Buddy Sawa's procedure. And this is another procedure which is described by uh, Pascal Bolo. This is uh, um, the arthroscopic trilla, tria, it is called tria procedure where they actually create a pseudo arthrosis here. They break the um, coracoid and they, they put an anchor here and then they, they actually pull it towards the glenoid. Again this is popularized by the French, uh, this is again, again non-anatomical, there is high chance of subcoracoid impingement. So, these are procedures in vogue along with bank heart surgery for patients with hyperlaxity. So, this case, uh, so in our, this is the protocol which we follow and uh, in our in our group if there is hyperlaxity we do bank heart with remplissage. So, I did a bank heart remplissage in these patients and this is a patient, patient act, the remplissage actually healed quite well after a year and he regained all the movement and the patient is uh, not having any apprehension now. So, the moral of the story basically is uh, you have to assess hyperlaxity that is the most important thing. It is a cause of long term failure. We have been talking all day today about the capsule stretching over time and if you do not address it during your uh, initial surgery definitely patient is have going to have micro instability like how Alex showed and uh, it might lead to a problem. So, bank art alone might not be sufficient in these cases. You might have to do something extra. You can either tighten the capsule on the glenoid side that, that is by putting extra anchors at the back or uh, plication or you can do it on the humeral side by doing a rumplissage. Rumplissage basically capsulitis is on the humeral side, posterior capsulitis is on the humeral side. So, bank art plus some procedure is needed and uh, Lataja is a good option, but the problem with Lataja is the bone is the glenoid is normal. So, even, even the French are now trying uh, starting to discontinue Lataja in normal glenoids. They were aggressively advocating uh, Lataja for normal glenoids, but now they are saying they are seeing a lot of lysis the screw is irritating, the uh, it is eroding the subscap and all that. So, uh, Lataja is an option, but maybe not in this case. CHL reconstructs, I think we will get more papers like DAS, we will have some new surgery. Every year there will be some new surgery. So, this is the idea of this case was to emphasize on the importance of looking for laxity. So, next case, 24 year old male badminton player, left hand dominant, frequent dislocation right shoulder since 4 years, has more than 50 dislocations, recently even on hard sneeze, self reduced all the time. That is his x-ray, you can see a small uh, small bony bank cut there, that is his CT. So, uh, he has got about 12 percent uh, bone loss, okay. The, you can you can draw a straight line here. So, uh, Nikhil Verma was saying if, the, if you can draw a straight line that means it is more than 13 percent. So, so it is about 12 to 13 percent of glenoid bone loss, you can see a bank cut lesion. So, here we got a patient. Young patient, multiple episodes, 12 to 13 percent subcritical glenoid bone loss. We have been talking about this all day today again and it is an on-track hill sack. So, uh, let us go to the panel, Dr. Pandey sir. So, yes, this is a little bit straightforward uh, case of, uh, as you said, uh, I endorse with uh, Nichols uh, straight line anterior border of glenoid. I would always prefer a bony procedure and lethargy would be the ideal procedure for this patient. Okay. Whatever it is. 
it doesn't matter a uh, young patient and uh, you have a severe bone loss he may be doing a lot of physical activity because of ch so it's always better nothing wrong going for a bony procedure the dominance doesn't matter now shailesh so in this case considering this is non dominant hand so i would uh, in uh, this is the first procedure i would like to give soft tissue chance of soft tissue reconstruction anterior plus posterior and few capsules same uh, anterior labral repair with the capsular shift and depo le drum plissage add on to that so you want to do bank cut and drum plissage okay <laughs> would i have been a uh, dominant hand then uh, latagette would be my preferred choice okay what is your uh, prefer latage do latage because multiple locations even on sneezing uh, it's going yeah. so there is more of a uh, bony restriction also is required which okay. will prevent uh, further dislocation okay <laughs> by, by sneezing if your shoulder started coming out and uh, then soft tissue is not going to work that shoulder demanding more you know the dil mange more you have to give them the dil and dil of the shoulder is lethargic so you want to do lethargic this again. patient absolutely lethargic any surgery is bound to fail So th this 50 is the time dislocated, you know, 50 time, 24 year old male. So again, you again uh, in this patient, <coughs> if you see, there is not a big glenoid bone uh, bone defect. That's okay. See, there that is not th only th only glenoid bone loss is known to decide the instability. Yeah. No, no, no. It let is me, the capsule, labrum, other structures. So everything is stretched out. The capsule and labrum is probably deficient or probably yeah. not not there. enough. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you want to substitute that soft tissue deficiency with the bony procedure. Yeah, bony procedure. Not okay. only that. Yeah. Now, uh, sometimes what you see in MRI, yeah. if you go inside and see, there will be still more higher bone loss. Damage. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So what you see in MRI is 20 percent will be 25 percent. Okay. This is my personal experience. Okay. So, so <laughs> that's why they they have switched to 15 percent now. Yeah. Subra sir, what would you do? Uh, I think uh, <coughs> there is a fallacy in measurement. <coughs> okay. This one. Uh, I feel hard to believe it's only 12 percent. Okay. It looks more than 12 percent. Okay. And moreover, the, all this PICO method or surface area method is in the center of the cir circle. But in fact, in below the center of circle, the anterior inferior part, there is some bone loss. Yeah. That actually, if it is equal to more than 12 percent, it won't be 12 percent. So in that kind of scenario, this is best is to go for a bony procedure only. That's okay. what yeah, I would do. And go. even if it is 12 percent, I'll go because 50 time dislocated shoulder. Yes. You can't get that. Uh, cross capsular laxity okay. only with bank card repair uh, if you can just put the mri picture yeah this coronal view of yeah. the humeral head shows yeah. the hill sac extending more medially there yeah so the width of the hill sac <coughs> itself is uh, quite big huge yeah so that yeah. explains okay so hill sac looks quite big uh, hill sac index is, will be definitely more than the track yeah. yeah so both of you want to change your plan now i have a doubt that is on track this, this is this is on track see hey, basically but i have this might not be the this might not be the representative uh, uh, this might not be the representative image but uh, he he has an on track lesion and his glenoid not bone loss is minimal so take my word for that <laughs> can i add one shreyas uh, I, i i invite shreyas to present the rest of the case come see i think a uh, cons uh, on track and off track is very difficult to replicate in clinical practice Uh, my when my radiologist say that this is off track lesion i have to really study to find out really it's off track or even on track i think the measurements see here the clinical history itself is suggestive that there is something wrong in his shoulder apart from the usual labral tear the gross bony instability anterior bony instability so posterior hill sac lesion it comes to the lesion. question of how we do the latage if we do the classic european latage we actually excise the capsule we throw the capsule away So in this patient, there is a subcritical bone <coughs> loss, but the, the capsule also needs to be repaired. Yeah. So uh, that is the thing. So we'll go ahead and show you what we did. Yes. Before <coughs> we before you go, I mean the point here is uh, even uh, one one is about the bone loss. Second is for any soft tissue procedure to work. I mean at least repair you need tissue. I mean the MRI doesn't really quantify the amount of capsular labral tissue that can be actually seen intraoperatively. so that would actually be a significant point although we talk about bone loss 50 times dislocation as uh, you know he, dr roshan has already mentioned you may not have the quality of the tissue we talk about dose dependent so he every time he is actually done he stretched out so much so he, whatever amount of soft tissue procedure will not be enough to quant you know give him a best possible totally agree result. i think uh, 
five years or ten years before, if we had presented this case, everybody, everybody would have said bank art. But now the the view of the house is changing. Everybody is talking about bony augment. That is because we are traveling to Coimbatore every time <laughs> to learn. You know, in spite of a subcritical <laughs> bone loss, we are talking about bone augmentation, which is a great thing. We so that's a shift of thought. Every in our time we come to Ganges, so South we'll South Ganges, we are enlightened. And knowledge bank increases. Bank cards will be successful yeah. for maybe one or two years. Yeah. He's, it's bound to Absolutely. fail in this case. Absolutely true. So that's uh, the main thing. So we uh, went ahead with the arthroscopic spine of scapular uh, bone grafting for this uh, patient. So around four to five centimeters from the medial border, uh, we took the tricortical uh, spine of scapula graft. And uh, this was the initial view. We could see a uh, Spine deficient. of scapula? Spine of scapula. You have not done lethargy? No. Come on. Huh? He, he has visited Pune. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, soft tissues and the capsule has been elevated from the anterior uh, inferior uh, glenoid side. So the anchors has been placed uh, and tied at a later uh, completion of the uh, procedure of uh, grafting. Why not Lataji? What, what was your thought process? So the uh, jig was uh, placed, and uh, from posterior to anterior, there was a, a drilling made. So here is a, a drill guide which is placed, uh, which is around 10 millimeter apart. And uh, so the cannulated drill bit, uh, the proline wire is passed. And the uh, proline is uh, uh, withdrawn, and uh, later the fiber wires are passed. The scapula, spine of the scapula, is harvested, and uh, two drill holes, similar drill holes, 10 millimeter apart, is made on that, and the fiber wire is passed through it. Next, okay. So this is the pulling of the graft. So once the graft has been in place, and uh, this is the position of the graft. So it's abutting the anterior inferior glenoid region. So next, uh, the capsular labral repair was done after placing the uh, suture anchors. And the final view of uh, after completion of the repair looks like this. Do you add replace such? Yeah. yeah, yeah, later. Wait. So this is 18 months uh, follow-up of the same patient. His, uh, he was a left-hand dominant, but operated on the, uh, he had dislocation on the right side. The patient is quite comfortable, no complaints of pain, and uh, no apprehension also. Wonderful. No one should challenge success. I am. We are not here to challenge success. But uh, I will prefer no, the me, uh, technique yeah. which I've been taught or I've been doing for years and which has given a wonderful result for years. So uh, kudos to you. You have done a wonderful job. No, no. My but my reasoning but behind But panel would have done a different job. <laughs> no, no. I I I know everyone. Uh, after all the discussions today. For uh, every single patient situation, we all have different options. So we have different options, and uh, each one has a rationale. Like you can see Alex Ladderman doing a different operation for the same patient when compared to uh, uh, you know Jean Kenny. So the thing is, uh, my re reasoning here was uh, for patients with hyperlaxity, any pa this patient definitely has a lax shoulder. The capsule is deficient, or the capsule is not uh, enough in the sense the capsule uh, has to be tightened as well. So if you have to tighten the capsule, then you have to do some soft tissue procedure along with the bro bony procedure. The bone loss was not more than 20%. So he did not need a latage as such. When you do a latage, if you are doing a latage, then you have to do a procedure which is like Pascal Bowler does, where you have to exteriorize the graft and do a tightening inferior capsular shift also. So that's what uh, my rationale was. So I could do it oscopically. I could actually place the graft and also do the inferior capsular shift, tighten the capsule, and also do a rumplissage, all that uh, oscopically, and came out well. So what I, the, again, the take home here is, uh, um, see, this is another option of uh, bone graft available for us. 
the take home here is subcritical bone loss in a young patient it's a high risk patient just go uh, just don't do bank out alone that's the that's the ba basic thing so if you if you, you can probably do a rumplesage in this case and get away or as uh, as shailesh i think that is an option as well But or if you can add a small bone graft that's only 12 13% bone loss so if you can add a bone graft it is actually like a, again as like a insurance so th the icbg or the scapular spine can be done arthroscopically without splitting the subscap this is almost like doing a latajet but we are using a different bone graft and then we are adding bank art and rumplesage as well so this an additional bank art and capsular shift is a must in this case that's i know it's a insurance but you took a very small insurance you should <laughs> take a bigger insurance no actually actually it it, it is about uh, it it covers up to 15 mm or 16 mm of the of course uh, kathi but we need to uh, study this patient for the next 5 years yeah, yeah, to make yeah. sure at least 10 patients to make sure this this uh, technique this is technique has been described one and technique uh, but uh, see like uh, it's different from uh, the european study from our study and yeah. our patient's behavior and everything is different definitely definitely so no, this is i'm just one more option we have for uh, yeah this is just one more option. one more uh, one more tool in our armamentarium yeah, that is what i am trying to say oh, so uh, i just now call sujit to present his case what was the size of the uh, bone graft you took and was there a healing later did we check that later healing of the graft to the glenoid do we you have any this patient this video was sent okay. from bangalore that guy is in bangalore he is not coming only he is per perfectly all right so if he comes back we'll get a ct and then we'll uh, look into that what was the size of the graft you took size of the graft is actually it's smaller than uh, the coracoid but it is adequate size it's about 15 mm like like we take some of the bone so yes. if it is 30% then we say go to icbg then uh, if it is less 15% 13 to 15% we can use capsular spine very safely that's that's my so it'll be half of the size of coracoid yeah so, so. so we can't put screws no let's say no 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 it is small i you can put 2.4 mm screws you use a sheath or you No, it is passed through the rotatory interval. Yeah. But no sheath, nothing. Uh, Karthik, uh, nothing against this uh, procedure and fixation. I feel the most important effect in latage surgery, as uh, since morning, is the uh, uh, sling, sling effect, effect of sling the effect. subscap. Yeah. I think that will keep lacking, you know. Yeah. Especially now, I don't know what kind of Sir, contact uh, athlete he is, but yeah. the, especially the people who are involved in mixed martial art. He's not boxing, an athlete. He's just a software guy. All those players who require day-to-day -day contact and a uh, very forceful contact, they need a very good stable sling effect. So probably for those kind of patients, uh, you have we, we to. Come, we are coming to uh, that. Latarje. We come for I think for for information for everyone, I think I started doing latarje in in great numbers uh, down uh, down in south, and uh, I think people actually started. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Hating me for that because uh, my. my proportion of latage was almost 40% for instability patients we have done more than 200 250 latages and we published it in ij also so i am all for latage but this is me doing something different other than i would have done latage in this case eyes closed but this is something different so in a subcritical bone loss so you are taking a divorce from latage <laughs> i'm not not i'm coming to that now how did you uh, tension it or uh, it is there is a tensioning device there is a tensioning so we have today we heard a uh, lot of lecture about uh, bony bank art so let's try to present one case it was a 40 year male sedentary desk job person left shoulder injured he had a first episode of dislocations first episode of epilepsy so there was no as such cause detected for epilepsy he suddenly had a epilepsy he had a dislocation was brought to the casualty uh, got reduced by itself uh, on examination was painful restricted movement and apprehension was severely positive So on MRI, it showed a bony bank cut. On CT films, there was a large uh, bony fragment which was displaced uh, inferiorly and medially. And on 3D CT scan, you can see uh, around more than around 15 to 20 uh, mm bone graft. Uh, b oh sorry, the the fracture site which is uh, displaced medially and uh, not aligned. So question to Dave is options for this uh, fixation. operative or acute injury right it's acute injury acute. it's operative or uh, conservative uh, um we start with treating epilepsy first and within 2 weeks you can go and operate and you can fix the fragment either a double row if you are very well versed with the double row technique you can fix it fix so epilepsy mri brain was done it was uh, showing nothing 
as such no causes of epilepsy was detected even it then was the at least episode. for some time like maybe one or two years he may need some uh, yeah he was started on epilepsy yeah. medicines okay then for acute now bony yeah. bankart will be option for co- operative or conservative it's, it's a it's a better option to go for an acute uh, repair because okay. it's a bony fragment okay. if you can reduce that and fix it then that's that will be okay. the so the next question is open or arthroscopic repairs uh, arthroscopic is uh, i think in my hands arthroscopic is better okay. easy then yeah, compared to open okay. 40 years 40 years non dominant desk job sedentary lifestyle it's a big fragment so yeah it's it's ideal to so options to for is uh, cc can cancel skeletal disc screws or uh, anchors will be anchors is it's better easy to fix uh, screws you might uh, f- fragment the f- uh, you f- fracture yeah. the fragments fracture and uh, uh techniques like which technique will be preferred single row double row suture bridge fragment you can go for a double row technique okay you get a better abutment on the glenoid any other other techniques or anything non dominant or non dominant non dominant non so he is 40 years yeah. first i would like to treat his epilepsy and uh, s- on ct scan uh, on mri i see the where, where the bone fragment is lying if it is approximating well i would like to wait also uh, and you will uh, be waiting for this uh, so you will be treating it as a conservative if it is if it is falling back in position then i would uh, it is non dominant and i would like to wait and uh, s- if this kind of uh, episode of epilepsy doesn't occur so probably it may heal also it seems to be slightly more inferiorly displaced but if it's uh, similar to the as long as it's in the plane even if there is displacement they actually tend to heal in fact there are ct based studies to show that at the age of 40 they don't actually end up with recurrence well, it is uh, very medially displaced and it is so uh, so let's ask people you know yeah. um, many of us are 40 plus anybody less than 40 um, uh, um, more than 40 less than 40 less than 40 so so let me ask you if you if you land up in same situation what see you are all educated people since morning you are listening <laughs> since mo- any any one of you land up in this situation and you yourself a orthopedic surgeon what will you prefer one conserve second operate third what is third option no option no. <laughs> only two option <laughs> so uh, conserve how many people yeah, conserve one, only one episode of epilepsy conserve one two You can say strongly pro. Can say, can say. 3. Who else is can say? Ha, nee nee. Let yes, let us come. Then how many people will sir, offer a surgery? Either arthroscopic or open. A hey, Karthik. Ha. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is very evident. Not because see in democracy even if one person is right he is right. Yeah. I am not saying that he is wrong. but probably we are not come to that stage that stage to understand that at 40 even this fracture will unite so it's difficult to maybe 10 year down the line when we meet at same podium same place in coimbatore invited by mr ks then we might uh, come to a conclusion that okay this fractures might unite but currently i don't see this fractures uniting they'll malunite they'll go and get united at the neck and then it's very di- very difficult to break them so best way is what dr pelniwal has said go Fix. create a suture bridge go through subscap trans subscapularis portal yeah. pass your two anchors and put your two anchors on the on face of the glenoid tight off create a suture bridge type of reconstruction i i totally agree with uh, what he roshan is saying and palni all said um, all are both are correct only but there is a, there are paper which are available for bony bank or acute bony bank or which is minimally displaced not like this yeah, one is so minimally, minimally displaced, displaced they do very well with the conservative management. management so 
considered imaging is applicable for a minimally displaced acute bony bangle which has shown no recurrence rate also yeah. or no, very low for this case this is my lo so largely displaced with a so so strongly apprehension so sundar wants to add something yeah. and that is same thing uh, if you go to literature you can get answer for everything yeah. there are a lot of good papers shows that non operative and operative equally Look at very good proximal results. humerus yeah but we have made a mockery no, we don't know yeah, which to operate which not to operate right say we say here to individualize the patient this is totally a different case uh, not it's not a undisplaced fracture even immediately one or two mm of displaced it's fine it is completely displaced and rotated so this fragment will not go back to the, the this high chance of recurrent instability they can find this some loose body also yeah, so you have to five, five, years, six years, you will find this fragment as a loose body inside yeah. there and when you are going for surgery for example if you do consider it now you will have to go for a bony procedure only yeah, we cannot consider that uh, that that fragment again attrition now yeah uh, any supportive procedures with that remplissage or any bony bank card or anything in the plan no need that. i think i think you know the uh, natural if you do open it will be a natural pluti plat so patient Pressure will not have cross section rotation no need of remplissage even if you don't do it and you tighten the capsule, capsule. because of immobilization for 10 15 days you will get that stiffness you will not have uh, is a case of epilepsy and everything to prevent uh, re fracture or just a single medical, medical management thing so same thing as we discussed uh, the, the fracture the fragment was lying very light so we re, uh, elevated it with a elevator uh, and we repaired it with a suture bridge technique uh, i added the remplissage along with it just for a uh, precautionary basis in satisfaction <laughs> so that uh, see the reason why uh, dislocation happens in epilepsy is because of over activity of the muscle, muscle yeah. so again you are attaching more muscle on the head if a patient develops another epilepsy it's going to dislocate posteriorly why do you want to add a muscle to exert more pressure on the humeral head <coughs> normally what happens in uh, epilepsy is because of the muscle over activity of the muscle no so again you are putting more muscle on the humeral head it's going to pull it faster if the patient develops another episode of epilepsy he's going to get posterior dislocation so to prevent uh, re anterior dislocation and damage to the part yeah, or this, this you have reconstructed the whole uh, glenoid no? yeah. then uh, the capsule is fine right. the labrum is fine so not necessary thank you sir thank you fantastic thanks very much sujit thank for you. the case uh, wonderful so uh, we we'll just quickly go for the next case uh, we have one more uh, we got few more so 21 year old fisherman kabaddi player this is your patient sir mixed martial arts recurrent shoulder instability sleep dislocation mid range instability apprehension anterior drawer weight and 3 by 9 lakar again look at that i, I, I think jill walsh talk. and christian gerber would be so so proud of all of us because everyone is uh, saying in one way one no, way. So anybody would do anything different this, other than this case i do an arthroscopy and do a replisan yeah. replisan procedure okay. and then come back open and do an lethargy why would you do that sir no it's a martial arts no 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 he's a kabaddi kabaddi fisherman fisherman he's kabaddi player no, kabaddi no, no, fisherman so kabaddi is again the yeah. same <laughs> so you would add a replisan for your yes okay with, with lethargy oh lethargy i do open yeah but before that i just go in scope do a amplisage any particular reason for that sir no because he is going he is a kabaddi player if he is a professional player he needs more st stable joint more stability no? stability because whatever you are doing as a atharge is not a no, is a non anatomical thing no it's not anatomical uh, fixation so you would add amplisage ah, yeah. how many of how that many of us would add amplisage for this case anybody would add bone loss almost uh, 25% Last time was 12 percent. Now 20. 20. No, no, no. This see, this circle is wrong. Each each radiologist will tell a different uh, thing. Wrongly done. Wrongly done. I couldn't take the circle off. So it was a whole slide. If you do calculation in morning and then evening, it will be different. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. The circle is wrongly placed. Two to uh, 15 to 20 percent max. 15, 15 percent is okay. High demand, 15 percent. Okay, so bank card, bank card, remplissage, yeah. lattage. Yeah. Everyone unanimously lattage. Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, is there a way to actually? <laughs> What is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is this is uh, lattage. This actually this video is available in the IJO article. It's uh, it's just a video of how how we position. How everything is done. Everything is clearly given. I don't think we can uh, fast forward it. 
uh, Nikhil Verma showed it because we didn't have a talk on uh, the procedure of Latage. I wanted to show it, but uh, it's been already shown. So I'll just. Uh, can you just fast forward it? Fast forward the fast forward the video. So just a couple of things I want to show here. It's exactly the same way described by Jill Walsh. It's nothing different. Uh, smaller incision than uh, Nikhil Verma, I should say, but uh, the procedure is almost the same. No, it's gone. That's fine. I think it can be seen in. Uh, in a, so, so that's the follow-up. Uh, that's the positioning of the graft according to how it was. It's an open surgery, so you can nicely position the graft between the three and the five o'clock position, and that's the consolidation seen at one year. So the the idea is very clear with a considerable amount of bone loss in a high demand individual. Then probably Lataje is the best surgery. So uh, you know you don't need to have any confusion in that. So this is a 32-year-old, epileptic, under control, underwent bank cut five years back, dislocated two years. Again, three episodes since. Epilepsy hasn't recurred at all, but after the surgery, she has had uh, CT shows minimal glenoid bone loss. I don't have any other pictures. This is the only picture we have. So uh, how would uh, one approach this patient? 33-year-old lady, epileptic, under control, failed bank cut lesion, basically a failed bank cut repair. CT normal, minimal glenoid bone loss. I don't have the pictures. I don't have the pictures, I'm sorry. See, first and foremost. So you would do arthroscopic revision bank card. See, first and foremost here, we have to first, you know, post-reduction, you have to control her uh, epilepsy. Yeah. Unless there is a control of epilepsy, no procedure no, is going to work here. Epilepsy hasn't come back in five, six years. The, then, then why she is getting dislocated? Dislocation is because of failure of surgery, not because of epilepsy. She's a female. She's not a contact athlete. No, right? no, no. She didn't have any fall. Surgery didn't work. Surgery can also not work. Without any fall, also it cannot. No. Dislocation happened two years after surgery. Just like that. Just like then normal in, activity. In that case, you know, Karthik is better to investigate the patient because there is something wrong. Either you want, to, you want to contribute, Heath? <laughs> there is one, I saw it, white elephant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that is a very, very important point, uh, often, uh, often neglected by uh, surgeons. I think rehab is also very, very important. But actually, this this uh, this patient underwent a latage and is quite stable since it's five years. Now, I just wanted to uh, see if how many of you would offer an arthroscopic revision bank art in such a situation. No, but uh, ka, ka, we uh, don't have enough information on that uh, case. You don't have let's, it. Uh, it's okay. no let's go for this one. So, this arthroscopic uh, latage? You? Arthroscopic? No, 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 arthroscopic latage. It's just only no, 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 no. This is a, this is a latage. No, no, no. Previous case. That's the thing. Bank cut was not properly done. That's why it failed. Not done by good surgeon. And, pro <laughs> and probably, probably Heath was uh, right. Uh, probably re rehab was also not uh, given adequate. Yeah. Yes. Treatment. Problem. Yeah. Dictate your. Uh, Moreover, if the if it comes again, yeah. the epilepsy comes again, this bank card will fail, even latage will also fail. Yes, that's what that's what he said. So what is important? Epilepsy or latage? <laughs> now you have to control epilepsy first. Epilepsy. So that is what I said. Epilepsy will be controlled by the neurologist. Again, the white <laughs> white <laughs> elephant. Sir, the we have to rule out silent okay. seizures. In the epilepsy, posterior dislocation is more common, right? What is that? Who is that? Posterior dislocation is more common. Posterior dislocation is uh, it's common, but anterior dislocation is commoner than posterior dislocation. So uh, this is a 59-year-old male, right-handed electrocution. If you had listened to Nikhil's case and Dr. X's question, I think this uh, case just uh, exactly fits into that description. He's a hard-working farmer, went into his field, there was an electric wire lying there, and he got electrocuted, shoulder was dislocated, he was lying there for two, three hours, brought to the emergency in the local hospital, reduced, and he comes to us. And uh, he had uh, very inadequate imaging, but I can show you what we had. So he had a deltoid palsy. Uh, um, uh, he had uh, anterior glenoid rim fracture. We can actually call it a huge fracture of the anterior glenoid, uh, uh, anterior inferior glenoid. 
and he had a displaced GT fracture. So here is a patient with a glenoid rim fracture, unstable shoulder, GT avulsion with a deltoid palsy. So it's just like how Dr. Sundarajan asked if the fragments are too comminuted, what would you do? So this is a very comminuted anterior glenoid fracture and uh, GT avulsion, deltoid palsy in a 59 year old. Do you have any 3D, 3D view of that? No, no, we don't. No? X-ray? X-ray, oh, X-ray is not there. Should be there. No, no, there is no 3D CT. But this is this is the view you can see. This I have okay. few more pictures. I think I'm sorry for the inadequate so images. See, so the patient was screened in the government hospital. CT was done there. This was the only film he had. He can't. He couldn't afford another CT scan. So it's very difficult in our situation to convince the patient for further imaging preoperatively. It's very difficult. So uh, these are the uh, with this information probably he has got. A f badly fractured glenoid. Yes. We do. We can't assess the it's amount. It's an anterior glenoid rim fracture. Rim it is fracture. not a like a big, uh, you know, through and through half the glenoid fracture. No. Not like that. It's, it's a just a rim fracture. Rim fracture. Okay. So rim fracture of glenoid and the avulsion fracture of the GT. GT. So it makes a very unstable situation. Uh, acute uh, uh, acute injury. I will consider this patient for surgery in spite of having deltoid palsy. Because deltoid palsy, usually the posterior fibers gets damaged more. The anterior fibers are usually spared. So you can get a better outcome with this fixation. And plus, the moment you fix the GT and the glenoid, and your humeral head is back under the glenoid, even the axillary nerve gets relaxed. You know, with dislocated, the axillary nerve healing chances are very, very less. So I'll consider surely this patient for a, a surgery as early as possible. Either it could be an open surgery or arthroscopic surgery, depending on your... Uh, Expertise, I think even open is better for such patients. Any other different opinion? A lot of time it's seen, even if you repair this too, there is subluxation of sh uh, shoulder seen because of uh, palsy. Yeah. So, so you uh, put them in sling for some day, usually it's a functional uh, this thing, you know, and the anterior deltoid will take over. It has been seen that posterior dislocation or anterior dislocation, usually the posterior fibers and deltoid are involved anterior fibers are spared. So even if you uh, sling it and uh, uh, keep them up, see, uh, if, the, if you keep them dislocated, axillary nerve will never heal because it will be always under stretch. So I think surgical Dr. role is Ran more and better. Dr. Ashish, would you have uh, any opinions? How would you treat this? Displaced. Is it comminuted? So how many for arthroscopic GT. fixation? GT is comminuted? Arthroscopic fixation. Arthroscopic. One, two, three. Okay. So you, you are a beach chair surgeon or a... Uh, lateral. We can do lateral. both lateral. You will... Yeah. Oh, you will... <laughs> <laughs> no, this one, wait until deltoid recovery is not a good okay. answer. So everyone agrees that we stiffness. have to intervene immediately. Yes. Yeah. So Either one uh, or two option. It sort of depends on what uh, you know individual expertise. Uh, you have to fix it straight away as soon as possible. You would do it arthroscopically, sir? Yeah, we'll try it arthroscopically. It'll be fine because we don't want to again disturb the deltoid by splitting and other things, no? Yeah. So we can uh, try. No, I just don't want to take more time. Uh, we did a diagnostic scopy. The shoulder was totally unstable. It was out, actually. So every time we had to pull the shoulder in and then try and scope it, it was very, very difficult. So I abandoned scopy. I just opened. And the fragments were so small, so I did a latage. I, uh, the subscap was torn, so uh, split the subscap, pass the graft through the split, fix the graft, and then repair the subscap, the upper subscap with an anchor, and then did a mini open, two incisions, one in the front delta pec, another deltoid split, two incisions, repaired the cuff, uh, open, and uh, this was it. Ashish. Well, the, the rationale is that uh, we've seen several patients like they've got a series of these patients. Mo even in the densest of the deltoid uh, palsies, they recover within about 9 to 12 months. But the problem is we can't wait until that time to uh, repair the cuff. As Dr. Uh, Roshan was pointing out, if you repair the cuff, the cuff itself can hold it in a sort of a static position. The, the joint can be held in a static position of reduction. If we don't repair the cuff, the shoulder is completely out and unstable. So repairing the cuff is the best chance for getting even the deltoid to recover. Yeah. So uh, and he, He's asking our role of EMG. See, the process of re Valerian degeneration will not begin before... Until six weeks. Yeah. Six weeks, right? 
so even if you start doing your emg at 3 weeks you will not see those changes so up to 21 days you will not see those changes in emg your cmap potential the action potential they will be same so practically you will not get any knowledge so best is to do a surgery and consult the patient that there is a palsy we have no option but to do emg post surgery and post surgery you can document it that we wanted to check for the nerve regeneration of the nerve so this patient uh, had the whole shebang he he had everything uh, he had a lethargy he had a what is that long head. screw in uh, humeral neck is it buttress screw or not that's the lateral lateral row basically it's a suture post for the lateral row so when we fix a gt we put medial anchors we take all the sutures and then we tie the suture onto the lateral instead of using a lateral row anchor since it was open we've done it with a screw so it it's basically buttressing the uh, gt fragment this is uh, two months post of is already back to riding his uh, bike and uh, his delta doesn't fully recovered he is into active assisted range now with a cane uh, now he th how would you re uh, rehab this patient what will you be, be your rehab protocol please come to the front understand the phases of uh, tissue healing um, so uh, in the in the early stages the physios need to be very careful about disrupting those tissues right there's sensitive attachments that have been made with screws and sutures and all kinds of stuff so we need to be conservative for a period of time but what tends to happen is sometimes we can be too conservative for too long um, so six to eight weeks is probably maybe uh, 12 weeks in specific circ circumstances if you've discussed it with the, with the authors about how long you need to be conservative doing your pendulum movements and all your very gentle rehab. But at some point if you don't start building eccentric strength within your subscapularis within your, uh, and releasing your lat muscle, your teres major, these are massive muscles that have got a protective uh, mechanism of internal rotation uh, extension and adduction. So these, th they, they cause a lot of problems to limit movement later. And, and I'll try and explain it in more detail when, I, when I'm talking how those big muscles then completely change the scapular humeral rhythm. They cause all kinds of hiking at the shoulder joint and uh, subacromial space uh, reduction. Uh, reduction. And then that can mess with all of the surgery that you've done. Yeah, no, the, um, Alex Laderman just pointed out that he is actually totally stopped immobilizing his patient. He's actually mm. mobilizing them as early as possible because he wants proprioception more than protection of his surgery. So Correct. that's a very valid point yeah. that you have to immobilize only for a certain period of time. After that, we have to actually start activating the muscle. Yeah. Thank you very much. And we would like to listen, uh, listen to more of you. Uh, uh, the any role of a trapezius transfer in that case? Trapezius transfer because the delta is not okay. No, we can't. Uh, we can't substitute deltoid with any other muscle. Deltoid has to recover. If the deltoid doesn't recover, then we have other options. Right now, you can see that the shoulder is completely centered. See, and the patient is already doing most of the movements. The shoulder is actually not subluxed or anything. The deltoid seems to have start starting to recover already. So we don't need to worry about the deltoid. He has paresthesia here. He's unable to do it. He's, he's up to there. He's got some palsy, but it al already is recovering. So thank you very much. We got more cases. I think we got uh, other things to follow. So thanks very much for the panel discussion. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. The rehabilitation. What he says is what he said. No, I mean immediately day one mobilizing is very dangerous. This should not have a wrong message for the uh, this thing because we have to respect the biology. That's what the problem happens with the physiotherapist. What he said is correct. Some physiotherapists said very aggressive mobilization. So you have to say case by case. We have to individualize. Use only surgeon only know when to mobilize on day one or day three weeks or six weeks or 12 weeks. Some cases where we have very bad fixation, we know that we cannot move it for six weeks time. So we should not have a universal protocol. That is very important. Sundar, but you know, uh, before Rob Laprat's concept of aggressive rehab in multi-ligament, even for multi-ligament, we used to be very conservative. Uh, absolutely. And then what we realized that after doing multi-ligament repair or reconstruction, if you don't mo mo mobilize them as early as possible, they all end up in problem. Absolutely. So I, I mean think for shoulder also, it is a surgeon who should decide. Okay, the fixation is strong. Thing. Yeah, fixation is strong. Please go ahead with That's rehab. The Otherwise, the fixation is weak. Please wait. That's the same thing. thing. Yeah. If the fixation is good, if you know that this is very strong fixation, you do mobilize from day one, no problem. But we know some situation where we cannot mobilize for four to six weeks. 
that is also true. So you have to individually assess the soft tissue, your type of fixation, bone quality, many factors involved. Thank you for the light discussion. So next, uh, thank you panelists. Next we will be moving on to session five. I would like to call upon uh, uh, Sendhil Velavan sir and uh, Rahul sir to chair this session. So, uh, Dr. Sendhil Velavan sir and uh, Rahul sir to chair this session. So first we would be uh, starting with the avoiding pitfalls in shoulder instability surgery by uh, Dr. Bhupesh Karthik sir. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, Karthik Selvaraj and uh, Team Sironix for inviting us for this meeting. So Karthik wanted me to uh, talk on ways in which a beginner can go wrong. So I've tried to uh, put all the complications that can happen and how we can avoid it. First thing is the positioning. Most of us do instability work in lateral position. Make sure that the Glenoid is parallel to the floor, so tilt the patient 25 degrees posteriorly. So the retroversion of the shoulder is corrected and then the glenoid becomes parallel because your uh, humerus is retroverted. So this is important, otherwise if you're dead lateral, every time you try to reach anteriorly, your shoulder will start falling forward and then you will be wasting a lot of time. So tilt the patient back a little bit. Uh, what positioning device to use? I have the luxury of using all three devices. The third one is the IV stand. Whichever you are comfortable with, you can use. I, I have practically seen no difference in any positional devising. But what is more important than the device that positions or suspends the arm is the equipment position and uh, the theater ergonomics should be perfect because if your theater ergon ergonomics is going to be bad, your surgical time is going to increase and you will get tired because you are not standing in the optimum position and that's going to give you a lot of shoulder ache and neck ache. So this is usual arthroscopic trolley that we have. And as you see, the monitor is usually on the topmost of the trolley. Try to get a monitor which can be pulled down so that it is not very high for you and you don't have to look up and then have a neck strain. Ideally, the monitor should be 15 degrees or 10 degrees lower than your eye level. That is the position of ease for your neck. And then you will not uh, have neck pain most of the senior surgeons here will have neck pain, I think. Sundar, sir, yes. So <laughs> the, the ideal distance for the monitor to be from you should be around five times the diagonal of the monitor. This is the distance in which your macula can get in a lot of information without actually irritating your eye. So try to keep this distance and try to keep your monitor down. Have a mobile arm in your monitor, which is not very costly. Indian versions are available. And your OT table, should be able to go really down, especially if you're doing shoulder, because when you put lateral position, the patient is already one and a half feet high from the table, and then your elbow should be at 90 degrees so that you operate like that. You don't have to operate like this and end up having supraspinatus tendinitis. The next important thing is the coaxial line, the surgeon, your target area, which is your operating field, and the monitor should be in the straight line. So if you're doing your cuff repair and you want to shift your antero superior portal, make sure your monitor is in this direction. If you're doing a cuff and standing more lateral, make sure it is in that direction. So don't try to keep it in the single place and then turn around too much and then operate like this, which is going to give you a lot of neck strain. So these small things actually go a long way. This will increase your uh, decrease your surgical time and make your surgery more pleasurable. So this improves performance and uh, thereby prevents complications. Pump is your choice. You use it, not use it. Instability not required, but if you're using it, it's up to you. There's no big literature evidence here. Uh, play the, play the, excuse me, AV, play the, yeah. So uh, I have been taught shoulder arthroscopy by my chief. I still do uh, marking for each and every case because uh, marking as simple as it might seem or unnecessary it might seem, it is very, very important because once the shoulder swells, you will lose landmarks and trying to find your portals is very, very difficult. So please make sure you mark all your cases, it is very important to see the anterior border and the posterior border of the acromion because most of your anterolateral portals and your uh, posterior posterolateral portals are in relation to these two angles. And of course, the coracoid is very important because your portal should be lateral to it. So anterior portals, uh, always do the outside in technique. 
and this is your rotator interval. This is only in relation to instability surgery. So this is the uh, zone between your long head of biceps, subscap, and then your anterior uh, superior labrum. That's where your portals come in. Uh, everybody's got a small modification of their own portals, but usually the anchor portal, which is close to the coracoid, should have that angle in which it is coming down. So your anchors should not be very parallel to the glenoid and then it should not squeeze off. So you use your spinal needle, make sure you get a nice angle and reach around four o'clock, five o'clock in that, very close to the uh, subscap and top in the um, uh, triangle. Your next uh, portal, your antero superior should be behind your glenoid. Uh, Professor Hashin uh, recently also convinced me that it can be through your anterior supraspinatus. It is not wrong because it usually heals in six weeks, but we try to keep it just anterior to the uh, border of supraspinatus. The idea is that it should go anterior and posterior to your biceps like this so that you can switch it to see the posterior and the anterior without getting crowded with the um, uh, other portal, which will be your instrumenting portal. The angle between your instrumenting portal and the viewing portal should usually be 30 degrees because this is the angle in which your vision and your instrumentation will usually come to each other. If it is parallel, again, you will have difficulty in trying to do what you're doing. If it is divergent, it is almost impossible to do what you're trying to do. So try to keep it at 30 degrees, which is very important. Uh, this is just a repetition, but uh, repetition is good. So others have already spoken about it. You see from the posterior portal, you see a bald glenoid, bring it anteriorly. I like to use these curved, rounded elevators. These are very sharp. They work to 70 degrees for you. And this case, as you see, appears to have no labrum at all. But as you gently go elevating it, don't use the mallet to start with. Do it like a dissection, slowly dissect it out. And then with time, you will see that your alpha lesion is down under what looked like there is going to be no tissue, slowly you will start seeing pretty decent tissue for you to repair at the end of procedure. So be gentle, preparation is very important. Trying to liberate it without breaking the ring is important. Sometimes you can use a trial reduction because this is repetition, a repetition of what is already said by other speakers I'm going forward. Bony bank art, as you know, we have two types. Sometimes you have a small bank art, bony bank art like this. But one small tip is you elevate it, but see, you use the rasp on the other side and also freshen the other side of the bony uh, lesion, the smaller bone, which is also very important because you want to finally have bone-to-bone -bone healing. You always try and uh, freshen the glenoid side, but also try and freshen the bony side of it. And then this is how post-liberation your and freshening your uh, labrum should fall onto the glenoid so your repair is going to be robust and simple without injury. A bigger bony bank arts, yes, we already discussed this, and uh, quickly, this is how you do. You can do it with your curved anchors through your same portal, or you can do it through your trans subscap portal, and then have one anchor in the neck, which is usually double loaded. Here, I, I'm using a curved anchor, and then you put one more anchor on the face, and just by the pulley technique, you can just pull it, and then the whole thing will fall in place. And of course, all this is after maintaining your biology, and then you go on to do a double row uh, bony bank art. So in these special conditions, now I'm just mentioning a few special conditions where your routine bank art is going to be a little different. And that's your, so sometimes you have revision. The idea of adding this slide is always use all suture anchors. We have almost gone out of metal anchors, slowly moving out of bio and peak anchors for the glenoid because they are space consuming and these are foreign bodies there. Now, usually the uh, post-traumatic cases after your primary bank art fail at the junction of your anchor and the bone. So in this interface, when you fail, you can treat it as a bony bank art and you can ignore these sutures and go and do a simple straightforward repair like a bony bank art. You can still salvage it with a revision, not going for an uh, arthroscopy uh, and uh, latter day procedure. Whenever you see muscle tissue like this and you've gone in for a recurrent shoulder dislocation, your labrum looks okay, you're looking at haggle. So look at your preoperative MRI. Never take a patient with just a CT scan saying it is the single most important investigation. Sometimes you can have haggle. So this is a haggle. So 
Hagel can, of course, very easily be treated arthroscopically, but you need to identify and be aware that it is an Hagel. You usually use two or three sutures like this onto the uh, other end of the labrum and uh, fix it to the um, uh, humerus with another anchor. So, AB lesions are not explained lesions. I have just named it AB lesions, but also always look for these capsular injuries which are very common with violent uh, dislocations. So, you have a true lesion here. You have a Bankart lesion in the bone uh, labrum interface and then you have another capsular tear. So, these capsular injuries because it is very important to get back your IGHL intention. That is the single most important process of doing the surgery. So, identify other lesions which are medial uh, or sorry lateral to the uh, labral lesion like this and then usually it is very simple. You have to take uh, a plicated stitch through the lesion and then connect it to the labrum and then that should usually solve. So, this is the first plication stitch and then go down and take the second stitch under the labrum and then end up doing a regular bank art repair. So, uh, the, the complication rates have now decreased because of two important factors. We started putting the anchors on the face and then we started addressing the capsular laxity which initially we were not doing. So, Buddy Savoy and Caspery came up with this idea that the anchor should no longer be in the neck but to be on the surface. So, we have started making uh, anchors in the surface although it, it looked barbaric to start with, now it has become a norm. Uh, your anchors are on the edge but on the surface and we have also started moving to all suture anchors because real estate in the glenoid is very important. You cannot take away a lot of bone in putting anchors so that there is another chance of salvage with arthroscopy itself and then uh, uh, it is also very important to plicate. So, we have all again moved to spectrum like devices or occupas lasso like devices where you can plicate your anterior inferior glenoid labrum and then come under the labrum and deliver good soft tissue for repair. Now, in spite of all that, you can still have problems like this, especially in long-standing bony bank arts where your glenoid also becomes osteoporotic. Uh, yeah, and then the anchor came out of the glenoid there. Luckily, I have used an all-suture anchor. So, when you use all-suture anchors, as I said, you really don't have to be worried. You can forget that anchor and then go ahead, little inferior to it. I am now putting a double-loaded anchor, little inferior to that space. This is uh, multiple dislocations with a bony bank art. So, the, there is already some chondral damage in the glenoid and then you can go ahead and uh, take a mattress there and then a simple there. You can use any configuration you want, use a mason allen if you want. But because the primary anchor pullout was an all suture anchor, I could get off without having trouble and nicely recreate the IGHL in this case. So, sometimes in very tight shoulders, it is very difficult to use the spectrum like device or acupas like device. The lasso will not help you get a good bite. So, in these cases, use a double loaded and then your first stitch can be a shallow stitch, not going too deep for your axillary nerve with your uh, uh, first pass and then use that as a traction stitch. Now, you can see a lot of good tissue is coming forward for your second bite and then use your spectrum like device to get a good, decent, bulky, juicy bite through the capsular labral tissue with your. Uh, second bite with the uh, spectrum like device. So, you can do a little bit of mix and match. Sometimes it is easy to use the knee scorpion or the labral first pass to do this. Knotting, always knot it on the other side. There are few cadaver studies which says knot can be anywhere, but uh, cadaver studies do not recreate biology. We as uh, we saw in the morning, these anchors will only work for the first 12 weeks. So, it is important that these knots do not come into the joint and irritate it. So, as much as possible, try to put all your knots on the capsular side. Sliding knots are usually uh, knots of choice in instability surgery. And after your first anchor, if you have recreated IGHL tension, your humeral head will sit in the center uh, of the glenoid, which is very important. My chief told, bank art repair is like marriage. Preparation is more important and takes more time than tying the knot. Thank you. Thank, um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bupesh. Uh, we'll take questions at the end of the session, sir. Yeah. 
So now I invite upon uh, Doc. Oh, okay. Then is there any questions? Then we can take it in the next. Uh, questions from the audience. Having another monitor uh, like no, on the below. Sir. And uh, sure, for the lateral traction, what you mentioned, the keeping the traction anteriorly to the patient or posteriorly to the patient, because patient is lying lateral. So does it anterior? Thank you very much, Dr. Bhupesh. Um, now we'll move on to the next talk, uh, Remplissage to Stay or Go by Dr. Leonard Pondraj. Thank you. Can we start? Right. All day we've had uh, bashing about Remplissage, right from Nick Verma. So I don't know what I'm going to say new, but what I, my talk will have uh, two bits. The first half will be the culprit for why we do Remplissage and represent as such. If there's any repetition, kindly bear with me. When we, uh, when we are faced with a bank art lesion, you know, all our focus is on the bank art lesion. Uh, and many a times we tend to forget what's going on at the top end of the humerus. And that's what is the Hillsax lesion. Uh, right. So, what is Hillsax lesion? Hillsax lesion is a compression fracture or a divot or a dent in the posterior superior lateral aspect of the proximal humerus, which typically and classically happens when the uh, head of the humerus engages in the anterior glenoid when the shoulder dislocates. Now, thankfully, for a Hillsax uh, uh, lesion, it doesn't necessarily have to be dealt with uh, just by itself. Majority of the time, it, it comes into play when there's a concomitant lesion like a glenoid bone loss. However, there is uh, about 16% failure of anterior bank art repair when the hill saxation is really big and which is uh, missed uh, in terms of uh, the engagement being not recognized early on. So how, how do you assess the hill saxation? By, by the size and the orientation. The size of the hill sax lesion, you have to assess by the length, the width, and the depth, right? And the orientation is the key. The more horizontal it is to the vertical axis of the humerus, the more harmful and the more chances of it engaging, even if the lesion is small, as small as 15%. Calandra classification is how we quantify or assess uh, Hillsax lesion, small, medium, and large. What's a small lesion? Just a dent in the articular cartilage. And the medium lesions uh, in, involve the subchondral bone, and the large ones are really digging into the subchondral bone. It, uh, you can also quantify it in terms of the volume of the articular surface of the humeral head as to 20, 20 to 40, and 40%. 20 is negligible. Uh, more than 40 is large, and you really have to attend, uh, uh, pay attention to it. The 20 to 40 percent bit is the one which happens majority of the time, and uh, also it comes into real play when there is a concomitant bony injury uh, like glenoid bone loss or a bony glenoid. I can see there, can't I? Right. So how? Uh, um, Hills acceleration can be assessed radiologically just with plain x-ray. In AP view, in 60 degrees of internal rotation, you can see you can measure the width and the depth. And in Banagio view, you can assess the length as well. However, to, to plan preoperatively, uh, when, when you have a, when you have a uh, huge Hills acceleration, 
uh, in an AP view, internal uh, rotator 60 degrees. Uh, you, you cannot plan uh, for surgery whether you're going to deal with it or not because it, it has a low, very, very low internal observer uh, reliability and you can use it as an assessing tool but not as uh, decision making for surgery. CT, 3D CT was gold standard in terms of measuring the um, lesion uh, and also in terms of assessing the orientation, whether it's horizontal or vertical. Uh, however, with the advent of 3D MR, the same assessment can be done with MRI if you have, a, uh, if you have the software, probably you have the software and a good radiologist who can back you up and give you all the measurements. Uh, it also helps save the extra dose of radiation the patient is put into. Hillsax lesion can also be assessed arthroscopically, but it has to be done as a dry scope. Because if you open the fluid and you hydrate the joint, balloon it out, even a non-engaging or an off track or, or an on-track lesion can present, or you may be uh, assessing it as a off track or an engaging lesion. So if you want to assess it arthroscopically, you better do it in a dry scope. Now, all this changed with the introduction of the track concept, linear track concept, uh, in 2007 by G. Toy and uh, Giovanni Diacomo. Uh, until then, we were using the engaging and the non-engaging, but then we moved on to the on-track and the off-track. Uh, a lot has been said about it in the morning, so I don't want to repeat it, but this video alone I will play. I think I'll have to press it again for it to, that's, yeah. When the shoulder goes for abduction and external rotation, there is a hill sack lesion which is on track. The glenoid is intact, as you can see. On repetitive dislocation, there is glenoid bone loss, and what was an extraarticular lesion engages and becomes an intraarticular lesion. So once again, you can see on the left, there is a hill sack lesion, but the glenoid curve is big enough and which makes it a on-track lesion, whereas when there is glenoid bone loss, an on-track lesion becomes an off-track lesion and the hill sac lesion really engages in the anterior aspect of the glenoid. Following uh, the uh, on-track, off-track uh, uh, lesion uh, uh, which was advocated, we also have a uh, treatment algorithm which was uh, which has been advocated and you can see that Remplissage still holds good, still has a place because my talk is whether it's staying in or going out. I'll come to that in the end. So Hillsax, surgical management of Hillsax lesion. When the lesion is less than 20% or just about 20% and on track lesion, non-engaging, you can jolly well treat it conservatively. However, when the lesion is large, you know, between 20 and 40 percent, or more than 40 percent, and and typically, if uh, if you know the history, if the patient is give, able to give you a history, uh, he says, "I fell on an outstretched hand." Uh, uh, that also helps in decision making. And if it's an engaging or off-track lesion and horizontal hill sac lesion in relation to the vertical axis of the humerus, all this helps to make a decision. And uh, when there's a concomitant bo bony lesion or a bipolar lesion, goes without saying. Uh, that you have to deal with it surgically. So remplissage is one of the treatment modalities of defect in the proximal humerus posterior superior aspect. Uh, although there are other methods like hill sac reduction, humeral head reduction, and partial, uh, partial head arthroplasty, hemi, and Weber osteotomy, most of the time we get away with doing a remplissage. Uh, I mean, if there's anybody else done anything other than remplissage, you're more than welcome to tell me after the talk is over. So once again, remplissage is uh, uh, a French word which means fill in. And what do we do there? We fill the defect in with the tendon of the infraspinatus, tenodesis, and also the posterior capsule, capsulodesis. So they're basically, it's a tenodesis and a capsulodesis of the posterior aspect of the uh, shoulder joint. So how does it work? When the hill sac is an on-track lesion, it is an extra-articular lesion. Am I right? Yeah. 
So uh, it's an interarticulation. Uh, so then uh, once you uh, do the remplissage, you convert the, uh, it prevents the anterior excursion and prevents the humeral head engaging thereby. That's how it uh, classically works. Uh, patient, right shoulder, patient on the side, uh, you prepare the uh, lesion, you make it raw, take off all the fibrous tissue, and then I use a single anchor in the valley of the lesion, uh, uh, it's a 5.5 double loaded anchor, and then I take uh, bites, uh, widespread bites in a parachute formation, so that when you uh, when you take the uh, when you do the tenodesis and the capsule desis, it really really fills in. And the first uh, knot is made with the nearest uh, the the blue tiger, which takes the uh, middle of the uh, tenodesis and the capsule desis in in place, and then subsequently when you tie down the farthest, which is the plain white, the, you will see that the, the, the middle of the lesion is getting filled. And then the next slide, you will see that when you take down the farthest, which is a plain white, which we saw earlier, it really completely fills in the defect and also prevents anterior excursion when the patient goes for abduction, external rotation. So this is a retrospective study, 50 patients, 51 shoulders, Sports involved were volleyball, basketball, baseball, and football. 95% of them uh, reported to have returned to sport. 100% of uh, volleyball players were able to return, although the basketball players only 89% and the baseball 55%. Uh, and what they found was in 65.5% of the patients, there was decreased external. That's what they need for the cock up for the throw. So that uh, so that's about the retrospective study and. Uh, uh, Pascal Boileau and uh, Wolf came up with a study where they found that there's a, a recurrence of only a zero to eight percent of uh, uh, recurrence of uh, anterior dislocation, and uh, there's a 85 percent uh, satisfaction rate reported by Park at all. Uh, with all good things, there is also a downside to remplissage where. Uh, in abduction, except in uh, there's reduction of internal and external rotation uh, in adduction, but not in abduction. So, in summary, remplissage is a popular method of managing hill sax lesion in instability, especially in association with bank art surgery and mild glenoid bone loss. In recurrent dislocation shoulder, where the, as we heard earlier, the capsule is stretched, the capsule leg, labral uh, ligament complex is way down, and the, caps, the, the joint is capacious and roomy. Uh, you know, it helps in volume reduction as well, in addition to bank art repair. So, and also, in addition to uh, the earlier treat, treatment rhythm uh, algorithm, which we saw uh, uh, suggested by E.G. Toy and Giovanni Diacomo. So, therefore, on balance, is remplissage here, uh, here to stay or go? I'm pretty sure it is here to stay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I would like to invite uh, Ashish Arbert for slap repair. What's new in 2020? No questions? Uh, no, are there any uh, questions? Is there any questions? Yeah. Sir, question. one question, sir. Yeah. Sir, uh, um, in remplissage, uh, while tying the knot, we cannot uh, visualize the knots, no, sir? Or do you have any special technique? Well, they say I have not done. In the double pulley technique, they do visualize. I have not done that. I, I do single anchor. I don't do two anchors. I do single anchor blind. So one more question. You know, you did point out that there was some amount of uh, external rotation loss in adduction. In adduction, yeah. In adduction. So in, do you think uh, you would, in a case of an athlete, would you not offer a remplissage even if it is an off-track lesion? Off-track, uh, yeah. I, I will still offer, but we know at the end of the day, they all stretch out yeah. over a period of time. So no harm. Is this at time zero, uh, the limitation of rotation? Question again? Like, for example, is it in only in the initial post-operative period? Because there are other studies which are showing, uh, like as you said, you know, that they actually yeah. get almost uh, near normal, only about zero to three or zero to four degrees, which is insignificant loss of external rotation. They uh, get it in loss yeah. of abduction. So 
so in even in athletes or non athletes so your preference would my, be the same uh, my preference is lamp massage but the trade off here is by the time it stretches out the anterior shoulder is stabilized well and truly so you get away thank you sir thank, thank you. you ashish good afternoon uh, thank you sir onix and uh, thank you kartik and it's always a pleasure to come to coimbatore i think it's this year is our third time we came here around and kartik called me and said get a topic which you know it should be again white elephant in the house the slap you know and uh, all of us have been uh, always uh, terrified of this lesion and i guess in most of our practice it is uh, out, out of 20 shoulders one shoulder we get with this kind of lesion and we really are in a dilemma what to do so what's new what i found in the literature especially in the aos i'll share because uh, phenomenal lectures have been uh, on so uh, let us run through it's an internal impingement mostly uh, mostly 30% are associated with the cuff tears and there might be a subtle instability in all most of these patients and slap to be done in multidirectional is absolutely no all of us know the mechanisms we will just uh, run through this uh, couple of slides so that we get time for discussing what literature says one thing we need to uh, point out is this part the sublabral foramen before its complex to be never taken into consideration as a slap lesion we'll come to that uh, it made uh, in throws might be the reason of posterior uh, in inferior glenohumeral ligament the slap lesion increases because of the strain on that part and especially of the anterior band and uh, like uh, the rehab guys would agree most of this uh, if we change of action especially in the bowlers and the throwers we might prevent these kind of injuries because what literature found now is if they have a bad slap the career might get over like uh, jawagal shrinath or you know that kind of players so definitely we don't have to uh, overlook this uh, slap lesion throughout its classification mostly it is posterior to know from that we'll discuss on this uh, techniques what we do in type 1 type 2 type 3 uh, no need of uh, surgery in which cases and what kind of tendon involvement if the tendon involvement is more than one third we need to tackle and what are the test that we do function of the glenohumeral will run through mostly to the fibrocartilaginous complex and what we need to know is the labrum receives blood supply from the capsule and the periosteal vessels and not from the underlying bone so and the anterior superior labrum has the poorest blood supply so definitely we need to think uh, of getting it back into place and not conserve the slap every time uh, again what i was saying is the sub sub labral axis and cannot should not never be confused in the mri because it can be a buford complex which is a part of the mghl that's a cord like mghl and in many cadaveric studies we have seen that many people tend to tie it out and then they have a lot of pain the classifications what we follow is uh, all of us know type 1 type 2 type 3 and when there is a complete uh, 360 or near about complete involvement of the superior labrum it's type 4 and here we'll brush through what the literature says where you need to conserve them operate them and do what so mostly these patients when they have an isolated slap they have a vague symptom mostly they are overhead players they are bowlers uh, I, i have seen mostly in uh, tennis and badminton players and some uh, swimmers they complain more of fatigability and weakness more than the pain so these lesions tend to uh, be overlooked over time and there is definitely a decrease in athletic performance and then we never know what type it is 
there are definitely some provocative tests, but uh, I was uh, were lucky enough to attend classes of O'Brien's and uh, in the UK and that test found out, uh, I found out to be the most reliable uh, test for considering a slap lesion, so O'Brien's test. Uh, the dynamic labral shear test, there is definitely a biceps uh, tendon tenderness, but O'Brien's test is one test I think we should rely upon. And this is the O'Brien's test, the patient is standing, arm in 90 degree of flexion and zero degree of adduction and again you take the arm on the opposite uh, shoulder and he elicits a severe catching pain and a popping or clicking sound. So what is the diff, sorry, how to go back? What is the difference between the slap or theoretical? This is the slap lesion and Bankart lesion, it is a very clear demarcation, we should not confuse there. And as m my mentors, Dr. Roshan Bade, during his talks or when during our residency showed that whenever there is a bleeding or a difference of tissue here, you need to see, you need to, you used to always repair the slap and never leave them. So this is a kind of uh, uh, labrum you see in the MRI, it is a vague presentation, you can never define and you need to have a good musculoskeletal uh, radiographist to tell you uh, how is a glenoid neck. Many a times it can be a normal anatomy uh, and this kind of vague picture you get, it is mostly clinical determination of the slap and couple of tests. So arthroscopic diagnosis, definitely there is a pop in and peel back sign by Stephen Burkhart what we see, you need to elicit. Uh, in the labrum with 90 degree of external rotation. So in our technique, what I do is there are two ways. When it is a regular slap, I take an anterior portal, definitely being for the posterior portal. We clear the slap, freshen the edges and then take a, can we run through this? Then we take a lateral portal. And like Bukesh said, we uh, do a, uh, do a uh, mattressing double loaded suture, one from either side of the biceps tendon and to add on, we, we take a accessory Wilmington portal, the posterior Wilmington portal and might rep uh, or if needed, repair the posterior part of the slap lesion. Mind you, we have to clear all the fibrous tissues on the surface of the glenoid and this is the knotless anchor sometimes we use because that provides us a better uh, picture and this is the posterior Wilmington portal that we take and then we fix the lesion. There is uh, a technique when there is a small slap and which needs to be repaired, we can take the Navassier portal whenever needed. So that portal will be showing during the workshop. So in the Navassier portal, how to go about, it's, it's in the triangle form at the arc of your clavicle and the acromion. And you can use uh, suture retrievers and only use the Navassier and the posterior portal to uh, repair the uh, smaller slab. If it is a bigger slab, you take a extra, extra uh, in a Wilmington portal. When and where to do tenodesis, in our technique, we clear everything, take up O'Brien's subdeltoid portal. When the labrum is uh, very bad and the tendon is degenerated, patient is more than 50, 50 plus, there's a uh, bucoid degeneration, fatty degeneration of the tendon. We do a tenotomy and a tenodesis. Uh, nowadays, we do total arthroscopic tenodesis uh, using two anchors. Once we clear in the glen uh, <coughs> glenohumeral area, we go in the O'Brien's por uh, portal, we do a panoramic release of the subdeltoid, remove the anterior uh, bursa and then refresh the area of the uh, biceps tendon in the groove, removing the sh partial sheath, near about three-fourths of the sheath we remove and then use two or three anchors to fix the uh, tenodesis of the biceps and uh, this is done 
where and when we feel the tendon is not worthy to be repaired and might be in the workshop we might show you what extra portal we take for repairing the tenodesis of the bad tendon. So, algorithm if you follow, uh, I guess everybody will agree is first to see the scapular dyskinesis. Uh, there is sometimes posterior minor tightness. I would like to ask the rehab guys what to do for that. Uh, definitely ligocaine, uh, PRP uh, has not worked much in the literature. We'll discuss in uh, a second now. And when it's an overhead athlete, especially ballers in our area and uh, badminton or uh, racket sports players, we need to think about repair. So what literature in 2022, 23, is discussing about middle-aged workers, middle-aged people because that is one grey zone which slap lesion has to be really considered as a surgeon in your clinic. And uh, again, we are left in doldrums because the literature is divided. Uh, what the AOS says, current concepts, now what we need to think about is uh, when it's an overhead athlete, what about 40 year old plus and uh, what is the success rate? What is the middle age patient's performance? There was no literature about uh, sexual dominance, uh, you know, male, female patient. There is no literature available. Whatever I could find out is a future prospects. We need to have a lot of level one studies, especially uh, from the stalwarts here, because I think one area where we are not thinking is about the biceptal tenodesis. What are the results? What are the long term follow up? Uh, might be any new uh, technology to see what is happening. Are they getting arthritic and whether to do a slap repair, tenodesis or only tenotomy. So uh, we'll go systematically. First is in overhead athletes, especially our ballers. If you see Park and uh, Ida et al, four authors from the US, the, it ranges from 38 to 63 percent. So no, none of the overhead athletes have gone back to full range of activities after a slap repair and which is, I think it's a food for thought. Uh, guys like Loglin and Steve Burkhart, even in their work, it was 67 to 70 percent. So we need to think whether uh, what is going to happen to an overhead athlete if he gets a isolated slap repair with a cuff. Second thing, only slap repair when people have done, there's a paucity of level one and level two studies. So we really don't know, uh, again, whether these patients might, uh, we, we can give false elevating success that, you know, we have repaired it well, but are they doing well? There was a systematic review by Golantra. Previous level players, out of 12 studies, five studies showed that 94% patients went back to the previous level performance. In the systematic review, uh, review, most but most of the other studies, only 70% patients have gone back to their uh, sport after slap repair, which is a thinkable thing and I think it's a debatable thing. And I would also like to have opinion of the panel what they would do because literature is not going for isolated slap repairs. Uh, now, bicep tenodesis, the again, the second part, 30 year old, 40 year old, 45 year old, Again, there is a big uh, difference in the uh, <coughs> level of return back to work and you know, the, you know there are a lot of uh, studies like DESA, Bolivia, the big workers in this field, they have reported 70 to 100 percent return to work after bicep tenodesis. So considering anatomy, conserving the anatomy, logically it feels slap repair is better, but the literature moves towards the bicepital tenodesis uh, in coming ages and but is this an appropriate option for the younger athletes especially throwers ballers there is no uh, consensus on that literature coming to biceps tenotomy yes uh, it's it's a minority patients most of this patient most of the literature what we read through the tenotomy was done with rotator cuff repair and especially uh, in when rotator cuff repair is done, the tenotomy uh, percentage has increased relatively to the slap repair. So 
return to work for the middle aged uh, there was an interesting uh, study from uh, the scandinavian country 140 150 days of sick leave is granted so is that level of disability after a slap repair should we really repair it should we leave it uh, and if you uh, consider patients from uh, scandinavia one year compensated pay can be uh, demanded not in the us but they can demand in the european scandinavian countries after a bicipital injury so is it is it the injury of a thumb or is it a ankle injury which uh, can be compared to this its uh, return to work is very long in in the literature at least and of course uh, complications there is uh, papers from europe and japan they have reported scapular nerve injuries they have seen uh, reported stiffness between repair and tenodesis overall stiffness is 5% more in the repair and despite commonly associating athletes of the slap uh, overall complication rate is 5% so again in advent uh, it <coughs> excessive tightening of biceps which i guess regular uh, surgeons like like roshan or armungam sir or sundarajan sir which what is adequate tightness and that depends on the result so what is adequate tightness and the literature say if it is adequately tight it is it is good but it depends on the tight of uh, the kind of knots you take so that again remains a debatable debatable issue and slap again remains in the gray zone and uh, rehab uh, might somebody might just uh, put a word on it and what what uh, we need is to balance the integrity the scapular kinesis uh at 3 weeks they have most of the authors have started glenohumeral range of movement 6 weeks strengthening of the cuff and then scapular stabilizers and 3 months sport specific exercise program depending on what the person uh, is trained to and uh, this is the regular rehab that we might follow first 1 to 4 the sling Uh, avoidance of excess, uh, you know, a, a extreme of abduction. Four to six weeks range of movement exercises, isometrics. Six to twelve weeks uh, functional programming. Nowadays, you know, functional programming is based on the sport you play. And twelve weeks plus strengthening, depending on your body weight, your body, your requirement for sport and your diet. So conclusion, uh, they are controversial. lesions but are common worst results are seen in bowlers baseball throwers pitchers overhead activities and in the past two decades at least surgeons have uh, you know gone a lot on the age uh, discussion is on the age and i think the question is open to the panel again what would everyone do in this and there are lot needed for uh, a comparative systematic randomized study on whether age has to be the consideration whether uh, biceps tenodesis has to be the consideration because nobody has known uh, or somebody might put a light on that at after a bicipital tenodesis or tenotomy what goes wrong with the joint inside so thank you i conclude the gray zone slap here <laughs> thank you thank you very much uh, dr yeah. ashish uh, yeah. elaborate extensive talk thank you yeah. so one question is uh, obviously with with all the literature uh, on slap uh, you know i am on the same platform yeah, right so now where you are so at <laughs> least you know for clinical use and for the you know even i would like to ask you know i was also interested after lead, uh, reading so we can be on the same side so you know, uh, i would like sir like uh, roshan so armungam sir, sir and yeah. sir what, what do you do in uh, slap in a in a non thrower non thrower 45 year old O'Brien's positive and a, he's in a, pain with the articular side surface oh. tear rotator cuff. No, 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 no rotator. Cuff. No, 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 no rotator cuff. Like, like in that is a different. Articular surface. Because most of the you cases that we saw with rotator cuff. In a in a forty five, if more than forty five, usually are associated. Ask you about isolated tear. Literature, sir. most of these guys have gone for a tenotomy. Yeah. Without rotator cuff. Seen uh, one isolated tear. Isolated. So mostly I will go for a tenodesis because it's an isolated tenodesis. tear. I don't do a repair. My repair mostly involved with whenever it's a lateral tear, where a posterior lateral tear, anterior lateral tear. Whenever you have a slab, 
always i try to do a repair whenever is associated with the cuff of course it's a age is age and activity level so you are in age based decision for you no no for the cuff 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 either do a tenotomy or tenodosis for that purpose yeah. no no repair at all, at all. Yes, I said isolated. I don't uh, do a repair because I don't. I, know, I don't remember. I done any isolated repair for last few years. Okay. So if it's an isolated slap tear uh, in a young patient, uh, less than 30, uh, and they come with uh, persistent pain, yeah. no rotator cuff involvement. What would be your line of management? Yeah, that's so it's very very rare. That's what I'm saying. Isolated yeah. uh, slap tear. You read that. When you have a 30 30 years old patient that comes like that. Whether that should be associated with some cyst, like which we Parallel. common scenario which I see Parallel. is a parallel Parallel cyst Parallel. with uh, extension into the slightly posterior uh, superior lesion. So that's why uh, commonly I see a slab with uh, cyst. So we do a decompression, do a repair very well. But isolated case very rarely you see in a very only slab uh, very rarely you see in a non-athlete also. So I don't see many so patients. I think like that's that. where the literature where well, there's so much uh, put in because in the US there's almost like 500 percent rise in the Yes. the last few years of slap repairs yeah. so that that again you know contributes to controversy and because the sports is not good after a repair that was yeah the results are also not uh, they're not happy they're not the returning back to sport so that means that either uh, you know overall the slap repairs are not a, a good procedure in at least in the at least when she previously they said that you were throwing for the repair is good yes but now but they now again the change so so now they are saying for throwing tenodesis is good so no, f- first thing you need to know why it happens isolated without any trauma it's because of uh, the posterior capsule tightness this is yeah. gard lesion so i think uh, if you see isolated it's always better you rehab the patient rehab with the scapular kinesis and not only scapular posterior, posterior capsule, capsule stretching, stretching and all the sleeper stretch and other things mm. so most of the pa- symptoms will get away with this you don't need to intervene okay. as sundar said uh, if you had additional cuff injuries or cysts then you need to rehab and then you may maybe you have to repair that so sir yeah. sir doing a tenodesis biceps tendon usually acts as a humeral head depressor it pushes the head down so wouldn't the biomechanics of a shoulder change when we do a tenotomy or a tenodesis a lateral so i'm doing it for a 20 years old and uh, doing it in a cuff in a older patients because we generally we see there are more degenerated many times when you see with the cuff tear there are already there also a rupture over there so i don't think it plays a major mechanical role in a less active older patients which are not doing any sports or something like that. so they are all coming with a degenerative tear with an acute traumatic tear so i don't think that is may going to any compromise whether doing a tenotomy or a tenodesis if you ask the 20 years old patients where they do a dos procedure then really i don't have answer there we are worried about it but in older patient i don't mind in doing a tenotomy tenodesis and my number of tenotomy tenodesis also very less with cuff tear unless it's a very degenerative very very degenerative or it's a subluxed with the subscapular tear then i do a tenotomy or a tenodesis otherwise it's very sup- common supra infra tear if the biceps is good if it is in a groove i don't disturb at all i don't do a tenotomy tenodesis tenodesis is a routine procedure i never do thank you sir okay thank you bicep surgery mostly you do only for pain yeah. nothing to do with stability and uh, whatever you do bicep for biceps in a cuff injury is just for pain relief because main cause of pain in cuff is the biceps pathology if, uh, subluxation the or mechanics yeah. then even if you actually are tenodising it routinely subpectorally outside still the mechanics doesn't change significantly yes. so that essentially shows that uh, the biceps may not play a very very significant role in the biomechanics itself so anyway thank okay. you very much uh, doctor uh, so we'll um, conclude this session but now we'll move on to life surgery yeah. Yeah. Uh, the life surgery is getting uh, delayed seems okay. so we'll start with the first rehab talk palni please come so i would like uh, to invite uh, dr sundarajan sir and palni rajan sir to chair this session so we'll go ahead with the Uh, shoulder re- instability re- rehabilitation so i would like to call upon anand jadhav sir uh, to present on uh, functional shoulder instability concepts so once the live surgery is ready we'll move on to it okay the team is ready so we'll move on with the live surgery Hello Karthik 
can you hear me yeah yeah we can hear you very well okay uh, me and bupesh are here okay. we just made the portals uh, blunt kudu i'm viewing from the antro superior portal now okay and uh, this is the posterior labrum are you able to see the pictures yes yes we could see very well kartik go ahead okay and uh, that's the hill sack not a big hill sack is it okay yes. yeah very small superficial sure. a very small hill sack post labrum little fraying is there uh, you don't have one more mic for bupesh eh? bupesh shaver yeah can you uh, update about the history sorry uh, kati yep. can you talk show the, the show the show the presentation kya karna hai hold this hold this can somebody talk orally about the case so uh, so this is a go ahead next slide yeah 23 year old male basketball player history of fall from two wheeler injury to right shoulder not able to lift weight overhead activities restricted anti apprehension positive obrain positive beaten is 9 by 9 we got a hyperlax guy but that's his shoulder x notation shoulder x notation is not much Egg. elbow on table is only 80 degrees so his shoulder is not lax that's his x ray that's his mri so i'm making the presentation from my um, camera screen actually okay. so th this system this uh, 7k system you can present and i can just move my hand and do the uh, movement of the things uh, slides so, and that's uh, next one go back go back previous slide previous slide so you can see there is a suspicion of some posterior uh, labral injury so we were wondering if there is a posterior labral injury we will repair that also uh, so back to so do you agree with the plan of arthroscopy bank cut repair here so it's a first time dislocation uh, this uh, dislocation happened in march after that there have been three four episodes so does she does the patient have any stiff stiff shoulder usually when you have a one month old injury repeated uh, dislocation uh, pre op the movements are good full moments moments are full he has been playing uh, he is a basketball coach works in a school okay he has been playing and he has been dislocating again and again okay i think the history uh, of uh, dislocation only happening in march is very unreliable i think that history was given for insurance reasons uh, to me it looks like it was uh, that, is, that is the question i was about to ask <laughs> uh, yeah either <laughs> uh, change change the mode change this mode because one month you have a dislocation to go back to play it's not it is not possible it is possible yeah yeah so we uh, he we were trying for cashless and it didn't happen and that's how life surgery happened hope it is not recorded <laughs> hope no insurance guys here so i am working with a 7k system here so uh, kalyan is asking me to talk about, talk about the kalyana gunangal of this camera Uh, uh, looks like some slightly bri more camera. bright i think that should adjust the brightness Bright, brightness is a little bro more. please yeah. it's too bright there yeah, huh. yeah correct pro pro please pro bar uh, blunt or something now it is okay welcome shiva nama clicking has come from shoulder surgeon so so what do you think about this posterior labrum i think it's torn you can see it's yeah. uh, completely moving and um, it looks like a old tear i don't know because you see the glenoid margin yeah definitely looks like a old tear it's like a very old tear you can see sir it's not a very small hill sack it's irregular margins yes will you, uh, uh, how many will do a remplissage on this no no can you show us the uh, anterior part ah uh, uh, yeah coming there lift up sanjeev yeah. just lift up a little bit so it's, it's so going to be so, like a pan labral tear i want so it's not too, it's not too bad the capsule quality is good the labral quality is good but definitely it's a tear and uh, it is uh, yeah it's a pan labral tear yeah, can you show the uh, slab yeah, i think it's biceps it's a pan labral tear Three yeah seconds. so we start we start from here 
we will join you tomorrow morning i start from here and hand it over to bubesh and i come to auditorium <laughs> <laughs> wise decision <laughs> all right so what will be the sequence of repair here uh, so anybody for remplissage no okay no uh, needle please uh, uh, needle yeah if not in this case in this case in this case uh, it's a, basically it's a pan labral yeah. tear that's why it's would very you, that's why it's very unstable would you prefer anterior uh, stabilization first or posterior stabilization first this is actually typical in uh, patients who are having ligament laxity they will correct. not have a big uh, heel sac correct they will have circumferential labral tear very small heel sac and uh, you start your uh, anchor fixation from posteriorly yes. this is the case uh, you know, in my talk also yeah. i mentioned yeah. who has got a subluxation dislocation with less degrees of abduction if you are ruling out the bony bank card yeah, yeah, to mm kv 3 mm kv or a pan labral tear mri may not show sir is it uh, needed to do a complete capsular plication along with uh, no 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 because of the because of the uh, ligament laxity because the ligament laxity, laxity. no if you if, uh, don't have a labral tear ma kevir kudu ma it's a long kevir long wait this patient had ah, a traumatic kevir settle the kevir ready kevir traumatic dislocation followed with the pan labral tear the patient is have a trivial injury trivial injury with laxity definitely reduce the volume by doing huh? the capsulo labral and uh, 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 in this case if you do uh, a post traumatic pan labral tear when you repair Anchor the whole tissue, tissue itself right. anteriorly you are going to do a anyway capsulo labral like deconstruction uh, when you do an anterior repair here you may take a, some capsule and do a re, uh, reconstruction posteriorly right. you don't need to do that and you have to do a slap repair also so almost 360 degree repair you require here written uh, score they told 9 by 9 yeah per is at least one by 9 But, yes, but the first dislocation happened after a fall it, it's not a spontaneous dislocation no? so Almost. if there is no labral tear patient still has subluxation or dislocation like apprehension then you have to do a capsular raphe if suppose labrum is torn then you you just repair so the labrum the, the problem Man is, is if you do a, again a capsular capsular also include everything this chance are going to make a more stiff shoulder So rehabilitation is going to be a bit to tougher is which is not required is because it's traumatic tear so can you see that from about 5:30 to 6:30 it is attached so i'm going to leave it okay. i'm going to elevate this and i'm going to elevate all of this put about two or three anchors at the back two or three in the front so uh so is that okay yes yeah, or would you or would you elevate the uh, attached central part not no no need because it's not uh, also lesion it just a uh, torn and displaced Yeah. So if you just repair the, all the displaced portion, it's more than enough. And uh, you want to do any special port portals for this? So I'm, I've just made the post lateral portal for the anchor passage. Okay. Uh, if you can see the outside camera, um, Aliyan boy, can you show the outside camera? Uh, wire good, long cable. Funny. Bupesh is taking over, and I'm just uh, running a live commentary. So you are able to mobilize the cuff, uh, sorry, labrum, no? Yeah. Another thing, whenever you have the pan labral tear, you will not have any displacement because you have the all around tear. It cannot displace posteriorly because your circle is intact. can you show the outside pictures for the portals yeah uh so uh, if you can see uh, we have made a posterior portal a standard posterior portal 1 cm inferior and medial then i just made a post lateral portal there for uh, so you can't put the this one can you focus that yes. oh you seen okay okay so all this uh, cameras are attached to the Uh, 7k monitor so we don't have any extra cameras all the cameras are from the monitor the, from the monitor itself the external cameras we have two okay there is one at the level of the surgeon switch that so in uh, with now you are seeing uh, a view of the surgeon operating you can see dr bubesh uh, elegantly not, elevating the labrum there karthi it's not and focused uh, the, the exterior cameras are not focused ah uh, exterior camera is little zoomed has, out has actually yeah. 
blood. And uh, uh, the other camera on top, you can see there. Can you zoom in? Is it possible to zoom in there? Zoom in. So there, I'm not sure if you can see. I'm pointing to the posterolateral portal there. You know, we could see, but uh, do, don't you have any uh, hand hand camera with somebody's in control? No. No, no, no. We this. Hearing me. Because it's a fixed angle, fixed camera. You want to can, the, can the zoom it and the out that uh, the view it's which we are seeing? The bottom. La, de. No, I'm not going to show you. I'm not going to show you. I'm not going to show you. No, I'm not going to show you. We we can see now. We can see the postulateral portal, which Boop is trying to make it. So I'm just coming in with a small K wire there. So uh, I thought I did. This could be. This could be. Elevator could be. Various layers. So I have Dr. Arulan and then uh, the anesthetist, and uh, my uh, OT team is my OT team is helping helping me and. Uh, Yeah, at present we are not seeing anything. Just go to the inside camera. That's fine. I think they're trying to adjust the outside camera. Can I show inside at least? Now, now the post light will go through the cuff. We are not. போடுங்க <laughs> 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 So the elevation of the anterior labrum is done, and uh, now we are trying to elevate the posterior labrum. We are making the postlateral portal. Okay. Uh, normally, I don't come in with the blunt through the postlateral portal, but uh, uh, I I just use it as a percutaneous portal. But uh, Dr. Bupe says it will heal. It is through the cuff. It's the port of Wilmington. So because uh, sure. because you require at least two three on the posterior side. Yeah, we can use a candle so that it easy for you. Your job will be easier. Fluid, pa? Can I get wire? Could I? Your plan is right to do a course. first posterior level repair and coming. Yeah. Th then you are coming. Plan is to do posterior, superior to inferior, and then uh, right. left, left. And then uh, from inferior to superior, uh, anterior labrum. Okay. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see if we can. Kartik, Karthi, you are using so, pump. Are you using pump? I am using, sir. I am. I am. Uh, I have been compelled to use the pump. Normally, I don't use pump for bank card. For mm -hmm. me. So posteriorly, if you want to come in with a lasso, you cannot uh, use a 6 mm cannula. You have to use a bigger cannula. Uh, so I have taken the cannula out. Still, still 25 degree will go. The posterior aspect.
ఆర్ ఈ కమింగ్ త్రూ ద క్యాండలో ఆర్ జస్ట్ పోస్ట్ లెటర్ పోర్టల్ కార్తీక్ సార్ ఆర్ యూసింగ్ ద లెసో త్రూ క్యానులో ఆర్ జస్ట్ త్రూ ద పోర్టల్ జస్ట్ జస్ట్ పర్కటీనియస్ పర్కటీనియస్ పోర్టల్ so this is around 9 o'clock 10 o'clock one left panni so you are seeing through the antro superior portal working through the post lateral and your social management will be antro inferior portal isn't it ఫిక్సేషన్ which is uh, postro lat- lateral or something so that you can have the same angulation for uh, taking the bites is using the yeah, that's that's the, that's what we are using sir. okay percutaneously is using the postro lateral portal and uh, taking the genital wire through the antro pull inferior it, uh, portal pull the genital pull the genital wire a little bit yes so i park the genital wire on the other side it right i'm going to come with the anchor uh, candle now the i'm going to use the ceronic anchor naturally you have to today Girl. ceronic sound ke camera పోడుంగ పోడుంగ అప్పుడు అవన కీళ్ళ ఎన్నో నడుతు మాలట్ జస్ట్ మాలట్ ప్లీజ్ భూపేష్ వెరీ యూస్ టు దిస్ డ్రిల్ వర్కన్ ప్లయర్ కొడుమా give me the straight can, can straight handle straight handle ruka huh? ha ah. kartik do ceronics have curved handle yeah i'm using that sir right now 
flexible. But there, there is, you, you have to be very careful with curved handle. If you rotate it, then uh, everything will become a mess. So yeah, that's what they are. The, the most important I'm just thing with uh, curved candle just give is the normal you handle, no? the position, normal. rotation. Uh. Hey, now we set open. போது <laughs> just to keep the nitinel loop not yeah yeah i can yeah uh, out uh, it is just trying to stay oh, say one step sir i'll show you okay okay that's low bone is so hard or okay right okay excellent i think the bone is extremely hard and uh, because it's a close meeting i think i can say i think even depew gets the sanker only from sironix correct so correct, correct. they are nodding their head pass to pass to you pass to you good anchors a good uh, subcontrol purchase they get so the pull out strength is actually good marat marat pa in depu do the change the get at ikla ma get kele at ikla ma hand la kele tapi sometimes the purchase is so good that the handle also doesn't come puch retriever when the handle tip i think has a small uh, some steel ball like thing so you have to be spot on to remove that through the cannula so that uh, steel ball was the previous version oh. now they don't have that centralizing uh, ball sir oh okay now this is uh, typically the a curved the different anchor. lift up a little bit lift up the camera light source adjustment is a little tricky so oh. you can <laughs> my my such you can use a small grasper because uh, always is very difficult to hold it with this you can you took it two steps sometimes will be easier So threads are in the postal lateral portal. 
So one thread is in the uh, the byte was taken from the post lateral portal. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, posterior portal. The anchor was put from the post lateral portal. So we got so post lateral portal or the post superior portal because the anchor which directed you coming through looks like post superior. Are you using the cannula now for the knot tying? Uh, no, I'm just trying to. Oh, yeah. Water. Sir, we are having a small uh, technical problem. The uh, rocker sheath is uh, open and then the saline is not coming in. Oh. Uh, now mm -hmm. we have kind of uh, sorted it out. Pretty well. That's why we were having bad view. Uh. And there is not distending the uh, shoulder. Yes. Now, yeah. it's, now it's better, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Arthik is planning a virtual cannula, so he will uh, retrieve both the sutures. Why is it not? Uh, fluid is coming. Ah, open money. Ah, open money. So he is pulling both out together okay. so that it becomes a virtual cannula. So this is the post and this is the... Hmm. Not pottering, no bite at the lama. Pottering, sir, pot. You are putting a sliding knot or a simple knot? Yeah, Bhupesh is putting a sliding knot. What knot is it? Not, sir. I don't know names, <laughs> sir. It's the lighting cutting lamp. We can, we can show it in the knot tying workshop. Yeah. So, this is a but, very simple knot. But, I think it's called the Nikki's knot. Bupes, so, one, two, Bupes, and three, sir. Bupes, uh, yes, sir. The sliding knot, yes, sir. When, you are, when you are using a metal or a bio anchor, uh, is different from uh, using a sliding knot in a all suture, suture anchor. anchor because. Uh, there is every chance that uh, suture may become loose or sometimes when you pull. Does it happen? Yes, sir. sir yes, sir. So, the trick is uh -huh. we have to bring the suture bunched up to the subchondral bone mm -hmm. before knot tying process. Mm -hmm. So, we pull the suture immediately after deployment mm -hmm. and then make sure that there is no more elasticity in the suture. It cannot come more further. Okay, okay. Yeah. Type. Yeah, the, the suture no, anchor. Fast pointing. When you slide again, no, there is a, because it's a bunched. Uh, but it's locked. Yeah, yeah. it's locked. It should not come out. Technically, yeah. it should not come out. Come out, yeah. If it is coming out, whether your deployment is uh, there wrong is always position. a risk uh, in, when you use. A yeah, yeah, I accept, anchor. sir. I accept. Now, what Bhupesh uh, said is the correct point. Yeah. When you put another put all suture anchor, always pull it and uh, tighten lock, it, tighten yeah. it and lock it before you do the sliding knot. Because the slide so goes through the bunch. Yeah. There is always a chance. Bow. So I always prefer to use a simple knot in uh, all sutures. But if you use a but metal or uh, you use a bio, you can use a sliding knot. Yeah, but if it, is the, if it is locked, there is no issue. I am using only sliding yeah. knots. Cutter, cutter, good ma. Parval, good ma. No problem. Ma, same process. Repeat. Kudu, kudu, kudu. Is it good? Good enough. Okay. That's fine. All good. Okay. So, quick, quick, let's. So, any questions, doubts? So ready. when you when you take the next uh, bite, uh, will it not uh, uh, put strain on this suture? Yeah, yeah. So that's exactly what uh, I uh, I told uh, Bupesh. And uh, mm. actually, I don't tie it until the end of it. But uh, um, we have actually Bupesh, gone. Bupesh is an expert, so he can. Uh, yeah. So yeah, he have, will. Uh, we'll see his technique. Uh, you just have to be extremely uh. careful in uh, put, taking the bite. Yes. Without ah. violation. Posterior labrum because we have to only, like uh, what we saw in Sundasa has passed today, we are only going to take the labral tissue. Okay. We don't have to do a lot of capsular application, so it really doesn't matter. Okay. So go ahead, go ahead. So, uh, 
with the curved cannula the with the curved uh, curved cannula i think it you have to be very particular in how you hold the how you hold it now the do you have a laser mark in that to see that if it, does, yes, it doesn't sir. rotate oh that's right right fantastic there is a laser mark outside okay. which is showing us the direction in which we have to hold it yeah 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 you have a laser mark through which we have to align the anchor okay yeah that's more more important yeah right 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 inga kai edunga paakala po da avladan so the su- the sutures are now parked in the posterior lateral portal we have come through the posterior lateral portal for making for putting this uh, anchor yeah. uh, for the for the simple reason that uh, you will not get the angle if you use the posterior portal correct sir this is the you point go. you are saying now we have deployed and <laughs> we did not get a good hold in there so uh, now so we we, we actually get before we actually checked it that's a great thing luckily check it kartik take two yeah that's life surgery so this is good for youngsters that they have to be very careful with all future anchors i'm not tying the knot it's good we check it now yeah that's what happens like now when you slide there is every chance that the, it may pull out better to use the straight angle normal uh, do the have that or only is it no. they are they are not having it anyway mallet mallet please that means you just no, I think we, uh, use a mallet to keep right, it in position yeah. yeah yeah okay drill i just want to make one comment here when you whenever you are using soft tissue anchor if you look at the insertion assembly carefully ah pong pakla heading heading for our line clip and this soft tissue anchor is held on to it if you knock too hard and the prongs huh? of that metal they spread your suture will never get hold it will always come out so i think the other thing is when the exchange happens when your drill comes out pardon, pardon. the sleeve has to be spot on it cannot move na kai edin adding adding moment and you are gone especially in the curved one I, right, I, right, right, right. i have pardon, wasted pardon. four anchors sironix day one uh, uh, <laughs> i have done namaskar it is the way you hammer also it has to be extremely gentle the cycle it first cycle panninga pull panna venda the cycle ah ipo edinga so now we are pulling the patient and the patient is moving we, we lost the picture is it online uh, online and the relay not cable no hmm? the online now oh, okay that's why it's getting it putting it in another one this is risky if there is no cable it's risky interpreter the wheel come nahi kar raha wheel is not working Are 
live again? Yeah, yeah, we are live. Sir, so now the good things when happened you couldn't see. Now <laughs> nicely checked it. It is not coming and then the deployment also happened. The anchor coming out. Now Karthik is using a clever hook client for a uh, uh, instrument. Because uh, as discussed here, only we have to take a little bit of the labrum. No need to do capsular application. I am taking a bit of the PIGHL as well. Yeah. Like how Dr. Uh, Roshan sir said he will do. Do you use this device or do you use the lasso all the time or uh, today you are using this? Uh, for the posterior labrum sometimes I use the clever hook and for the 3 o'clock position the last anchor I sometimes use the hook. The good thing about the retrograde suture passer is uh, one step. You don't need to do several steps. Again, mm. uh, yeah, sometimes because the problem is when you have an anterior labral tear always you are completely separated. But no, posterior labrum tear, tear always taking a trick is a trick always uh, because it's supposed to have attachment only labrum is there. So, so you use a clever loop it's still a big instrument. Yeah, you, you may damage the you may damage the labrum bone and cartilage. <laughs> yeah, we have to be very careful yeah, when we use the use clever the shuttling technique. Uh, so this is a Australian knot. West, this is a Western knot. Uh, no, no, this is from. Uh, is modified Western or? This is a Western. The Western knot is from US only. It's uh, supposed to be a middle locking knot. It locks in the middle. So again, I'm using a locking knot. Uh, good, very good uh, protection. So that's the past pointing. So a lot of times, you know, we get a good feeling. I mean, this is more like, you know, we repair the tissue, but we feel that there is a bumper like tissue that is, it's a visual feeling that, you know, it's a more satisfying huh? effect. Do you think that has got a relevance to, uh, I mean, you know, uh, clinical. See, for example, uh, uh, repairing it to the edge, uh, it doesn't give you uh, the uh, same, uh, uh, you know, really good feeling that you actually uh, repaired it uh, good enough. Uh, I think we're not learning. 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 It's called Nikki's loop. Then it will bring all the tissue back and over the glenoid edge. Share room. All right, I think we are done with the posterior repair. Okay. And uh, <laughs> the thing is, no, no, Sandhya, always posterior side, you, do, you don't want a bump, bumper. So you just repair the labrum, that is good enough to do the repair. Anteriorly, always you take an extra capsule around 5, 5 mm or a 10 mm, so that gives you the bumper effect. So, so this patient. Anterior bumper effect is good, but posteriorly, you don't require that. Only labral repair is more than enough. Uh, yeah. This patient had a 9 by 9 baton. So, uh, so we've just uh, tightened the capsule a little bit there. Okay. Anterior release has been done already. So, we'll go ahead with suture passage and... Uh, so, so, bumper effect is only a feeling. So, what is important is for IGHL and capsular shift. So, if you do that perfectly, then it's a, it works well. So, bumper effect is just a feeling. Yeah. Always it gives a perfect because always it pushes the capsule over the labrum. So. Because uh, the reason why um, people uh, or a lot of people prefer putting it more on the face is that uh, that gives more one on the uh, one shift. Sir. Second thing is uh, probably it, it gives you a better feel that you Blunt are you're repairing Blunt. a lot of tissue back onto the bone because you know there is a bigger chunk of tissue that you actually take and you feel. So, but actually so the labrum is on the edge, isn't it? Labrum is on the edge right. and uh, the IGHL along with the labrum is what you are repairing and the shift actually happens from inferior to uh, superior direction, not actually from lateral to medial, no sir. Uh, that's yeah. Yeah, I agree, yeah. I agree. But the chance of when you are putting anchor on the more on the junction, the, also, the failure chances are more. 
especially your angle is your angle is right side kudunga adu kudunga kudunga your angle is not correct again they especially this kind of all suture anger the chance of dilate dilate reporter so better to put the anchor in the face of the glenoid so to prevent that complication also but don't not too far away just 2 to 3 mm put the post up put the post up outside outside coffee is available whoever wants to have a pick up coffee and we can bring it inside i think we can uh, you, you want to see the entire thing or uh, <laughs> shall we put one anchor and then we'll we can go ahead with the rehab uh, because we got a very exciting rehab session uh we'll maybe put one or two anchors and then we'll uh, go yeah. to the rehab session now you uh, can you lift you up you show first bite <laughs> yeah. and uh, then we can move on to rehab So Dr. Sanjeev was doing a great job in showing that uh, six o'clock. So that's our anchor there from the back. That's the tear, uh, torn end. So this is uh, rotating 360 degree, ma. Ma, this is rotating, ma. They're putting all this. This is the one place which uh, I always recommend to do a postal lateral to come through the postal lateral with the opposite side less. So easy to take the bite at seven o'clock position rather than struggling from antero inferior going and coming like this. It is not easy. And the postal lateral is very easy to take. La, the form at angle. Ag da. Pass, pass, mini. Yeah, you can use the uh, anti-grade device. That's what Dr. Leonard is suggesting. Where you can use a scorpion or a first pass mini. That also, okay. yeah. who is doing bupesh or karthik who is doing the case now both of us are doing i am actually taking the bite and uh, so why why don't you come from the postal lateral portal you are used to me I, I i can do that i am we are yeah. just trying to find out the lassu there hmm because uh, <laughs> as a lassu irukama so more left side lassu kudunga ada left lassu vechirundathu kudunga ma ipa kaiyila onnu vechirundinga la left Doctor, you are not suggesting to use the first pass mini. First pass mini, ah, uh, mm. I've never used it actually. Huh? The lefter can parang the lefter. Why are you posting or use parang? Left side, uh, lassu. We are just. Uh, illa neenga postal lateral portal la vandu opposite side lesser use panna so easy to take ah that's what you are trying to get sir okay. the opposite side lesser okay thank you always the live surgery getting a surprise uh, getting a surprise like this is uh, always surprise surprise only, only yeah. i know you expect a simple bank cut then you go and end up with the pan lateral நூல்ட்ரிக்ஸ்ட்ரி ஸ்பேஸ் So ah, always okay. ask them to Fantastic. release the traction. Upesh is a life saver. Okay. Put it in. Relax. Put it in. Relax. It will be a bit of a struggle to get the yeah, anyway. suture shuttling going on because we have closed the posterior side. Yeah. Anyway, we, will, will, anyway we could see the bite already. You are attacking the bite. 
புடிச்சுக்கோமா can we go right. ahead for rehab tag one one or two anchor one anchor we'll put we'll show the lower most anchor and then we can go for the talk okay and then we'll show the final outcome okay so we'll wait for this anchor ning podunga ning ho podu You are using a curved uh, sleeve, no? This what? is a curved, so we are... What, what is the we angle? Don't... You have only fixed angle or you have variable different uh, uh, sleeves? This is 25 degrees, sir. This is 25, okay. Yeah, my... Uh, rotate correct, it's reverse. Yeah, you're going to see it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Stop. Done. அடிங்க அடிங்க ஆ கை அடிங்க கை அடிங்க 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 அடிச்சிருங்க அடிச்சிருங்க அடிங்க அடிங்க ரைட் 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 ஃப்ரீயா போடுவோம் போடலாங்க <laughs> we are trying to go for a bigger anchor okay you can go a bit deeper also 1.8 double loaded yes sir bupesh sir we, we asked only for the talk you are doing you are showing very good life intra complications how to avoid how to cap how it happened how to konje drill pannu konje drill pannu it's a good it's a good it's good that it happens like you can know when you have to do what happens what happens what you do 
என்ன கொஞ்சம் பண்ணணுமா கவுண்டர் கொடுங்க கவுண்டர் கொடுங்க ட்ரில் ட்ரில் சைக்கிள் பண்ணிக்கங்க ரெண்டு அப்படி ரிட்ரீவா சோ விகார் டபுள் லோடட் ஆங்கர் இன் நவ Karthik, you can slide and see if it is uh, fit. Sir, we, we are sliding, sir. Yeah. It is now oh, stable. No, yeah, good. I am sliding now. You can see that. Okay, okay. It is stable. Okay. So, what we did to prevent lapses, okay. we changed the angle of the guide. From the curved uh, guide, we went to the straight guide. So, that the drill will be in a different angle, number one. Okay. Number two, we went for a bigger size anchor. From 1.5, we went for 1.8 anchor. Okay, that's a good... Uh, good, uh, good uh, two things we changed. One is the angle of the guide and size of the anchor. anchor. To prevent okay. a recurrence. Oh, okay. okay. Good. Yeah, it's a good one. I'm going to move on. Yeah, I'm going to move on. No, I want to take... क्यों क्या हुआ? I have to, I want to take this one also together. We, we lost the picture. मर्डर ढंडा स्टेप तो बना ना। लेकिन मैचिंग है ना? रास्कल Karthi, sir, we lost the connection. Uh, we, we just, I uh, will uh, just show this and then we are. Yeah. Sir, one minute, sir, we are reconnecting because uh, the internet is getting delayed, sir. In one minute, we will get. You got it? Yeah, yeah. We are, we are able to see the picture, well. The thumb rule is to have only one pair of hands. sutures through one cannula while we are tying the knot so yes, yes. we are parking the other pair uh, if it is tr- troublesome because it's only live surgery we can use as many as, as anchors also you can take out one thread out <laughs> sir in uh, all suture anchors alone removing one thread is disastrous sir <laughs> so the bunching effect changes yeah uh, like panel sir sir same reasons yeah, okay in all suture alone uh, mm-hmm. uh, removing is really disastrous because we need that bunching effect to not change so i'm not using it and uh, karthik wants to show your postal lateral portal uh, opposite uh, lazo retriever double or portal try pani le le try pani kya போட்டுக்கலாம்ட் சைட் கிடைச்சிருச்சா இது ஒர்க் பண்ணுதா பிடிச்சுக்கும் 
now it is very difficult because uh, hmm? lift up a little bit let me see if you possible we can because it's too tight now We need a uh, boo page to push this. You could be putting it now. Under and the either. Ah, fantastic. Good. So, we have used uh, what Dr. Sundarajan suggested. We've come from the opposite side, taken a bite. Yes, <clears throat> we could see and, it. And uh, you could see it is so, it was so easy. It was yes. so yeah. straightforward. A nice tip. So now we could do two things, whether we could actually do a mattress stitch with that uh, first pair or we can do a two simple. So we will do two simple retriever. Okay, retriever. So it's expected complication. In uh, always a double loaded. Yeah. So we should not tighten up when the pull out. We should not tighten up. Always this. Yeah. You have to be very careful that you should not take the suture out. So we got. Uh, yeah. The other pair out. Yes. Yeah, we'll good. tie this and then we'll tie that. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Once we tie this, I think you can go back to the uh, talks. Yeah. Do you want to tie that first? This one. IG is behind. It's lower. So I'll cut it in. Cut it in. Cut it in. So that's the post. The yeah. post is on the labral side. Okay. The sliding limb is on the bone side. Okay. So, I think the second suture you should use only a simple knot because it gets tangled inside this. Yes, yes, yes. But it will look like that, but when you pull it out, mm -hmm. always it will slide very well. You don't need to worry about it. Yeah. I always use the double loaded. You can. Basketball coach. Ah, fantastic. Excellent. Another trick. Huh? Good bumper effect. Yeah, you got. Me and uh, Bhupesh are uh, super excited uh, because we have the guidance of all the seniors. Hey, Bhupesh. <laughs> yeah, you are doing excellently well with this. All these complications you are making, all the no, you are coming out so easily and smoothly. The sound care looks nice, very nice. Yeah, the, the resolution clarity. is wonderful. Yeah, the clarity, sound clarity is good. Yeah, once we. Once we start using this, then we might not like the smaller TVs. Uh, is it donated to you? <laughs> I'm asking for one, but uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> what is the cost, Karthi? This cost is highly individualized, sir. <laughs> <laughs> no, what is your cost? It is like treatment of instability. <laughs> what is the size of the monitor? <laughs> 43 inches. 43. Okay. 43 inches. It's unbelievable. It's uh, yeah, the view. It's, it's what like we see here is just uh, unbelievable. Actually. Small home theater. 
Retriever. Just lift up a little bit, just one minute, and then we are done. Good. Sir, you can go for the talks. Ah, yeah, I think you can go for the talk, sir. We got one or two more anchors to go. Okay. And then we'll join you. Okay, so we'll come uh, back to you. Once you finish it, tell us. We'll come back to you. Ah, okay. Thank you, Karthik. Excellent job. We'll come back. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Dr. Anand Yadav. Good afternoon. My talk is going to be on functional instability. We have had an exciting day so far. You have seen everything that can be seen in instability. So it's a common problem. Post-traumatic cases have been shown so far. Anterior dislocations, anterior inferior dislocations, posterior dislocations. And we know about the classical lesions that are seen in a post-traumatic shoulder instability. When it comes to classification of shoulder instability, there is a Thomas and Matson classification, Tubbs and Ambry, but it still doesn't cover the entire spectrum of instability that we see in a clinical practice. Now, the Stanmore classification has three poles, traumatic structural, which is the commonest, then there's a traumatic which causes structural deformities and type 3 is because of abnormality of muscle behavior and it doesn't have structural deformities so type 1 is classical post traumatic with structural deformities type 2 is having generalized laxity but it may also have structural defects. By structural defects, I mean bank art or hill sacs or capsular laxities. Type 3 is due to loss of muscle control and abnormal movement patterns without structural defects. And this type 3 is the one which is also called as functional instability. Now, as, as you can see in this, the pathologies can coexist and the patient can migrate from one group to another. So, Philip Morador has made an attempt to classify this sh functional shoulder instability. Now, my aim is just to give you a concept or because this is a fairly new concept about a problem where we don't have fixed solutions so far. Shoulder instability, which is caused by pathological muscle activation pattern without structural defect, that is called as functional shoulder instability. It was previously known as voluntary shoulder instability. As per Moroder, the functional shoulder instability has two types, positional and non-positional. Again, each is divided into controllable where the patient can control his activities and non-controllable. So let's look at each of these. In the positional, as the name indicates, the shoulder dislocates or subluxes 
during certain movements of the arm. In a non-positional one, the shoulder will either subluxate or dislocate with the arm in neutral or near neutral position, but it subluxates because of abnormal muscle contraction. So that, that is a major distinction between positional and non-positional functional instability. So we've just seen that this dislocation will occur when the arm is in certain position. As soon as the arm is taken out of that position, the shoulder will relocate. Now, in positional, there is a controllable functional instability where the subluxation or dislocation caused is voluntary with certain movement. So the patient can control that. So because the patient can control it, there's hardly any discomfort or functional impairment. The patient can do things at will. The non-controllable component of the functional shoulder instability is caused involuntarily during movements of the arm. Because it's involuntary, patient has no control on it, the functional impairment can be quite serious. There can be a lot of pain and discomfort. And the patient has no control, so he cannot suppress it. Common pattern is posterior functional instability that is noted during horizontal flexion and internal rotation. So for this, if you watch carefully, you'll see the head subluxing in the posterior direction. And as soon as the arm is taken out of that position, the joint will relocate. If you're careful, you'll pick up these things. That's why you, whenever you examine any patient of shoulder instability, it is very important to go into the history and the physical examination before you jump on to looking at the MRI films. The posterior instability is caused because of hypoactivity of the posterior curve, the infraspinatus and the teres minor muscles. The positional non-controllable, this can be a little bit confusing, but it, it, it will make sense at the end of it. There is an anterior positional functional instability, which is seen in the ABAR position. The head will slide down into the axilla. As soon as the arm comes into the adduction and internal rotation or neutral position, it will settle down. And why does the anterior functional instability occur? Because of hypoactivity of the subscapularis muscle. Again, non-positional. So, patient is not in control of the actions. It is not caused by the movement of the arm, but it's caused by abnormal or pathological muscle contractions leading to temporary dislocation of the U humeral head. Non-position can be controllable, so no functional impairment, patient may not complain too much about it. But if it's non-controllable, non-positional, and that is what causes a lot of pain to the patient. And these incidences can keep happening again and again. So what is the incidence of this? A positional functional instability is more common. The uncontrollable one is more common than the non-controllable one. Posterior instability is more common in that group. And in non-positional, the incidence is 22 percent. Anterior and anterior inferior instability most common in this group. Overall, when you're dealing with FSI, you'll see more patients who have posterior instability than anterior instability. And there'll be a minor group which has multidirectional instability. Now, each of these can be very confusing. So, this particular concept of functional instability is where muscle patterns are responsible for patients' actions. 
So how will this patient present to you? Pain in the shoulder region, especially along the long head of biceps. Sometimes the pain can be pretty diffuse all the way from the arm to the hand. And if it's left side, then you have to bear in mind to rule out any cardiac pathology also. The patient may not have confidence in his own movements. Sometimes even in sleep, the shoulder can dislocate. Quite often, because this condition happens in adolescents, the parents may bring the patient to your OPD. The child may have missed school or not taking part in school activities. Slightly older pe people think they are having some God-gifted ability, so they can dislocate their shoulder at will. So this considered as an attention-seeking maneuver. Or the patient may feel proud about it. And sometimes patient will present with a frank dislocation, which is difficult to reduce or relocate on its own. In the morning, we saw Dr. Ledman talking about how the brain gets affected because of instability. And that's extremely true, especially in this particular group of patients. The patients will develop involuntary habitual muscle patterns due to abnormal recruitments, general muscle deconditioning, avoidance of movements. This may cause psychosocial issues, or sometimes the psychosocial issues may bring on this instability. And because the patient presents to you in a funny manner, not the, your typical post-traumatic instability patient, you also start judging the patient. You think he may be a nut, but he may not be a nut. He's coming with genuine problem. And it's quite common for such people to present to casualty departments with multiple episodes of dislocation. So as soon as the patient comes, the staff knows, yeah, wapas a gaya. So how do we go about assessing a patient? These will generally be younger patients, may present in adolescent age. History is, will be very vague. That's why the history taking has to be very, very critical. You may not be able to gauge the exact onset of time or when the symptom started or what caused that symptom. So for me, when, whenever a patient comes with dislocation, irrespective of what reason he has, I always harp upon the first episode. What caused the first episode? What were the symptoms? How was it managed? So with FSI, minor injury can cause structural deformities. So when we talk about laxity and instability, we have to bear in mind laxity is a clinical sign and instability is a symptom. So if a patient has presented repeatedly, you have to go back into the history, ask about previous treatment and the response to that previous treatment. So when you're seeing such patients in your busy OPD, you need to give a lot of time to such patients. And you can't hurry them up. You have to have a proper exposure of the patient's shoulders. Only then you can pick up subtle signs. So in males, you can expose them up to the waist. In females, you must have special gowns in the OPD so that the front is covered, the back gets exposed, and you're able to carefully examine and assess the patient. And you do the usual examinations. So what are those? You're watching for the scapular prominences, protraction, any stretch marks in the axillary region, sulcus signs. You check for stability in different arm positions, measure the beaten scores and document it. And also assess the scapular thoracic rhythm and check for scapular dyskinesia. These patients, because of their certain peculiar position, will have lumbar hyperlordosis and even thoracic kyphoscoliosis. It's important that every time the patient presents to you, you document all the findings and keep track of those findings at subsequent follow-ups. How would you go about investigating? You do the usual stuff. You do simple x-rays. Most of this will be normal. A new concept which Philip Mordor has 
proposed is a dynamic shoulder fluoroscopy under CM. Rarely we'll need a MRI scan, but if a person is presenting to you repeatedly, then MRI becomes necessary. CT scans, if this patient with a functional shoulder instability, if he has had a fall, then you're forced to get further investigations. And where neurological issues are suspected, then you can also get EMG and nerve conduction studies done. So this is again image from Morado's paper. Here you see posterior functional instability because of position. As soon as the arm is in adduction internal rotation, it, it sublux posteriorly, and as the arm comes into extension, it relocates. So that is the positional one on the left. On the right, it's non-positional. The shoulder is subluxating in the anterior direction. So this is a new concept which is there. You need to examine such patients under fluoroscopy oil in Siam. So when it comes to treatment, I think the most important thing is you assess them thoroughly and a lot of counseling needed because there is no fixed treatment which will give lasting relief to these patients. You have to have a multidisciplinary approach. It can't be a one-man show. You need an orthopod. You need a good physio. You need a good radiologist where needed. You need a psychiatrist or a counselor and an understanding supporting staff. So you have to counsel the patient that it will take time to respond. So patience is needed both on the part of the doctor as well as the patient. Doctor because he will get frustrated seeing the patient come frequently and patient will get frustrated because he has to come to the doctor frequently. So, so far we don't have any fixed guidelines, which will give us the best outcome. Having said that, shoulder physiotherapy and rehabilitation is the best way forward so far. But still, the success rate is 80%. So we are still missing out on a lot of patients. And we must warn those patients that it will take a long time, minimum three to six months and that too with an experienced physiotherapist. When we refer it to the specialist physiotherapist, they will use different modalities of treatment. I think we have a lecture following this one. Surgical intervention is almost never, but there may come a time where you patient with a functional shoulder instability develops structural deformities which are causing recurrent problems, then we have having to deal with those, then surgery will come in handy. So when there's failure to respond to conservative therapy and the symptoms are pretty bad, there are structural develop deformities which have developed, those are the patients where you can do your instability repair. And as we have seen, arthroscopic capsule application, shift, plus or minus rotator interval closure, I think beyond this it may not be required. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We'll uh, take up the question at the end because we could clearly show the functional and non-functional functional. Probably after the physio talk, we can know the how, what, how do they rehabilitate well, so before we go to the Heath talk, we'll go to the theater now. They have finished the surgery. Can you go to the theater? Yeah, the patient. Audio, audio is there. Video, please. Sir, can you hear us, sir? Yeah, we, yeah, we can see, we can see. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, okay, okay. okay, okay. We can uh, see. Sir, oh, sir, we can see. Okay. Anterior lateral repair. Okay. Inferior. Yes. And uh, this is the posterior lateral repair, sir. Okay. So, I think. What the happened to the lateral repair? We check the slap also. There is no slap. Okay. And the head is nicely centered now. 
Okay. Thank you, Bupesh. So wonderful surgery with uh, all these complications. You did a very good demo. Complication, complication. No, no. Thank you very much. No, that is Thanks very important. Much, very important because to see the complication and how you bail out. That yes, is most yes, important. It's not every time it's juicy when you do an operation. So we want to see all this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Well done. Well done. Thank you. Just ask him a question. How is he going to rehabilitate this patient? Sir? How is he going to rehabilitate? Karthi? I think you will ask when you come here, sir. We move on to the next talk. Ahit uh, Matthews. Okay, okay. Is there? Okay. Yeah, but he told me. Uh, Milin, sir. Yeah, sir. Good evening. How are you, sir? I am good, Sundar. Nice we, to see you. <laughs> we miss you here. <laughs> I know, I know. A lot of compulsion, so I couldn't come, actually. Okay, I understood. <laughs> sir, we'll come back to you, sir, after your Heath talks. No worries, no Thank worries. Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, Saranax, uh, uh, Dr. K uh, Casey, uh, KS, thank you very much for inviting me over here to talk to you a little bit about uh, what's very passionate to me, which is this whole concept of biomechanics and rehab. Um, it's just really nice to listen to the, the, the approaches that the surgeons have, the way that you guys discuss in detail the approach to how you fix something within the shoulder. I think that those discussions uh, happen with physiotherapists, um, but we need to do them in more detail. I feel that we need to have very strong protocols. Um, I feel that a lot of the time we say every rehabilitation should be individualized, but I feel that sometimes that's a little bit too generic. I think there's more of an 80-20 rule that needs to be in place. We have to get the basics right. If you get the basics right, then most times you're going to land up getting a good result out of the rehab process. But if we get a little bit too creative, a little bit too responsive, how do you feel today? Okay, let me now adapt my rehab on the fly based on how you've presented to me today. We lose the progressive load and adaptability that I'll discuss a little bit later on. We must systematically overload tissue to create strength in the tissue. When we exercise, we don't get stronger, we get weaker. Exercise creates micro trauma that damages tissue. Then in between exercise sessions, the body strengthens itself and that's where the strength comes from, the healing process in between training sessions. So if the load is insufficient, during a rehab program, we'll get stuck in what I call the rehab rut. And we never come out of that little treading water routine that we get stuck into with our patients. So have a very clear plan. This is what I aim to do in the next six to eight weeks. Try to stick to it as much as you can. And when you need to, you can deviate from it based on circumstances that come towards you. But don't make stuff up on the fly. I, I think often it can get us in trouble as this remote will get me in trouble. <laughs> Where do I point it? Okay, there we go. So a little bit about me. I've had 20 years of experience in the field. Ironically, uh, that photograph was with Lakshya Sen last year in the Commonwealth Games. He landed up with a shoulder injury. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about today, I applied with him. Even on the fly during those 14 days, we were still rehabbing. So it was quite difficult to actually strengthen him while he was in a competitive environment because it's very easy to overload somebody. But we just applied these principles and we were able to get a lot of good results out of a very tr uh, uh, tricky shoulder. So um, Dr. Uh, Yadav has already explained this in a lot of detail, so I won't jump into it too much. From the way that I look at things, there's structural stuff that's very difficult for physios to deal with. That's really the realm of the orthos to be managing. And then there's functional stuff. So all of the contractile tissue is where I'm really looking to make a big impact. I want to try and get muscles to learn how to activate correctly and deactivate correctly and move through the right amount of range 
in an appropriate manner. If we can basically get muscles to behave the way they're supposed to, we can restore a lot of good function back to the shoulder. All right, so what do we mean by that? This is essentially the diagram that I use to define my entire profession and everything that I do. So in a nutshell, the base of the pyramid is movement competency. It's fundamental movement. If I don't have good joint mobility, good muscle flexibility, good stability, good balance and good motor control, I just can't move. Forget move well, I'm not moving properly at all. Once you have good movement competency, you can then build movement capacity, which means doing the same thing over and over and over again correctly, not getting tired and then getting injured as a result of fatigue. And we'll touch on that a little bit later in the second half of my talk. And then finally is the sexy stuff, skill, uh, sorry, uh, skill which is agility, speed and power. And that's where I like to work is in that world of high performance, right? But it can only occur on two levels of really solid movement. So if we were to break that down, most of us as physios live and work in the movement, competent, uh, movement competency area. So we, you know, we're doing rehab, we're doing stretching, we're doing warm-up, uh, mobility work, yoga instructors, Pilates instructors. People who are working in this realm, we work at the base of the pyramid. The other guys build on top of us. Strength and conditioning, uh, strength trainers, gym trainers, uh, endurance coaches, they're all working in the middle of the pyramid. And then the top of the pyramid will be your batting coach, your bowling coach, your sports specific coach, your exercise scientists, your exercise physiologists. They're all working up there, right? So that's what that pyramid really looks like. So that, so this is what I'm, t I'm saying. This is the piece that we really need to be focused on when we're looking to rehabilitate any joint of the body, not only the shoulder. But the shoulder is probably one of the most complicated ones. So for me, I'm not going to dwell too much on this. I'd rather show you a picture and, and, and look at the biomechanics on a slightly larger um, level. But essentially what we're trying to do is look at what is the relationship of the muscles that makes the shoulder not work properly. Predominantly in sport, what, what we've seen, and I know that this translates to the normal population of people, we can, we can lift our shoulder okay, but we can bring it down much better. So effectively, I can pull better than I can push, and I can throw better than I can lift. And that just basically boils down to the fact that all of our pulling and throwing muscles have evolved over millions of years. If we're hunting or we're needing to do stuff, we need to generate a lot of force in this direction. We don't necessarily need to do this. It's not a very functional movement in a lot of essential living. So the result of that is evolutionarily, we've grown powerful lat muscles, powerful teres major, less powerful teres minor, and a very strong subscapularis. So we can extend from a flexed position very well, internally rotate from that position, and horizontally adduct. We're very, very good at this movement. We're not so good at this movement. So our flexion, abduction, and external rotation, if you look at the anatomy of the muscles, they're much smaller. If you look at their force generation, it's much less. So the shoulder is set up to fail. Even though it's such a versatile joint, it is set up to fail biomechanically. And then when you superimpose things like swimming, which is a repetitive movement against resistance of, again, internal rotation, extension, and adduction to a degree, we're constantly strengthening in one direction against water and then against air is when we're doing the other direction. If I have a racket and a ball, I'm constantly hitting with speed in this motion, but I'm not really doing too much in that motion. It's a much less powerful movement. So we're constantly reinforcing these patterns of tight lat, tight teres major, 
tight subscapularis. In addition to that, we often go into the gym because we're told that if we bench press a lot, we're strong, and that somehow bench press translates into better upper body strength, which it doesn't. So we over-recruit our pec major and our, particularly our pec minor. So we land up with internally rotated shoulders because of tightness here. We land up with a thoracic kyphosis because of a lat muscle that's tight. If I've got a tight lat muscle, I'm going to land up having my lower back and my shoulder approximate, right? So if that's, so you land up here. So then how do I extend? Because my lat won't let me extend. So then I have to use my levator scapulae and my upper trapezius because these little guys are not strong enough. So I land up hiking my scapula up. And you can see how this is just going to start cascading into a big mess that lands up with subacromial impingement. So often the patients, they go to the doctors and they say, listen guys, I'm in pain, I'm not getting better. I get better for a while and then I do something and my pain comes back and eventually the doctors have to fix that surgically. The problem comes in is the rehabilitation afterwards. Because if it wasn't strong enough before surgery when it wasn't broken, post-surgery when you've got healing with um, attachments and you've got scarred tissue and you've got sub-perfect tissue, you can't expect that tissue to hold up against the same biomechanical forces. So it's critically important as physios that we understand what the biomechanical root cause of the dysfunction was and address that. And if we don't, we fail at the rehab process, regardless of whether three months later they're saying that they're pain-free, because probably in six months or 12 months from now, they'll be back again. And I think that's why the French doctors were showing such poor results with their surgeries. And why I, at some point, just jumped up from the back of the room because I feel the doctors are looking at themselves and scratching their heads and, and sort of vilifying themselves about success rates when actually it's a teamwork. And if we don't do our job well, then it doesn't matter how well he's done his surgery, right? If that shoulder is stuck from internal rotation, uh, subscapularis particularly, but also teres major and lats being very tight, if over time we've developed hyperactivity in our upper trapezius and weakness in our serratus and our rhomboids, it doesn't matter what the surgeon does, the shoulder's never going to be okay. So I think that's the thing that we need to try and figure out is how to fix this whole problem. So if you remember nothing from what I say today, particularly the physios in the room, but also to the doctors, please check the function of the lat muscle the teres major muscle, the pec minor muscle, and a very easy set of movements to do. Lie the patient in supine right on the edge of the bed so that the glenal humeral joint is right on the edge of the bed. Support them with your body so that they don't feel like they're going to fall off the bed. The very first movement is to take them. So I should be lying down, so I hope you can see what I'm doing. You take them and you just horizontally extend their shoulder a healthy shoulder the fingertips should point at the floor that's how far you want them to go it means that their pec is absolutely sound and that there's no tightness coming across their chest over here now the next thing to do is and do this slowly and control because if it's tight it's immediately going to cause a subacromial impingement because the anterior structures don't hold the glenohumeral joint in the right position, and you're going to either get sub uh, infraspin or, or, or supraspin getting impinged in that subacromial space. So do it slowly and carefully. Also build their trust that way, and compare it to the unaffected side or the other side. The next test is to take them into a 90-degree position. They're still lying on their back, and just very, very gently horizontally extend with a... 90 degree shoulder elbow position. This is pec major. We're trying to see what's happening with pec major. This doesn't go to the floor, but it goes to about 45 degrees. And it goes there easily and comfortably with no pain. 
If they're feeling pain and discomfort, again, your pec is too tight. You need to be doing something. Uh, sorry, your, sorry, not pec. Uh, your teres major is too tight. You need to be doing something about that. And finally, in your, you, you, you take them out. So now I'm lying on my back with my shoulder here, supported arm, and check their external rotation. Check that last. Okay, they need to have good external rotation. If these three movements are limited, I guarantee you it doesn't matter if he's the most elite level athlete. When I meet Laksha, whenever he says he's help, the first thing I do is I go and I check these three movements before I do anything else. Normally he's tight in at least one of those three, and normally it's all three, particularly horizontal extension and the shorter version of that. If you treat PEC with soft tissue release work, with stretching, you, and in a supine position, you release your lat muscle, you release your teres major, your teres minor, and your subscapularis. Instantly, shoulder function improves. And doctors, if you don't believe me, the next patient that comes to you with shoulder pain, do one physiotherapy thing. Lie them down, take their arm, and use the heel of your hand and just press it into the scapula in a supine position, right in here. It'll hurt. So do it gently. Tell them it's going to be okay. You're getting huge trigger points in their lat, their teres, and their subscapularis. And then just gently a few times move their arm forwards and backwards like that. And then ask them to sit or stand up and to lift their arm up. And I promise you they're going to tell you that their shoulder pain is better before you've done anything else to them. And that you have improved their subacromial impingement. So these are the biomechanical things that I'm pretty keen to work with the physios on. So basically what I've described here is this overactive, underactive relationship in a joint. It's the root cause of all biomechanical dysfunction in any joint of the body. So we as physios need to identify very quickly what is short and tight and release it first. Traditionally, we always say your glutes are weak, your core is weak, your rhomboids are weak. Now, how did they get weak and why do we sit for weeks and weeks trying to strengthen them and they never get strong again? Maybe they're not weak. Maybe they're inhibited. Why I say that is because every joint has millions and millions of proprioceptors, right? So if one set of muscles is super tight from being used a lot, that whole section is going to be much tighter. That joint capsule, those soft tissues are not going to open up nearly as much as the, uh, the ones on the opposite side. So what ends up happening is your tight muscles are, said, are sending a message to the brain of dominance and the antagonist muscles are being inhibited. Makes sense, right? So don't start by trying to strengthen what's weak because you're trying to move a beach with a teaspoon. Throw the teaspoon away, get the bulldozer out, and stretch all the tight muscles first. Short circuit this dominant neural pathway to the brain from the tight muscles. Get in there with your hands and release trigger points. I use a lot of myofascial release as the fundamental thing that we do, and that's the reason why the international sign for physiotherapy is two hands, because we've got to get stuck in there with our hands and really release stuff. Once you've done that, then go and do your strength work. You'll get much better results that will last much longer. And we use a step-down process. So we, 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 hit, we hit the problem hard, say daily for the first week or alternate days for the first week, and then we step it off a little bit, maybe you know twice a week for two weeks and then once a week for a month after that and then once in two weeks. But you've got to really do a big impact up front. So that's another little take home that I want to... I want to give. So tissue healing for me is six to eight weeks. I don't promise anything to my clients in less than six to eight weeks. Um, it doesn't matter how fast they respond to the first or second or third treatment. You need time for tissue to heal. You know, somebody mentioned earlier in another thing, there's biological healing that has to happen. We can't change that. We facilitate that healing. There's no medicine in my hands. The medicine is in the body. 
the body will repair itself as long as I take away the hammer that keeps on hitting it. So you take away the hammer by adjusting the biomechanics into a more optimal range that we've evolved over millions of years to get into. So I think it's very important that we need to do regular manual therapy and regular exercise therapy to give those six to eight weeks for the body to heal. Now when we talk about timelines, timelines are really important because I think that if you do a good rehab process, you can follow like weeks and days and months and stuff, but normally phases or stages is a better way. So early stage, you wanna do pain management, range of motion optimization and relaxation of protective or overactive muscles. Okay, so session one, I'm gonna be working all my upper trapezius, levator, scapulae, pec minor, pec major, lat, sub, uh, teres, minor, major, subscapularis, infraspinatus. I'm gonna work on all of those muscles with massage techniques and then different kinds of stretching, particularly the three ways that I've just described to you now. I'm gonna do a lot of work in the neck because if the neck is stiff and tight, it automatically starts short-circuiting the shoulder. And if you have shoulder patients who are not getting better, particularly the instability crowd who we just scratch our heads at, a lot of the time they're gonna present to you with an increased kyphosis and forward head posture. So check their sternocleidomastoid. They're gonna be massive trigger points in the sternocleidomastoid. The scalenes are gonna be tight, the upper trapezius and the levator scapulae. So work a lot on the deep neck flexor rehab, build better control in their cervical spine, improve their thoracic mobility as well, right? So that means what we often do is we lie them over a foam roller and we get them to do reverse crunches. So we're actually getting, getting them away from this posture and more into that posture. So a lot of deep neck flexor activation, a lot of thoracic spinal extension work you'll be amazed at how that automatically improves shoulder function without even doing anything at the shoulder. Um, and then from there, we do a lot of isometrics, a lot of isometrics against the wall, um, and then we build it out into other ranges of motion. And then from there, we do concentric and a lot of eccentric work, a lot of outer range eccentric strengthening. So that means being over here at least from uh, 100 degrees or 180 degrees and beyond. Sorry, 100 degrees and uh, 90 degrees and beyond, right? So this range of motion is incredibly important, especially when you add it with horizontal extension. So if I'm gonna throw or if I'm gonna hit something above my head, you need to have horizontal extension and external rotation and you need to have good eccentric control in those planes as well. Um, and then finally, we do volume and intensity, which I will discuss I think on my next one. So for me, the role of manual therapy in early stage rehab is twofold, soft tissue work, massage, passive stretching, needling, taping, hot and cold therapy. Okay, that's our job. They just lie there and we do that. The other side of it is joint mobility, McKenzie, Maitland and Mulligan, where we loosen the neck up, we loosen the thoracic spine up. I'm not a huge fan of joint mobility on the shoulder. I just don't think it's really that effective. Um, but if you feel that you need to do kind of mobs on the, uh, any kind of mobs on the shoulder, then you can do that as well. And then just be very careful with electrotherapy. I feel that we use too much electrotherapy in India. Okay, my big gripe is that we use ultrasound and interferential and diathermy way too much. Okay, those things are helping to decrease inflammation at best. More often than not, they're just, again, using a teaspoon to move a, a beach. Okay, we know now that the shoulder problem is because of biomechanics. So if you sit there and you ultrasound my, sh my, my subacromial space, and you don't address my tight pec, and my tight lat, and my tight subscapularis, and you don't improve my eccentric control in outer ranges, you're, you're on a boat to nowhere, right? You're just not gonna solve any problems. So be very careful how you use this stuff. I think we use it too much. And that's me, the next thing is over here, but I think that's the next talk, if I'm not mistaken. Should I just yeah. go?
Okay. You can continue. So basically, now that you've done your job and you've returned, oh, this person is better, right? So now they've arrived and, they, and you've said, sorry, this is a bad illustration. This is just something that was in my head. I should have used an overhead activity, but I, I didn't think of it at the time. So the person arrives and says, you say, how are you? And they say, I'm fine. And the first question we ask is, do you have any pain? And they say, no. And often we say, great, off you go, go back to your sport. Worst thing you just did. Because you can squat once without pain, or you can hit a serve once without pain, but can you do it over and over and over again? That's the question that we need to ask. That's something called workload. So what is workload is what I'm about to explain to you. Load management is the sum of the number of sets and reps and the resistance. So if you say to me, can you lift your hands above your head? And I say, yes, I can. Is that painful? No, it's not. Now, how many times have you been doing that? Have you been doing that three sets of 10? Have you been doing that three sets of 10 with a one kg dumbbell? Have you been doing that with a elastic band or a barbell, right? If you're working with Mirabai Chanu, who's one of our Olympic medalists, she has to be very careful with her shoulders like most weightlifters do. So when she comes to see you and she says, I have pain, you say, what is your activity? She says, when I hold a barbell above my head, and then you say, well, how much does that barbell weigh? And she says, 130 kilos, which is three times her body weight, right? If you make her do this, you're getting the damn teaspoon out again, and you're moving the, sand, the beach with a teaspoon, right? You've got to make sure that she can hold 130 kilos above her head, and she doesn't collapse under that weight. There's nobody in the room that can do that. Okay, so we have to make sure that systematically we build them up. Now, how long does it take? I normally say six to eight weeks to get somebody out of basic pain, where they can lift their arms up and say, yep, I don't have any pain anymore. It takes another six to eight weeks of building load or volume and building resistance, adding weight, before you can, they can say, yep, I can do this pretty much all day. I can travel, put my bag in the overhead compartment. I can do cooking. I can do anything in the workspace, and there's no issue at all. Okay. It takes another six to eight weeks to get them back into their sport. So from the time that they say, I'm pretty okay, I don't have any pain, it's going to take at least 16 weeks, possibly even 24 weeks, depending on the individual, to get them back to playing sport. And when I mean playing sport, it's basic sport. It's not all out balls to the wall stuff. It's just, are you capable of playing for 20 minutes to half an hour at a moderate intensity level? So we have to build them up to that. How do we do that? We definitely start with isometric exercises. Then we move into strength training, which is mostly based on physiological anatomical movements using muscles and their direction of force generation. We then move into movement training, which is combining different muscles together in specific movement patterns. And there's a picture down there of sports-specific drills. So we've got to teach them how to throw the ball again, or we've got to teach them how to do proper crawl in the water again. And then we build volume, slow and steady. And coaches are the most impatient people that you will work with. They will say, does he have pain? Yes. No, he doesn't have pain anymore. Great. Let's go. 4K in the water right now, full speed. And then they're back with the doctors the next week again. Okay, so we've got to make sure that we monitor their load. So how do we do that? There's something called the acute to chronic workload ratio. Now, this is where we're moving away from even the physios and we're moving towards the sports scientists and the rehab and the athletic trainers. But basically, there's a sweet spot. The acute load refers to the last seven days. How much of rehab or strengthening or fitness training have you done in the last seven days? If it's more than 1.2%, i.e. 20% more than the average of the last four weeks, 
you start the upward trend into the red zone. And you can see that it's parabolic. If you do too much training too quickly, you overload tissues and you dramatically increase your chance of injury. So we have to do this process slow and steady. Normally, 10% a week more is kind of what you're looking at. So how we do this is we use an app. Uh, we have all the programs in the app all lined up. Each program has a workout for the day with exercises and sets and reps and everything all built into it. And basically, that's how we do it. It's structured. It doesn't mean that it's set in stone. It just means that there's a very clear road. So if I'm talking to the physio looking after Luxia and he's saying, his shoulder is painful, I can say, what day is he in the program? And he says he's on day 33. And I know day 33 because I know the exact workout that he's on. I know the exercises, the sequences of those exercises. I know the sets, I know the reps, and I know the weight. And then we can start talking apples for apples. But often what happens is the conversation starts along the lines of, why are you still in pain? Are you doing your physiotherapy? Yes, I am. Hmm, okay, physiotherapy is not working. What are my other solutions? Medication or surgery? All right, the conversation should go, what is the protocol that you're following? Where are you in that protocol? And how is that protocol addressing the biomechanical problems? I see a tight pec. I see a tight teres major. I see a tight subscapularis. What are we doing about that? If, and we need to be sending notes, very specific notes, for when the patients go back to the surgeon because the patient only has the surgeon's point of view most of the time. So we need to make sure that they have our note. If they don't come with our note, we've not done our job properly. Our note needs to summarize the work that we've done, any problems that we are identifying, that we can just bring it to the surgeon's attention, and most importantly, what our plan is. A patient who's doing physio with us should never, ever go to a surgeon without that piece of paper because what is a surgeon supposed to do? All right, all he's got to do is his clinical assessment and he's already finished his job, right? He did the, he did the surgery two, three months back. So what's he left? He's already cut it open. He can't cut it open again, right? He's only then got to say, oh, hang on, your physio hasn't done this or your physio hasn't done that. So let's give him a proper roadmap so that it's easy for him to have proper discussions with his clients. That's me, I'm done. Thank you. It was a wonderful, wonderful talk, thought provoking. Uh, unless anybody has any specific questions. Can we, uh, can we finish Milin talk and have yeah. a question? Because he's waiting in online for a long time. Yeah, okay. Hey, Keith will be here, no? What time your yeah. flight? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Here. Can we connect to Dr. Mulin? Yeah, hi Sundar. So should I share my screen now? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So uh, thank you, Karthik, Siranik, Sundar, and uh, all the uh, beloved faculty friends there. And thanks for having me for this uh, talk on surgeon's perspective on how to enable a disabled throwing shoulder. And normally as a surgeon, what we uh, get to see or tend to see uh, is the shoulder getting rehabilitated after doing a certain surgical procedure. As surgeons, we usually do instability work or the rotator cuff work. Today's uh, session is only on instability. So this is the surgeon's perspective as regards what one needs to do whenever uh, anterior instability has been operated. And as very rightly and wonderfully put forth by Hit Matthews, that we need to have a very close consortium with our physiotherapist to have uh, uh, things going in the right way at right point in time. So the shoulder functions within the context of kinetic chain, we all know. And this kinetic chain has been nicely described by Hit Matthews in the previous talk. There are a series of links which are activated sequentially in a coordinated fashion 
which generates and transmits the forces while performing a sporting movement or a functional movement which is of some benefit. Any break in this chain affects the energy, force and velocity which is generated during a functional movement of the shoulder. So the kinetic chain has to remain intact and this was very nicely described by Ben Kibler. Which, which is the key when we try to rehabilitate the shoulder? And as we heard in the previous talks, we know that before we go to the glenohumeral joint, we need to have the biomechanics right. And it has been uh, proven beyond doubt that scapula plays a very important role in the shoulder girdle movement. And if the scapula is at stake, then probably the shoulder cannot achieve the same functional range of motion. So the scapula is a link that connects the torso with the arm and it is very critical to a normal shoulder function. Abnormal scapular function known as scapular dyskinesis, which could be proximal or a distal, which is a dysfunction anywhere into the kinetic chain would give rise to abnormal shoulder movement. We have heard of a lot of muscles which uh, Hit Matthews talked in the uh, last talk, but then I must really draw your attention to the superior trapezius, that's the levator scapulae, those are the rhomboids, that's the serratus, and to add to this is the lat dorsi. So if you have these muscles going right and the scapular motion going right, then probably you are in for a shoulder rehab program. For the three movements which the previous speaker has described, this is one of the most important functional movement tests called as Apley scratch test. And if your athlete or patient is able to do this, then one can say that probably shoulder has got a full functional range of motion without having a tighter muscles of one group or inhibited muscles of one group, which we have heard in the last biomechanics talk. So that's the normal scapulothoracic rhythm, which it should look like. The scapular blades moving identically, the shoulder moving well. Those are the muscles which you can see contracting, and that's a perfectly normal scapular rhythm. As opposite to this, this is the abnormal scapular rhythm, which you can see on the right side. The scapula is not moving well. It is trying to compensate using the upper trapezius to achieve the abduction at 90 degrees. So this is the abnormal scapular motion. And until unless you get this scapular motion back, the shoulder is not going to function normally. You could see some surgical scar marks there. So this is a post-operative patient. And in such situations, getting the scapulothoracic rhythm back is the most important thing to have. So shoulder rehab after a bankard's repair. So as we know that after any surgical intervention, there is scapulothoracic dysfunction, there is loss of strength of particular muscles, and there is stiffness in the soft tissues, which we saw that soft tissue releases need to be done in a rehab process. So what are the principles of a functional rehab? So the goal of a functional rehab is to restore normal function rather than eliminating just symptoms. And the concept of core-based functional rehab was first introduced by Rubin and Ben Kibler. Hodges, who showed that before either arm or leg movement is initiated, that we all know that before we conceive an idea of moving our body in a particular fashion, the transversus abdominis is consistently activated first. So to perform any sporting movement or a functional movement, the first thing which happens is contraction of the transversus abdominis. And this increasing and this, uh, 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 this first anticipates the movement by increase in the intra-abdominal pressure. And that is the importance of core strength, because if you have a good core strength, then the functional rehab and the shoulder rehabilitation would be achieved in a much better way. The chronology of re rehabilitation is always in the way it is being depicted here. So first, we always wish to work on axial alignment and the lumbopelvic stability. So until unless you achieve a good posture, and you have a good lumbopelvic stability, the further shoulder movements cannot be performed or cannot be improved upon. So that should be the first goal of your rehab program. Then comes the scapulothoracic rehabilitation. So getting the scapulothoracic rhythm back. And lastly, it will be followed by glenohumeral rehabilitation, which would, which would necessarily be either strengthening or then building up to the further sport-specific skills. So what are the rough guidelines for the core-based rehab? So we always achieve proximal stability before the distal mobility. We focus on the scapular position and the scapulothoracic control. We have to have the pelvis squared with a neutral spine and tightened abdominal muscles. 
we have to have a pain free exercise and progression the smaller loads with frequent exercises is the key before putting these athletes onto a, a workload which he matthew stated that you shouldn't put the athlete suddenly onto a larger loads focus on the quality of the movements rather than the quantity of the movement and strengthening should always progress from isometric to eccentric and then concentric the closed chain exercises they precede over the open chain exercises this chronology needs to be followed because as we know that there are phases of tissue healing in first phase you have a injury phase then uh, you uh, th that is the acute phase then you have a early recovery phase late recovery phase and the functional recovery phase biologically speaking as surgeons we have done a mechanical job of doing a wonderful bankart surgery but then we also know that the tissue has to heal and if you try to rehabilitate unhealed tissue then probably you are going to cause more damage than benefit to the patient or to an athlete so we all know the phases of healing as active phase phase of proliferation and phase of maturation which progresses in the weeks fashion and we should be aware of this thing whenever we advise or whenever we speak to our physiotherapist regarding the rehab protocols so what do we really expect as an operating surgeon for a from a physiotherapist it is a boon if you have a physiotherapist like heath matthews who understands the process of rehabilitation but usually in grade b and c cities such specialized physiotherapists are not available and as a surgeon we should make it a point to understand the process of rehab and be in a continuous conversation or a dialogue with our own physiotherapist now suppose this is the patient this is a wonderfully done bank cards repair that is from the anterior superior port which we are seeing that's a good bumper the concavity compression mechanism has been achieved fantastically well with a capsular shift in both the planes now when you know you are the operating surgeon you have done this job who else could know it better how to rehabilitate this patient or how far this patient can be facilitated while doing the rehab process and hence your communication with the physio remains very very important so we always start with a scapular thoracic program this is in a nutshell what we follow in our setup in conjunction with the physiotherapist which we have so this program constitutes the basis of the rehab it is also taught pre operatively to the patients who are supposed to undergo instability surgery and the basic of this program is for the patients to have the ability to locate the position of the scapula so as we do rehab prehab in the knee or acl surgery if you are doing a elective bankart's repair you should put your patients onto a scapulothoracic program and this scapulothoracic program consists of following exercises so this helps correct the proximal kinetic chain and this scapular stabilize stabilization deals about all those scapular sling muscles which we talked about including the lat dorsi serratus the rhomboid the upper trapezius so and so forth so these are certain exercises which are the examples which is like a robbery exercise then uh, low rows for the serratus anterior lawn mowers maneuver we can do it with the shoulder clocks with the thera bands and isometric lat dorsi and inferior glides so these are some of the example where you see that uh, that's a robbery exercise that you can see from in front that is from the back the shoulder blades being pulled back and this is the isometric for the interscapular um uh, interscapular muscles of the scapula that's the side profile so that's one of the exercises to begin with they start very slowly and gradually before you start doing them these are the low rows for the serratus and you can see that the athlete stands against a table and tries to push the palm into the table activating the serratus anterior you can see the serratus anterior getting activated there and we have to teach the, these athletes to recruit the muscles of intent or reeducate them to have the muscles firing which are desired to fire at that point in time this is lawn mowers maneuver you can see this you can do it with different kinds of machines as well and that's the front view and you can see this is the back view uh, how the athlete now the the form and the posture of the exercise needs to be wonderfully well so in a, in this maneuver the shoulder has to move from abduction to external rotation position before you end this movement and when this quality of movement is good then one can definitely say that the athlete is ready to undergo the further rehab process that uh, isometric lat dorsi stretch now the lat dorsi is getting stretched and you can additionally go ahead with the increasing level of difficulty once the athlete is able to do this 
soft tissue tissue stretches we have already heard of so soft tissue stretches and mobilization will make rehab more effective the pec minor major subscap posterior capsule and the cuff stretch along with the lat dorsi these soft tissue stretches with different techniques which the physiotherapists they follow is actually uh, makes a very important impact on to the uh, rehab process uh, as a whole so those are exercises for strengthening the core strength and these can immediately start after the surgery that's a, a supine bridge then you should have a military brace position and then supine bridge with multiple increasing levels of difficulty which can give rise to you know so that's that's the simple supine bridge then you can do it with a single leg you can also do it with sure. a cross leg position so these are once the athlete is able to do these exercises with a definitive pattern you can increase the level of difficulty to have uh, your rehab program going so acute phase 1 to 3 weeks post operative the goals are we have heard control of pain inflammation a uh, little immobilization some modalities to reduce the pain analgesics then clear soft tissue restrictions and postural abnormalities with soft tissue mobilization and stretches now this muscle reeducation is a very important part of rehab uh, rehab program and this should start immediately after the surgery this starts with postural and core strengthening lumbar pelvic stabilization and scapular positioning especially the retraction and depression and you start with closed chain rotator cuff exercises so acute phase day 1 2 excluding the day of operation we always operate in a interscalene or supraclavicular block with no ga supplemented day 2 to day 14 there are home based exercises day 14 is removal of sutures and day 14 to day 30 is supervised sessions three times a week so day 1 to day 3 the patient is in arm sling immobilization ice cold compresses or contrast baths can be used and sets for the control of pain the physio visits on day 1 and starts paying attention to the wrist forearm and elbow active elbow and wrist mobilization are started on day 1 scapular depression retraction and elevation are started from day 2 and maintenance of correct posture is taught to the patient ice cold compresses can be three times a day till the skin over the shoulder starts getting numb is the time you should wait and stop doing uh, ice cold compresses so those are scapular retractions you can see the isometric movements of the interscapular uh, muscles there that's again a retraction from the side angle and you can see that's the scapular elevation so here the upper trapezius is working so you already have started working isometrically onto the periscapular muscles so that you start getting your scapula right back in place so day 14 continue with scapular stabilization and the core stability exercises start with arom that is active assisted movements you can use various wand sticks or the towel here uh, to to get these movements going uh, where the unoperated hand works as a as a as a trigger and the operated hand just passively moves along with the normal hand stretches in all directions of the shoulder movements especially in the scapular plane which is 30 degrees which are also called as captions the goal is the muscle activation and reeducation for the functional movements which are going to follow so that is the wand which you can use uh, for a different kind of movements that's a forward flexion as you can see and you can also see the same movement for the shoulder extension so forward flexion and extension suppose right is the operated hand then the left hand lifts the wand and the right operated hand just moves passively along with the wand there so these are active assisted movements similarly you can perform rotations here so those are the rotations so so again in the operated hand you can see the normal hand is going to push the operated hand so that the movement is actively occurring at the operated hand at the cost of the normal hand so then you start regaining range of motion and flexibility with unweighted pendulums there are certain table slides and there is axial rotation to new uh, to neutral in adduction chair stretches can also be deployed here we specifically advise our physiotherapist not to do abr because the shoulder is being repaired for anterior instability and you don't want shoulder to go into that position so early so those are weighted pendulums and that would help regain the uh, shoulder motion those are simple passive stretches with the help of a paper you can use a smooth surface here 
that's the forward flexion so the body is bending forward the movement is occurring passively so that your muscles are not getting actually uh, recruited in this kind of a movement that's the scaptions so that's in the 30 degrees and that is the abduction movement so these paper stretches are very useful in regaining the functional range of motion and this will help and facilitate facilitate your rehab uh, protocols you can start using bands here now so that's external rotation with the band you can also start with the internal rotation with the band so here you're doing it at the neutral shoulder uh, the, you're not doing it at the 90 degrees so at 90 degrees of abduction external rotation is not allowed in this early phase so this is the way how you can start getting these rotators going then you start with strengthening exercises where there could be active humeral head depression and ball squeezes start with shoulder isometric flexion extension abduction er and ir we must remember that the progression criteria from acute to early recovery include minimal pain on range of motion you should have reasonable lumbar pelvic strength there should be adequate scapular control and adequate soft tissue healing the adequate release of soft tissue restrictions need to be done before you progress so progression is not only time based it is also criteria based so when your athlete or a patient tells you that yes he or she is able to do particular movements and you see them do it with a good quality balance and posture then only move on to the next phase so early recovery phase is week 3 by 4 you start with proprioception exercises range of motion posterior capsule and cuff stretches and inferior inferior capsular stretches as needed which is also called as active inferior glide here also you are doing these exercises with the opposite hand and you can see the operated hand is not moving but the other hand is helping these movements to occur in supine position these are wall clocks you can do them with the therabands so here there is a protraction going on with the wall clocks and then if you move this hand in a clockwise or anti clockwise way these are wall clocks and these are beneficial exercises in the rehab process that's the inferior glide which is isometric so your athlete stands and pushes the shoulder down so these are isometric inferior glides which the your athletes can be put at this stage for these exercises early recovery phase goes on after the four weeks and here you start now strength training the certain exercises are dynamic hug with tubing bilateral rubber tubing er to neutral uh, arm pull downs rowing with tubes lat pull downs and then you move on to endurance and functional training to gain the aerobic uh, uh, endurance with either a stationary bike or a treadmill and then proprioceptory or pnf exercises late recovery phase from 6 week to 12 weeks you start with range of motion soft tissue stretches joint mobilizations so on and so forth so these are certain exercises which you see One that's step. a doorway stretch normally for the anterior capsule and that's the way how your athlete goes to do a towel stretch as well so that's actually causing uh, your uh, giving uh, giving you benefits of the range of motion and capsular stretches so this is the joint mobilization you can see the anterior pectin subscap is been mobilized by the physiotherapist and uh, as hit matthew said there are various techniques of soft tissue mobilizations like mckenzie and all and these mobilizations would definitely work uh, when you uh, when you mobilize the trigger trigger points for a functional rehab then the last phase is the late recovery phase which is week 6 uh, 6 to 12 where the strength training starts and these are examples of the strength training so that's the dynamic hug with the rubber tubing this can be done in a gym setting one should always see that the form and the posture is right the athlete is starting uh, standing erect the scapular control is good and then you can progress so these are lat pull downs that that is also a very good exercise to do in the functional phases again the form needs to be done one can see the scapula is moving absolutely identically so you need to have that scapulothoracic rhythm going well at this point in time one can start with push ups and this is now the strength and conditioning from here onwards usually the snc coach would take over and then further pass on to a sport specific exercises so core based exercises 
we start with the lunges. So this is to regain the, the balance and a functional movement where multiple body segments are working at a single point in time. Lunges is a good exercise. These are slow punches. You can start with this where there is a coordinated movement with a good posture and a good balance. Usually we start with a bipedal stance and then usually progress to a unipedal where there are perturbation exercises which are brought into play and the quality of movement is also assessed. So these are seated rows as we saw in the last picture. Late recovery is neuromuscular control where the perturbations, wobble board and full range PNF patterns are practiced and then the sports specific programs are added depending on as we saw in the last talk that there was a swimmer which was shown. So the, the patient is standing on a wobble board or a, this is a bozu and then the patient is trying to throw the ball at the wall. So these are ball throws. Now these are certain functional movements. Suppose the player is a basketball player, then the ball throws would make a lot of sense and then gradually increasing the difficulty to a single leg, which is by no way very easy, even if you have a good core strength. But these exercises are then started with little increasing difficulties. You can also use weights and start with strength training in advanced phases where the dumbbells, barbells, kettlebells and different varieties could be used to strengthen these athletes. So that's in internal rotation, you can see in external rotation, abduction, that is ex extension. And now this is a lat dorsi strengthening. So this is again with the uh, weights there. So, so on and so forth, you progress and then ultimately you'll end up with functional training at about week 12, 12 to week 14, where you start with jogging, then full range of motion strengthening, core based muscle synergy, functional progression with weights, sports specific activity, and uh, 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 such different kind of exercises. So there we are trying to see that's a trampoline and a ball, ball throw on a trampoline. So that is with a little more force. We are gradually progressing and as very rightly pointed out, we always progress at 10% of the previous activity with a good progression. So those are sideways ball throws. There is a rotatory movement occurring at the lumbar spine as well. So these are functional and sports specific movements we are trying to get back at the final stages. We also start with plyometrics and that is the example of plyometrics. That's a single leg balance. Here you can see that these are uh, jump land mechanics. Now this is getting back the whole sports specific movement back. The strength and conditioning coach will also dictate the athlete to have the coordination and balance going right and neuromotor control by giving commands to the athlete by calling on the numbers of the cones as saying number one, number four, number three, number two, and the athlete has to, so here the COD or change in direction is also comes into play for ultimate sporting movement, which is the aim. So if you see the literature, whether you do an anterior stabilization as a soft tissue surgery, a bony lethargy procedure or open stabilization, this review by Lalenthi, it shows that met, uh, the meta-analysis demonstrated that there is no statistically significant difference in the rate of return to play following all these three procedures. So the rehab protocol almost for any surgery would remain the same. To conclude, always, always speak to your physio regarding the patient's progress, be involved as a team, monitor the progress and be in discussion with other team members. Usually return to play will not be before six months start with actual alignment, core, scapulothoracic joint, and finally the glenohumeral joint. Muscle re-education remains the key, which talks about the neuromotor control and function-based progression is must. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Blin, sir, for an extensive talk. I think we had a very good uh, talks. Uh, one is on the physio perspective and one is the surgeon perspective. So we had, I think they threw a lot of lights on their help which is uh, foremost important for any surgery. Uh, any questions from the audience? I think it's, it's very, it was very clear. I think uh, even the heat talk was very excellent and uh, we could understand the all the biomechanic. Uh, the, maybe my question is to, like from Anand the other talk, that uh, only, the only thing is which you are worried about this uh, functional instability with the positioning instability, uh, instability or a non-positional functional instability. So how do you manage that cases? I think um, 
just, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I've, I've, uh, Mr. Millen had uh, just uh, described it. Basically, the, the rehab protocol stays very similar for all shoulder problems because ultimately it's so mobile. If you don't land up making sure that all the muscles are working together in a group, then wherever the weakness is, that's where the injury will come. So it, particularly with shoulder instability, I don't know how the other uh, speakers would, uh, would agree with me or not, but I do a lot of closed chain activities. So a lot of isometric work. Yes, you can do your conventional isometric work uh, standing against a wall or something, but I do a lot of uh, early stage rehab in all fours. So I'm leaning on my hand um, or walking hands up the wall and then pushing into the wall and just building that co-contraction of the muscles so that all the muscles are working together. And then once they're, so let's just say for instance, they're on the floor, I, I'll get them to turn their bodies away or to go into the baby pose position while they're pushing into the floor or lean their bodies over their arm or lean to the side or even do circles. So the whole time they're learning how to control the, the, the humeral head inside the, um, the fossa uh, while you're moving at the same time. So that's just one of the ways that I do it. I don't know if, if any of the other speakers have, uh, have anything else to say. Uh, Marin, sir, do you have any, uh, anything to add on that? No, actually not. I think yeah. uh, that's the way how actually it should progress. Because there are variable movements or a functional or fruitful movements which can be incorporated into the uh, rehab program. So as I showed you, the serratus anterior pushing onto the table or into the wall or having wall clocks while pushing across the wall. So these are certain fruitful. See, ultimately, what is the goal? You, you want your athlete to compete at the pre-injury level or you want your non-athletic population to go back to activities of daily living with a normal shoulder function. So ultimately what we are looking at is a functional movement and if it is incorporated early into the rehab process, it will definitely help, but it should be included with a thorough knowledge of soft tissue healing so that it doesn't create any further issues which, op with a, which the operating surgeon has done inside the theater. Okay, uh, thank you Blin sir. Uh, on behalf of uh, Karthik, I thank you for your time. Uh, Karthik, Karthik is here only. Milin, sir, excellent talk. Thank you, thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you for the opportunity. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, there were a lot of learning points. All the surgeons were taking photos of your slides, so definitely you taught a lot to them. Thanks thanks a lot, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Keith wants to, uh, wants to add one more. Sorry, there's just one thing I forgot to, to mention. The neck, the neck is very, very important. So when you're rehabilitating the shoulder, don't ignore the neck. You need to get your patients to be in that chin tucked posture and do lots of neck strengthening exercises it's very very important otherwise the the whole attachment i mean the, the scapula floats in in muscle that's uh, we really need to make sure that all the attachments of the scapula are taken care of and in this day and age i, I don't know what everybody else is finding but certainly when we went into lockdown and even now as a hangover of lockdown Neck and shoulder used to be my, my fourth most common injury behind the back, the knee and the ankle, right? And then suddenly it's exploded to number one and everything else has kind of been forgotten about. So I think the, the issue is a lot of neck weakness from looking into computer screens and looking onto iPads and stuff and all this work from home culture now as well. So just make sure that you do lots of rehab for the neck. Thank you, Heath, for the excellent session uh, and your wonderful talks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Heath Mathis, for coming all the way. And I thank the chairpersons for uh, chairing the session. Now we'll move to the workshops. I think we got a uh, station set up for you for the Scopy workshop and the knot tying workshop. I'm sure it was a long, exhaustive day today. You had a uh, you know, lot to think about and learn. Uh, but, but I uh, asked the delegates, request the delegates to come and uh, choose the station and stand there so that we can proceed with the workshops quickly. <laughs>